Chapter Twenty Four, Part Two of The Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter Twenty Four, Part Two invigorated in body and gradually revived in heart lucia now began to settle her dress from an instinctive habit of cleanliness and modesty she tied up and arranged afresh her loose and dishevelled tresses and adjusted the handkerchief over her bosom and around her neck in doing this her fingers became entangled in the chaplet she had hung there her eyes rested upon it aroused an instantaneous agitation in her heart the remembrance of her vow hitherto suppressed and stifled by the presence of so many other sensations suddenly rushed upon her mind and presented itself clearly and distinctly to her view the scarcely recovered powers of her soul were again at once overcome and had she not been previously prepared by a life of innocence resignation and confiding faith the consternation she experienced at that moment would have amounted to desperation after a tumultuous burst of such thoughts as were not to be expressed in words the only ones she could form in her mind were oh poor me whatever have i done but scarcely had she indulged a thought when she had felt a kind of terror at having done so she recollected all the circumstances of the vow her insupportable anguish her despair of all human succor the fervency of her prayer the entireness of feeling with which the promise had been made and after having obtained her petition to repent of her promise seemed to her nothing less than sacrilegious and perfidy towards god and the virgin she imagined that such unfaithfulness would draw down upon her new and more terrible misfortunes in which she could not find consolation even in prayer and she hastened to abjure her momentary regret reverently taking the rosary from her neck and holding it in her trembling hand she confirmed and renewed the vow imploring at the same time with heart-rending earnestness that strength might be given her to fulfil it and that she might be spared such thoughts and occurrences as would be likely if not to disturb her resolution at least to harass her beyond endurance the distance of renzo without any probability of return that distance which she had hitherto felt so painful now seemed to her a dispensation of providence who had made the two events work together for the same end and she thought to find in one a motive of consolation for the other and following up this thought she began representing to herself that the same providence to complete the work would know what means to employ to induce renzo himself to be resigned to think no more but scarcely had such an idea entered her mind when all was again overturned the poor girl feeling her heart still prone to regret the vow again had recourse to prayer confirmation of the promise and inward struggles from which she arose if we may be allowed the expression like the wearied and wounded victor from his fallen enemy at this moment she heard approaching footsteps and joyous cries it was the little family returning from church two little girls and a young boy bounded into the house who stopping a moment to cast an inquisitive glance at lucia ran to their mother and gathered around her one inquiring the name of the unknown guest and how and why another attempting to relate the wonderful things they had just witnessed while the good woman replied to each and all 
be quiet be quiet with a more sedate step but with cordial interest depicted on his countenance the master of the house then entered he was if we have not yet said so the tailor of the village and its immediate neighborhood a man who knew how to read who had in fact read more than once il legendario di santi and il reali di francia and who had passed among his fellow villagers as a man of talent and learning a character however which he modestly disclaimed only saying that he had mistaken his vocation and that had he applied himself to study instead of so many others and so on with all this he was the best tempered creature in the world having been present when his wife was requested by the curate to undertake her charitable journey he had not only given his approbation but would also have added his persuasion had it been necessary and now that the services the pomp the concourse and above all the sermon of the cardinal had as the saying is elevated all his best feelings he returned home with eager anticipations and an anxious desire to know how the thing had succeeded and to find the innocent young creature safe see there she is said the good wife as he entered pointing to lucia who blushed and rose from her seat beginning to stammer forth some apology but he advancing towards her interrupted her excuses congratulating her on her safety and exclaiming welcome welcome you are the blessing of heaven in this house how glad i am to see you here i was pretty sure you would be brought out safely for i have never found that the lord began a miracle without bringing it to a good end but i am glad to see you here poor girl but it is indeed a great thing to have received a miracle let it not be thought that he was the only person who thus denominated this event because he had read the legendary as long as the remembrance of it lasted it was spoken of in no other terms in the whole village and throughout the neighborhood and to say truth considering its attendant and following consequences no other name is so appropriate then sidling up to his wife who was taking the kettle off the hook over the fire he whispered did everything go on well very well i'll tell you afterwards yes yes at your convenience dinner now being quickly served up the mistress of the house went up to lucia and leading her to the table made her take a seat then cutting off a wing of the fowl she set it before her and she and her husband sitting down they both begged their dispirited and bashful guest to make herself at home and take something to eat between every mouthful the tailor began to talk with great eagerness in spite of the interruptions of the children who stood round the table to their meal and who in truth had seen too many extraordinary things to, to play for any length of time the part of mere listeners he described the solemn ceremonies and then passed on to the miraculous conversion but that which had made the most impression upon him and to which he most frequently returned was the cardinal's sermon to see him there before the altar said he a gentleman like him like a curate and that gold thing he had on his head said a little girl hush to think i say a gentleman like him such a learned man too that from what people say he has read all the books there are in the world a thing which nobody else has ever done not even in milan to think that he knew how to say things in such a way that every one understood even i understood very well said another little prattler hold your tongue what may you have understood i wonder i understood that he was explaining the gospel instead of the signor curate well be quiet i don't say those who know something for then one is obliged to understand 
but even the dullest and most ignorant could follow out the sense go now and ask them if they could repeat the words that he spoke i'll engage they could not remember one but the meaning they will have in their heads and without ever mentioning the name of that signor how easy it was to see that he was alluding to him besides to understand that one had only to observe him with the tears standing in his eye and then the whole church began to weep yes indeed they did burst forth the little boy but why were they all crying in that way like children hold your tongue surely there are some hard hearts in this country and he made us see so well that though there is a famine here we ought to thank god and be content do whatever we can work industriously help one another and then be content because it is no disgrace to suffer and be poor the disgrace is to do evil and these are not only fine words for everybody knows that he lives like a poor man himself and takes the bread out of his own mouth to give to the hungry when he might be enjoying good times better than any one ah then it gives one satisfaction to hear a man preach not like so many others do what i say and not what i do and then he showed us that even those who are not what they call gentlemen if they have more than they actually want are bound to share it with those who are suffering here he interrupted himself as if checked by some thought he hesitated a moment then filling a platter from the several dishes on the table and adding a loaf of bread he put it into a cloth and taking it by the four corners said to his eldest girl here take this he then put into her other hand a little flask of wine and added go down to the widow maria leave her these things and tell her it is to make a little feast with her children but do it kindly and nicely you know that it may not seem as if you were doing her a charity and don't say anything if you meet anyone and take care of you break nothing lucia's eyes glistened and her heart glowed with tender emotion as from the conversation she had already heard she had received more comfort than an expressly consolatory sermon could possibly have imparted to her her mind attracted by these descriptions these images of pomp and these emotions of piety and wonder and sharing in the very enthusiasm of the narrator was detached from the consideration of its own sorrows and on returning to them found itself strengthened to contemplate them even the thought of her tremendous sacrifice though it had not lost its bitterness brought with it something of austere and solemn joy shortly afterwards the curate of the village entered and said that he was sent by the cardinal to inquire after lucia and to inform her that his grace wished to see her some time during the day and then in his lordship's name he returned many thanks to the worthy couple surprised and agitated the three could scarcely find words to reply to such messages from so great a personage and her mother hasn't arrived yet said the curate to lucia my mother exclaimed the poor girl then hearing from him how he had been sent to fetch her by the order and suggestion of the archbishop she drew her apron over her eyes and gave way to a flood of tears which continued to flow for some time after the curate had taken his leave when however the tumultuous feelings which had been excited by such an announcement began to yield to more tranquil thoughts the poor girl remembered that the now closely impending happiness of seeing her mother again a happiness so unhoped for a few hours previous was what she had expressively implored in those very hours and almost stipulated as a condition of her vow bring me in safely to my mother she had said and these words now presented themselves distinctly to her memory she strengthened herself more than ever in the resolution to maintain her promise and afresh and more bitterly lamented the struggle and regret she had for a moment indulged 
Agnes, indeed, while they were talking about her, was but a very little way off. It may easily be imagined how the poor woman felt at this unexpected summons, and at the announcement, necessarily defective and confused, of an escape but fearful danger, an obscure event, which the messenger could neither circumstantiate nor explain, and of which she had not the slightest ground of explanation in her own previous thoughts. After tearing her hair, after frequent exclamations of, Ah, oh, my God! Ah, oh, Madonna! After putting various questions to the messenger, which he had not the means of satisfying, she threw herself impetuously into the vehicle, continuing to utter on her way numberless ejaculations and useless inquiries but at the certain point she met don abandidio trudging on step after step and before each step his walking stick after an o oh from both parties he stopped agnes also stopped and dismounted and drawing him apart into a chestnut grove on the roadside she there learned from don abandidio all that he had been able to ascertain and observe the thing was not clear but at least agnes was assured that lucia was in safety and she again breathed freely after this don abandidio tried to introduce another subject and give her minute instructions as to how she ought to behave before the archbishop if as was likely he should wish to see her and her daughter and above all that it would not do to say a word about the wedding but agnes perceiving that he was only speaking for his own interest cut him short without promising indeed without proposing anything for she had something else to think about and immediately resumed her journey at length the cart arrived and stopped at the tailor's house lucia sprang up hastily agnes dismounted and rushed impetuously into the cottage and in an instant they were locked in each other's arms the good dame who alone was present tried to encourage and calm them and share with them in their joy then with her usual discretion she left them for a while alone saying that she would go and prepare a bed for them for which indeed she had the means though in any case both she and her husband would much rather have slept upon the ground than suffer them to go in search of shelter elsewhere for that night the first burst of sobs and embraces being over agnes longed to hear lucia's adventures and the latter began mournfully to relate them but as the reader is aware it was a history which no one knew fully and to lucia herself there were some obscure passages which were in fact quite inextricable more particularly the fatal coincidence of that terrible carriage being in the road just when lucia was passing on an extraordinary occasion on this point both mother and daughter were lost in conjecture without ever hitting the mark or even approaching the real cause as to the principal author of the plot neither one nor the other could for a moment doubt but that it was don rodrigo ah the black villain ah the infernal firebrand exclaimed agnes but his hour will come god will reward him according to his works and then he too will feel no no mother no interrupted lucia don't predict suffering for him don't predict it to any one if you knew what it was to suffer if you had tried it no no rather let us pray god and the madonna for him that god would touch his heart as he has done to this other poor signor who was worse than he is and is now a saint the shuddering horror that lucia felt in retracing such recent and cruel scenes made her more than once pause in the midst more than once she said she had not the courage to go on and after many tears with difficulty resumed her account 
but a different feeling checked her at a certain point of the narration at the mention of the vow the fear of being blamed by her mother as imprudent and precipitate or that as in the affair of the wedding she should bring forward one of her broad rules of conscience and try to make it prevail or that poor woman she should tell it to someone in confidence if nothing else to obtain light and counsel and thus make it publicly known from the bare idea of which lucia shrank back with insupportable shame together with a feeling of present shame and an inexplicable repugnance to speak on such a subject all these things together determined her to maintain absolute silence on this important circumstance proposing in her own mind to open herself first to father cristoforo but what did she feel when in inquiring after him she heard that he was no longer at pescaranico that he had been sent to a town far far away to a town bearing such and such a name and renzo said agnes he's in safety isn't he said lucia hastily that much is certain because everybody says so it is thought too pretty surely that he's gone to the territory of bergamo but the exact place nobody knows and hitherto he has sent no news of himself perhaps he hasn't yet found a way of doing so ah if he's in safety the lord be praised said lucia and she was seeking some other subject of conversation when they were interrupted by an unexpected novelty the appearance of the cardinal archbishop this holy prelate having returned from church where we last left him and having heard from the unnamed of lucia's safe arrival had sat down to dinner placing his new friend on his right hand in the midst of a circle of priests who were never weary of casting glances at that countenance now so subdued without weakness so humble without dejection and of comparing him with the idea that had so long entertained of this formidable personage end of chapter twenty four part two chapter twenty four part three of the betrothed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the betrothed by alexandro manzoni chapter twenty four part three dinner being removed the two again withdrew together after a conversation which lasted much longer than the first the unnamed set off anew for his castle on the same mule which had borne him thither in the morning and the cardinal calling the priest of the parish told him that he wished to be guided to the house where lucia had found shelter oh my lord replied the parish priest allow me and i will send directly to bid the young girl come here with her mother if she has arrived and their host too if my lord wishes indeed all that your illustrious grace desires to see i wish to go myself to see them replied federigo there is no necessity for your illustrious lordship to give yourself that trouble i will send directly to fetch them it's very quickly done insisted the persevering spoiler of his plans a worthy man on the whole not comprehending that the cardinal wished by this visit to do honour at once to the unfortunate girl to innocence to hospitality and to his own ministry but the superior having again expressed the same desire the inferior bowed and led the way when the two companions were seen to enter the street every one immediately gathered round them and in a few moments people flocked from every direction forming two wings at their sides and the train behind 
the curate officiously repeated come come keep back keep off fie fie federigo however forbade him let them alone let them alone and he walked on now raising his hand to bless the people now lowering it to fondle the children who gathered round his feet in this way they reached the house and entered the crowd hedging round the door outside in this crowd the tailor also found himself having followed behind like the rest with eager eyes and open mouth not knowing where they were going when he saw however this unexpected where he forced the throng to make way it may be imagined with what bustle crying over and over again make way for one who has the right to pass and so went into the house agnes and lucia heard an increasing murmur in the street and while wondering what it could be saw the door thrown open and admit the purple-clad prelate and the priest of the parish is this she demanded federigo of the curate and on receiving a sign in the affirmative he advanced towards lucia who was holding back with her mother both of them motionless and mute with surprise and bashfulness but the tone of his voice the countenance the behavior and above all the words of federigo quickly reanimated them poor girl he began god has permitted you to be put to a great trial but he has surely shown you that his eye was still over you that he has not forgotten you he has restored you in safety and has made use of you for a great work to show infinite mercy to one and to relieve at the same time many others here the mistress of the house came into the apartment who at the bustle outside had gone to the window upstairs and seeing who was entering the house hastily ran down after slightly arranging her dress and almost at the same moment the tailor made his appearance at another door seeing their guests engaged in conversation they quietly withdrew into one corner and waited there with profound respect the cardinal having courteously saluted them continued to talk to the women mingling with his words of comfort many inquiries thinking he might possibly gather from their replies some way of doing good to one who had undergone so much suffering it would be well if all priests were like your lordship if they would sometimes take the part of the poor and not to help put them into difficulties to get themselves out said agnes emboldened by the kind and affable behavior of federigo and annoyed at the thought that the signor don abandidio after having sacrificed others on every occasion should now even attempt to forbid their giving vent to their feelings and complaining to one who was set in authority over him when by an unusual chance the occasion for doing so presented itself just say all that you think said the cardinal speak freely i mean to say that if our signor curate had done his duty things wouldn't have gone as they have but the cardinal renewing his request that she should explain herself more fully she began to feel rather perplexed at having to relate a story in which she too had borne a part she did not care to make known especially to such a man however she contrived to manage it with the help of a little curtailing she related the intended match and the refusal of don abandidio nor was she silent on the pretext of the superiors which he had brought forward ah agnes and then she skipped on to don rodrigo's attempt and how having been warned of it they had been able to make their escape but indeed added she in conclusion we only escaped to be again caught in the snare if instead the signor curate had honestly told us the whole and had immediately married my poor children we would have gone away altogether directly privately and far enough off to a place where not even the wind would have known us but 
In this way time was lost, and now has happened what has happened. The Signor Curate shall render me an account of this matter, said the Cardinal. Oh, no, Signor, no, replied Agnes. I didn't speak on that account. Don't scold him for what is done is done, and besides it would do no good. It is his nature, and on another occasion he would do just the same. But Lucia, dissatisfied with this way of relating the story, added, We have also done wrong. It shows it was not the Lord's will that the plan should succeed. What can you have done wrong, my poor girl? asked Federigo. And in spite of the threatening glances which her mother tried to give her secretly, Lucia, in her turn, related the history of their attempt in Don Abandidio's house and concluded by saying we have done wrong and god has punished us for it take as from his hand the sufferings you have undergone and be of good courage said federigo for who have reason to rejoice and be hopeful but those who have suffered and are ready to accuse themselves he then asked where was the betrothed and hearing from agnes lucia stood silent with her head bent and downcast eyes how he had been outlawed he felt and expressed surprise and dissatisfaction and asked why it was agnes stammered out what little she knew of renzo's history i have heard speak of this youth said the cardinal but how happens it that a man involved in affairs of this sort is in treaty of marriage with this young girl he was a worthy youth said lucia blushing but in a firm voice he was even too quiet a lad added agnes and you may ask this of anybody you like even of the signor curate who knows what confusion they may have made down there what intrigues it takes little to make poor people seem rogues indeed it is true said the cardinal i'll certainly make inquiries about him and learning the name and residence of the youth he made a memorandum of them on his tablets he added that he expected to be at their village in a few days that then lucia might go thither without fear and that in the meanwhile he would think about providing her some secure retreat till everything was arranged for the best then turning to the master and mistress of the house who immediately came forward he renewed the acknowledgment which he had already conveyed through the priest of the parish and asked them whether they were willing to receive for a few days the guests which god has sent them oh yes sir replied the woman in a tone of voice and with a look which meant much more than the bare words seemed to express but her husband quite excited by the presence of such an interrogator and by the wish to do him honour in so important an occasion anxiously sought for some fine reply he wrinkled his forehead strained and squinted with his eyes compressed his lips stretched his intellect to its utmost extent strove fumbled about in his mind and there found an overwhelming medley of unfinished ideas and half-formed words but time pressed the cardinal signified that he had already interpreted his silence the poor man opened his mouth and pronounced the words you may imagine at this point not another word would occur to him this failure not only disheartened and vexed him at the moment but the tormenting remembrance ever after spoiled his complacency in the great honour he had received and how often in thinking it over and fancying himself again in the same circumstances did numberless words crowd upon his mind as it were out of spite any of which would have been better than that silly you may imagine but are not the very ditches full of wisdom too late the cardinal took his leave saying the blessing of god be upon this house the same evening he asked the curate in what way he could best compensate to the tailor who certainly could not be rich for the expenses he must have incurred especially in these times by his hospitality the curate replied that 
in truth neither the profits of his business nor the produce of some small fields which the good tailor owned would be enough this year to allow of his being liberal to others but that having laid by a little in the preceding years he was among the most easy in circumstances in the neighborhood and could afford to do a kindness without inconvenience as he certainly would with all his heart and that under any circumstances he would deem it an insult to be offered money in compensation he will probably said the cardinal have demands on people unable to pay you may judge yourself my most illustrious lord these poor people pay from the overplus of the harvest last year there was no overplus and this one everybody falls short of absolute necessaries very well replied federigo i will take all these debts upon myself and you will do me the pleasure of getting from him a list of sums and discharging them for me it will be a tolerable sum so much the better and you will have i dare say many more wretched and almost destitute of clothing who have no debts because they can get no credit alas too many one does what one can but how can we supply all in times like these tell him to clothe them at my expense and pay him well really this year all that does not go for bread seems a kind of robbery but this is a particular case we cannot close the history of this day without briefly relating how the unnamed concluded it this time the report of his conversion had preceded him in the valley and quickly spreading throughout it had excited among all the inhabitants consternation anxiety and angry whisperings to the first bravos or servants it mattered not which whom he met he made signs that they should follow him and so on on either hand all fell behind with unusual perplexity of mind but with their accustomed submission so that with a continually increasing train he at length reached the castle he beckoned to those who were loitering about the gate to follow him with the others entered the first court went towards the middle and here seated all the while on his saddle uttered one of his thundering calls it was the accustomed signal at which all his dependents who were within hearing immediately flocked towards him in a moment all those who were scattered throughout the castle attended to the summons and mingled with this already assembled party gazing eagerly at their master go and wait for me in the great hall said he and from his higher station on horseback he watched them all move off he then dismounted led the animal to the stable himself and repaired to the room where he was expected on his appearance a loud whispering was instantly hushed and retiring to one side they left a large space in the hall quite clear for him there may have been perhaps about thirty the unnamed raised his hand as if to preserve the silence his presence had already created raised his head which towered above all those of the assemblage and said listen all of you and let no one speak unless i bid him my friends the path we have hitherto followed leads to the depths of hell i do not mean to upbraid you i who have been foremost of you all the worst of all but listen to what i have to say the merciful god has called me to change my life and i will change it i have already changed it so may he do with you all know then and hold it for certain that i am resolved rather to die than to do anything more against his holy laws i revoke all the wicked commands you may any of you have received from me you understand me indeed i command you not to do anything i have before commanded and hold it equally certain that no one from this time forward shall do evil with my sanction in my service he who will remain with me under these conditions shall be to me as a son 
and i shall feel happy at the close of that day in which i shall not have eaten that i may supply the last of you with the last loaf i have left in the house he who does not wish to remain shall receive what is due of his salary and an additional gift he may go away but must never again set foot here unless it be to change his life for this purpose he shall always be received with open arms think about it to-night to-morrow morning i will ask you one by one for your reply and will then give you new orders for the present retire every one to his post and god who has exercised such mercy towards me incline you to do good resolutions here he ceased and all continued silent how various and tumultuous soever might be the thoughts at work in their hardened minds they gave no outward demonstration of emotion they were accustomed to receive the voice of their master as the declaration of a will from which there was no appeal and that voice announcing that the will was changed in no way denoted that it was enfeebled it never crossed the mind of one of them that because he was converted they might therefore assume over him and reply to him as to another man they beheld in him a saint but one of those saints who are depicted with a lofty brow and a sword in their hands besides the fear he inspired they also entertained for him especially those born in his service and they were a large proportion the affection of subjects they had all besides a kindly feeling of admiration for him and experienced in his presence a species of i will even say modest humility such as the rudest and most wanton spirits feel before an authority which they have once recognized again the things they had just heard from his lips were doubtless odious to their ears but neither false nor entirely alien to their understandings if they had a thousand times ridiculed them it was not because they disbelieved them but to obviate by ridicule the fear which any serious consideration of them would have awakened and now on seeing the effect of this fear on the mind like that of their master there was not one who did not either more or less sympathize with him at least for a little while in addition to all this those among them who had first heard the grand news beyond the valley had at the same time witnessed and related the joy the exultation of the people the new favor with which the unnamed was regarded and the veneration so suddenly exchanged for their former hatred their former terror so that in the man whom they had always regarded so to say as a superior being even while they in a great measure themselves constituted his strength they now beheld the wonder the idol of a multitude they beheld him exalted above others in a different but not less real manner ever above the common throng ever at the head they stood now confounded uncertain one of another and each one of himself some murmured some began to plan whether they could go to find shelter and employment some questioned with themselves whether they could make up their minds to become honest men some even moved by his words felt a sort of inclination to do so others without resolving upon anything proposed to promise everything readily to remain in the meanwhile where they could share the loaf so willingly offered and in those days so scarce and thus gain time for decision no one however uttered a syllable and when at the close of his speech the unnamed again raised his authoritative hand and beckoned to them to disperse they all moved off in the direction of the door as quietly as a flock of sheep he followed them out and placing himself in the middle of the courtyard stood to watch them by the dim evening light as they separated from each other and repaired to their several posts then returning to fetch a lantern he again traversed the courts corridors and halls 
visited every entrance, and after seeing that all was quiet, at length retired to sleep. Yes, to sleep, because he was sleepy. Never, though he had always industriously courted them, had he, in any conjuncture, been so overburdened with intricate and at the same time urgent affairs as at the present moment yet he was sleepy the remorse which had robbed him of rest the night before was not only unsubdued but even spoke more loudly more sternly more absolutely yet he was sleepy the order the kind of government established by him in that castle for so many years with so much care and such a singular union of rashness and perseverance he had now himself overturned by a few words the unlimited devotion of his dependents their readiness for any undertaking their ruffian-like fidelity on which he had long been accustomed to depend these he had himself shaken his various engagements had become a tissue of perplexities he had brought confusion and uncertainty into his household yet he was sleepy he went therefore into his chamber approached that bed which the night before he had found such a thorny couch and knelt down at its side with the intention of praying he found in fact in a deep and hidden corner of his mind the prayers he had been taught to repeat as a child he began to recite them and the words so long wrapped up as it were together flowed one after another as if emerging once more to light he experienced in this act a mixture of undefined feelings a kind of soothing pleasure in this actual return to the habits of innocent childhood a doubly bitter contrition at the thought of the gulf that he had placed between those former days and the present an ardent desire to attain by works of expiation a clearer conscience a state more nearly resembling that of innocence to which he could never return together with a feeling of deep gratitude and of confidence in that mercy which could lead him towards it and had already given so many tokens of willingness to do so then rising from his knees he lay down and was quickly wrapped in sleep thus ended a day still so much celebrated when our anonymous author wrote a day of which had he not written nothing would have been known at least nothing of the particulars for Ripamonti and Riviola, whom we have quoted above, merely recorded that, after an interview with Federigo, this remarkable tyrant wonderfully changed his course of life, and forever, and how few are there who have read the works of these authors. Fewer still are there who will read this of ours, and who knows whether in the valley itself if any one had the inclination to seek and the ability to find it there now remains the smallest trace the most confused tradition of such an event so many things have taken place since that time end of chapter twenty four part three chapter twenty five part one of the betrothed this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter 25, Part 1. Next day there was no one spoken of in Lucia's village and throughout the whole territory of Lecco but herself, the unnamed, the archbishop, and one other person who, however ambitious to have his name in men's mouths, would willingly, on this occasion, have dispensed with the honor. We mean the Senor Don Rodrigo. Not that his doings had not before been talked about, but they were detached, secret conversations, and that man must have been very well acquainted with his neighbor who would have ventured to discourse with him freely on such a subject. Nay, people did not even exercise those feelings on the subject of which they were capable 
for generally speaking when men cannot give vent to their indignation without imminent danger they not only show less than they feel or disguise it entirely but they feel less in reality but now who could refrain from inquiring and reasoning about so notorious an event in which the hand of heaven had been seen and in which two such personage bore a conspicuous part one in whom such a spirited love of justice was united to so much authority the other who with all his boldness had been induced as it were to lay down his arms and submit by the side of these rivals don rodrigo looked rather insignificant now all understood what it was to torment innocence with the wish to dishonor it to persecute it with such insolent perseverance with such atrocious violence with such abominable treachery they reviewed on this occasion all the other feats of the senor and said what they thought about all each one being emboldened by finding everybody else of the same opinion there were whisperings and general murmurs cautiously uttered however on account of the numberless bravos he had around him a large share of public animadversion fell also upon his friends and flatterers they said of the senor podesta that he richly deserved always deaf and blind and dumb on the doings of this tyrant but this also cautiously for the podesta had bailiffs with the doctor azica garbuli who had no weapons but gossiping and cabals and with other flatterers like himself they did not use so much ceremony these were pointed at and regarded with very contemptuous and suspicious glances so that for some time he judged it expedient to keep as much within his doors as possible don rodrigo astounded at this unlooked-for news so different to the tidings he had expected day after day and hour after hour remained ensconced in his den-like palace with no one to keep him company but his bravos devouring his rage for two days and on the third set off for milan had there been nothing else but the murmuring of the people perhaps since things had gone so far he would have stayed on purpose to face it or even to seek an opportunity of making an example to others of one of the most daring but the certain intelligence that the cardinal was coming into the neighborhood fairly drove him away the count his uncle who knew nothing of the story but what he had been told by attilio would certainly expect that on such an occasion don rodrigo should be the first to wait upon the cardinal and receive him in public the most distinguished reception every one must see how he was on the road to this consummation the count expected it and would have required a minute account of the visit for it was an important opportunity of showing in what esteem his family was held by one of the head powers to extricate himself from so odious a dilemma don rodrigo rising one morning before the sun threw himself into his carriage griso and some other bravos outside both in front and behind and leaving orders that the rest of his household should follow him took his departure like a fugitive like it will perhaps be allowed us to exalt our characters by so illustrious a comparison like catiline from rome fretting and fuming and swearing to return very shortly in a different guise to execute his vengeance in the meanwhile the cardinal proceeded on his visitation among the parishes in the territory of lecco taking one each day on the day in which he was to arrive at lucia's village a large part of the inhabitants were early on the road to meet him at the entrance of the village close by the cottage of our two poor women was erected a triumphal arch constructed of upright stakes and poles laid crosswise covered with straw and moss and ornamented with green boughs of holly distinguishable by its scarlet berries and other shrubs the front of the church was adorned with tapestry from every window ledge hung extended quilts and sheets and infant swaddling clothes disposed like drapery in short all the few necessary articles which could be converted either bodily or otherwise into the appearances of something superfluous towards evening the hour at which frederigo usually arrived at the church on his visitation tours all who had remained within doors old men women and children 
for the most part, set off to meet him, some in procession, some in groups, headed by Don Abondio, who in the midst of the rejoicing looked disconsolate enough, both from the stunning noise of the crowd and from the continual hurrying to and fro of the people, which, as he himself expressed it, quite dimmed his sight, together with a secret apprehension that the women might have been babbling, and that he would be called upon to tender an account of the wedding. At length the cardinal came in sight, or, to speak more correctly, the crowd in the midst of which he was carried in his litter, surrounded by his attendants, for nothing could be distinguished of his whole party, but a signal towering in the air above the heads of the people, part of the cross, which was borne by the chaplain mounted upon his mule. The crowd, which was dancing with Don Abandio, hurried forward in a disorderly manner to join the approaching party, while he, after ejaculating three or four times, Gently, in procession, what are you doing? turned back in vexation and muttering to himself, It is a perfect babble, a perfect babble, went to take refuge in the church until they had dispersed, and here he awaited the cardinal. The holy prelate, in the meanwhile, advanced slowly, bestowing benedictions with his land, and receiving them from the mouths of the multitude, while his followers had enough to do to keep their places behind him. As Lucia's countrymen, the villagers were anxious to receive the archbishop with more than ordinary honors, but this was no easy matter, for it had long been customary wherever he went for all to do the most they could. At the very beginning of his episcopate, on his first solemn entry into the cathedral, the rush and crowding of the populace upon him were such as to excite fears for his life, and some of the gentlemen who were nearest to him had actually drawn their swords to terrify and repulse the press. Such were their violent and uncouth manners, that even in making demonstrations of kindly feelings to a bishop in church, and attempting to regulate them, it was necessary almost to have recourse to bloodshed, and that deference would not perhaps have proven sufficient, had not two priests, strong in body and bold in spirit, raised him in their arms, and carried him at once from the door of the temple to the very foot of the high altar. From that time forward, in the many episcopal visits he had to make, his first entrance into the church might, without joking, be reckoned among his pastoral labors, and sometimes even among the dangers he had incurred. On this occasion he entered as best he could, went up to the altar, and thence, after a short prayer, addressed, as was his custom, a few words to his auditors of his affection for him, his desire for their salvation and the way in which they ought to prepare themselves for the services of the morrow. Then retiring to the parsonage, among many other things he had consulted about with the curate, he questioned him as to the character and conduct of Renzo. Don Abondio said that he was rather a brisk, obstinate, and hot-headed fellow, but on more particular and precise interrogations, he was obliged to admit that he was a worthy youth, and that he himself could not understand how he could have played all the mischievous tricks at Milan which had been reported of him. And about the young girl, resumed the cardinal, do you think she may not now return in security to her own home? For the present, replied Don Abandio, she might come and be as safe, the present, I say, as she wishes, but, added he with a sigh, your illustrious lordship ought to be always here, or at least near at hand. The Lord is always near, said the cardinal, as to the rest, I will think about placing her in safety. And he hastily gave orders that next morning early a litter should be dispatched, with an attendant to fetch the two women. Don Abandio came out from the interview quite delighted that the cardinal had talked to him about the two young people without requiring an account of his refusal to marry them. Then he knows nothing about it, he said to himself. Agnesa has held her tongue wonderful they have to see him again but i will give them further instructions that i will he knew not poor man that frederigo had not entered upon the discussion just because he intended to speak to him about it more at length when they were disengaged and that he wished before giving him what he deserved to hear his side of the question but the intentions of the good prelate for the safe placing of lucia had 
in the meanwhile, been rendered unnecessary. After he had left her, other circumstances had occurred which we will now proceed to relate. The two women, during the few days which they had to pass in the tailor's hospitable dwelling, had resumed as far as they could each her former accustomed manner of living. Lucia had very soon begged some employment, and as at the monastery, diligently plied her needle in a small retired room shut out from the gaze of the people. Agnesa occasionally went abroad, and at other times sat sewing with her daughter. Their conversations were more melancholy, as well as more affectionate. Both were prepared for a separation, since the lamb could not return to dwell so near the wolf's den. And when and what would be the end of this separation? The future was dark, inextricable, for one of them in particular. Agnesa, nevertheless, indulged in her own mind many cheerful anticipations that Renzo, if nothing evil had happened to him, would sooner or later send some news of himself, and if he had found some employment to which he could settle, if, and how could it be doubted, he still intended to keep faith with Lucia, why could they not go and live with him? With such hopes she often entertained her daughter, who found it, it is difficult to say, whether more mournful to listen to them or painful to reply. Her great secret she had always kept to herself, and uneasy, certainly, at concealing anything from so good a mother, yet restrained invincibly, as it were, by shame, and by the different fears we have before mentioned. She went from day to day without speaking. Her designs were very different from those of her mother, or rather she had no designs, and she had entirely given herself up to providence. She always, therefore, endeavored to divert or to let drop the conversation, or else said, in general terms, that she had no longer any hope or desire for anything in this world except to be soon restored to her mother. More frequently, however, tears came opportunely instead of words. Do you know why it appears so to you, said Agnesa? Because you've suffered so much, and it doesn't seem possible that it can turn out for good to you. But leave it to God, and if, let a ray come in, but one ray, and then I know whether you will always care about nothing. Lucia kissed her mother and wept. Besides this, a great friendship quickly sprang up between them and their host, where indeed should it exist unless between benefactors and the benefited. When both one and the other are worthy, good people. Agnesa particularly, had many long chats with the mistress of the house. The tailor, too, gave them a little amusement with his stories and moral discourses, and at dinner especially had always some wonderful anecdote to relate a Buvo d'Antona, or the Fathers of the Desert. End of chapter 25, part 1 Recording by Jeannie Whitfield Chapter 25, Part 2 The Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter 25, Part 2 A few miles from this village resided, at their country house, a couple of some importance, Don Ferrante and Donna Prasada. Their family, as usual, is unnamed by our anonymous author. Donna Prasada was an old lady, very much inclined to do good. The most praiseworthy employment, certainly, that a person can undertake, but which, like every other, can be too easily abused. To do good, we must know how to do it. And like everything else, we can only know this through the medium of our own passions, our own judgment, our own ideas which not unfrequently are rather as correct as they are capable of being than as they ought to be. Donna Prasetta acted towards her ideas as it is said one ought to do towards one's friends. She had few of them, but to those few she was very much attached. Among the few there were, unfortunately, many distorted ones, nor was it these she loved the best. Hence it happened, either that she proposed to herself as a good end what was not such in reality, or employed means which would rather produce an opposite effect, or thought them allowable when they were not at all so.
from a certain vague supposition that he who does more than his duty may also go beyond his right it happened that she could not see in an event what was actually there or did see what was not there and many other similar things which may and do happen to all not excepting the best but to donna prasada far too often and not unfrequently all at once on hearing lucia's wonderful case and all that was reported on this occasion of the young girl she felt a great curiosity to see her and sent a carriage with an aged attendant to fetch both mother and daughter the latter shrugged her shoulders and besought the tailor who was the bearer of the message to find some sort of excuse for her so long as it only related to the common people who tried to make acquaintance with the young girl who had been the subject of a miracle the tailor had willingly rendered her that service but in this instance resistance seemed in his eyes a kind of rebellion he made so many faces uttered so many exclamations used so many arguments that it wasn't customary to do so and that it was a grand house and that one shouldn't say no to great people and that it might be the making of their fortune and that the signora donna prasada besides all the rest was a saint too in short so many things that lucia was obliged to give way more especially as agnes confirmed all these reasonings with a corresponding number of ejaculations certainly surely arrived in the lady's presence she received them with much courtesy and numberless congratulations questioning and advising them with a kind of almost innate superiority but corrected by so many humble expressions tempered by so much interest in their behalf and sweetened with so many expressions of piety that agnes almost immediately and lucia not long afterwards began to feel relieved from the oppressive sense of awe with which the presence of such a lady had inspired them nay they even found something attractive in it in short hearing that the cardinal had undertaken to find lucia a place of retreat and urged by a desire to second and at the same time anticipate his good intention donna prasada proposed to take the young girl into her own house where no other services would be required of her than the use of her needle scissors and spindle adding that she would take upon herself the charge of informing his lordship beyond the obvious and immediate good in this work donna prasada saw in it and proposed to herself another perhaps a more considerable one in her ideas that of directing a young mind and of bringing into the right way one who greatly needed it for from the first moment she had heard lucia mentioned she became instantly persuaded that in a young girl who could have promised herself to a scoundrel a villain in short a scapegallows there must be some fault some hidden wickedness lurking within tell me what company you keep and i'll tell you what you are lucia's visit had confirmed this persuasion not that on the whole as the saying is she did not seem to donna prasada a good girl but there were many things to favor the idea that head hung down till her chin was buried in her neck her not replying at all or only in broken sentences as if by constraint might indicate modesty but they undoubtedly denoted a great deal of wilfulness it did not require much discernment to discover that that young brain had its own thoughts on the subject and those blushes every moment and those suppressed sighs two such eyes too which did not please donna prasada at all she held it for certain as if she knew it on good grounds that all lucia's misfortunes were a chastisement from heaven for her attachment to a rascal and a warning to her to give him up entirely and these premises being laid down she proposed to cooperate towards so good an end because as she often said both to herself and others she made it her object to second the will of heaven but she often fell into the misconception of taking for the will of heaven the fancies of her own brain however she took care not to give the least hint of the second intention we have named it was one of her maxims that to bring a good design to a useful issue the first requisite in the greater number of instances is not to let it be discovered the mother and daughter looked at each other 
considering the mournful necessity of their separating the offer seemed to both of them most acceptable when they had no choice for it on account of the vicinity of the residence to their village whither let the worst come to the worst they would return and be able to meet at the approaching festivity seeing a scent exhibited in each other's eyes they both turned to donna persada with such acknowledgment as expressed their acceptance of the proposal she renewed her kind affability and promises and said that they would shortly have a letter to present to his lordship after the women had taken their departure she got don ferrante to compose the letter he being a learned person as we shall hereafter relate more particularly was always employed by her as secretary on occasions of importance on one of such magnitude as this don ferrante exerted his utmost stretch of ingenuity and on delivering the rough draft to his partner to copy warmly recommended the orthography to her notice this being one of the many things he had studied and the few over which he had any command in the house donna prasada copied it very diligently and then dispatched the letter to the tailors this was two or three days before the cardinal sent the letter to convey the two women home arriving at the village before the cardinal had gone to church they alighted at the curate's house there was an order to admit them immediately the chaplain who was the first to see them executed the order only detaining them so long as was necessary to school them very hastily in the ceremonials they ought to observe towards his lordship and the titles by which they should address him his usual practice wherever he could effect it unknown to his grace it was a continual annoyance to the poor man to see the little ceremony that was used towards the cardinal in this particular all said he to the rest of the household through the excess of kindness of that saintly man from his great familiarity and then he related how with his own ears he had more than once even heard the reply yes sir and no sir the cardinal was at this moment busily talking with don abandio on some parish matters so that the latter had not the desired opportunity of giving his instructions also to the women he could only bestow upon them in passing as he withdrew and they came forward a glance which meant to say how well pleased he was with them and conjuring them like good creatures to continue silent after the first kind greeting on one hand and the first reverent salutation on the other agnes drew the letter from her bosom and handed it to the cardinal saying it is from the senora donna prasada who says she knows your most illustrious lordship well my lord it's natural enough among such great people that they should know each other when you have read it you will see very well said frederigo when he had read the letter and extracted the honey from don ferrante's flowers of rhetoric he knew the family well enough to feel certain that lucia had been invited thither with good intention and that there she would be secure from the machinations and violence of her persecutor what opinion he entertained of donna prasada's head we have no positive information probably she was not the person whom he would have chosen for such a purpose but as we have said or hinted elsewhere it was not his custom to undo arrangements made by those whose duty it was to make them that he might do them over again better take this separation also and the uncertainty in which you are placed calmly he added trust that it will soon be over and that god will bring matters to that end to which he seems to have directed them but rest assured that whatever he wills shall happen will be the best for you to lucia in particular he gave some further kind advice another word or two of comfort to both and then bestowing on them his blessing he let them go at the street door they found themselves surrounded by a crowd of friends of both sexes the whole population we may almost say who were waiting for them and who conducted them home as in triumph among the women there was quite a rivalry in congratulations sympathy and inquiries and all exclaimed with dissatisfaction on hearing that lucia would leave them the next day the men vied with each other in offering their services every one wished to keep guard at the cottage for that night upon this fact our anonymous author thinks fit to ground a proverb would you have many ready to help you be sure not to need them so many welcomes confounded and almost stunned lucia 
though on the whole they did her good by somewhat distracting her mind from those thoughts and recollections which even in the midst of the bustle and excitement rose only too readily on crossing that threshold on entering those rooms at the sight of every object when the bells began to ring announcing the approach of the hour for divine service everybody moved toward the church and to our newly returned friends it was a second triumphal march service being over don abandio who had hastened forward to see if perpetua had everything well arranged for dinner was informed that the cardinal wished to speak with him he went immediately to his noble guest's apartment who waiting until he drew near signor curate he began and these words were uttered in such a way as to convey the idea that they were the preface to a long and serious conversation signor curate why did you not unite in marriage this lucio with her betrothed husband those people have emptied the sack this morning thought don abandio as he stammered forth in reply your most illustrious lordship will doubtless have heard speak of the confusions which have risen out of this affair it has all been so intricate that to this very day one cannot see one's way clearly in it as your illustrious lordship may yourself conclude from this that the young girl is here after so many accidents as it were by a miracle and that the bridegroom after other accidents is nobody knows where i ask replied the cardinal whether it is true that before all these circumstances took place you refused to celebrate the marriage when you were requested to do so on the appointed day and if so why really if your illustrious lordship knew what intimations what terrible injunctions i have received not to speak he paused without concluding with a certain manner intended respectfully to insinuate that it would be indiscreet to wish to know more but said the cardinal with a voice and look much more serious than usual it is your bishop who for his own duty's sake and for your justification wishes to learn from you why you have not done what in your regular duties you were bound to do my lord said don abandio shrinking almost into a nutshell i did not like to say before but it seemed to me that things being so entangled and, and so long gone by and now irremediable it was useless to bring them up again however however i say i know your illustrious lordship will not betray one of your poor priests for you see my lord your illustrious lordship cannot be everywhere at once and i remain here exposed but when you command it i will tell you i will tell you all tell me i only wish to find you free from blame don abandio then began to relate the doleful history but suppressing the principal name he merely substituted a great signor thus giving to prudence the little that he could in such an emergency and you had no other motive asked the cardinal having attentively heard the whole perhaps i have not sufficiently explained myself replied don abandio i was prohibited under pain of death to perform this marriage and does this appear to you a sufficient reason for omitting a positive duty i have always endeavored to do my duty even at very great inconvenience but when one's life is concerned and when you presented yourself to the church said frederigo in a still more solemn tone to receive holy orders did she caution you about your life did she tell you that the duties belonging to the ministry were free from every obstacle exempt from every danger or did she tell you that where danger begins there duty would end did she not expressly say to the contrary did she not warn you that she sent you forth as a sheep among wolves did you not know that there are violent oppressors to whom what you are commanded to perform would be displeasing he from whom we have received teaching and example in imitation of whom we suffer ourselves to be called and call ourselves shepherds when he descended upon the earth to execute his office did he lay down as a condition the safety of his life and to save it to preserve it i say a few days longer upon earth 
at the expense of charity and duty did he institute the holy unction the imposition of hands the gift of the priesthood leave it to the world to teach this virtue to advocate this doctrine what do i say oh shame the world itself rejects it the world also makes its own laws which fix the limits of good and evil it too has its gospel a gospel of pride and hatred and it will not have it said that the love of life is a reason for transgressing its precepts it will not and it is obeyed and we children and proclaimers of the promise what would the church be if such language as yours were that of all your brethren where would she be had she appeared in the world with these doctrines don abandio hung his head his mind during these arguments was like a chicken in the talons of a hawk which holds its prey elevated to an unknown region to an atmosphere it has never before breathed finding that he must make some reply he said in an unconvinced tone of submission my lord i shall be to blame when one is not to consider one's life i don't know what to say but when one has to do with some people people who possess power and won't hear reason i don't see what is to be gained by it even if one were willing to play the bravo the signor is one whom it is impossible either to conquer or win over don't you know that suffering for righteousness sake is our conquest if you know not this what do you preach what are you teacher of what is the good news you announce to the poor who requires from you that you should conquer force by force surely you will not one day be asked if you were able to overcome the powerful for this purpose neither your mission nor rule was given to you but you will assuredly be demanded whether you employed the means you possessed to do what was required of you even when they had the temerity to prohibit you <sighs> these saints are very odd thought don abandio meanwhile in substance to extract the plain meaning he has more at heart the affections of two young people than the life of a poor priest and as to himself he would have been very well satisfied had the conversation ended here but he saw the cardinal at every pause wait with the air of one who expects a reply a confession or an apology in short something i repeat my lord he answered therefore that i shall be to blame one can't give oneself courage and why then i might ask you did you undertake an office which finds upon you a continual warfare with the passions of the world but i will rather say how is it you do not remember that if in this ministry however you may have been placed there courage is necessary to fulfill your obligation there is one who will infallibly bestow it upon you when you ask him think you all the millions of martyrs naturally possessed courage that they naturally held life in contempt so many young persons just beginning to enjoy it so many aged ones accustomed to regret that it is so near its end so many children so many mothers all possessed courage because courage was necessary and they relied upon god knowing your own weakness and the duties to which you were called have you ever thought of preparing yourself for the difficult circumstances in which you might be placed in which you actually are placed at present ah if for so many years of pastoral labors you have loved your flock and how could you not love them if you have placed in them your affection your cares your happiness courage ought not fail you in the moment of need love is intrepid now surely if you love those who have been committed to your spiritual care those whom you call children when you saw two of them threatened as well as yourself ah surely as the weakness of the flesh made you tremble for yourself so love would have made you tremble for them you would feel humbled for your former fears as the effect of your corrupt nature you would have implored strength to overcome them to expel them as a temptation but a holy and noble fear for others for your children 
This you would have listened to. This would have given you no peace. This would have incited, constrained you to think and to do all you could to avert the dangers that threatened them. With what has this fear, this love inspired you? What have you done for them? What have you thought for them? And he ceased in token of expectation. End of chapter 25, part 2 Recording by Jeannie Whitfield, Mississippi, USA Chapter 26, Part 1 of The Betrothed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Betrothed by Alexandro Manzoni. Chapter 26, Part 1. At such a question, Don Abondidio, who had been studying to find some reply in the least precise terms possible, stood without uttering a word, and, to speak the truth, even we, with the manuscript before us, and pen in hand, having nothing to contend with but words, nor anything to fear but the criticisms of our readers, even we, I say, feel a kind of repugnance in proceeding. We feel somewhat strange in this setting forth, with so little trouble, such admirable precepts of fortitude and charity, of active solicitude for others, an unlimited sacrifice of self. But remembering that these things were said by one who also practiced them, we will confidently proceed. You give me no answer, resumed the cardinal. Ah, if you had done on your part what charity and duty required of you, however things had turned out, you would now have something to answer. You see, then, yourself what you have done? You have obeyed the voice of iniquity, unmindful of the requirements of duty. You have obeyed her punctually. She showed herself to you to signify her desire. But she wished to remain concealed from those who could have sheltered themselves from her reach and been on their guard against her. She did not wish to resort to arms. She desired secrecy to mature her designs of treachery and force at leisure. She required of you transgression and silence. You have transgressed and kept silent. I ask you now whether you have not done more. You will tell me whether it be true that you alleged false pretext for your refusal, that you might not reveal the true motive. And he paused a while, awaiting a reply. The tell-tales have reported this, too, thought Donna Bundidio. But as he gave no token in words of having anything to say, the cardinal continued, If it be true, then, that you told these poor people what was not the case, to keep them in the ignorance and darkness in which inequity wished them to be, I must believe it, then. It only remains for me to blush for it with you, and to hope that you will weep for it with me. See, then, to what this solicitude, good God, and but just now you adduced it as a justification. This solicitude for your temporal life has led you. It has led you. Repel freely these words, if you think them unjust. Take them as a salutary humiliation, if they are not. It has led you to deceive the weak, to lie to your own children. Just see now how things go, thought Don Abundidio again to himself, to that fiend, meaning the unnamed, his arms round his neck, and to me, for the half-lie uttered for the sole purpose of saving my life, all this fuss and noise. But they are our superiors. They're always in the right it's my ill star that everybody sets upon me even saints and speaking aloud he said i have done wrong i see that i have done wrong but what could i do in an extremity of that kind 
do you still ask this have not i told you already must i tell you again you should have loved my son loved and prayed then you would have felt that iniquity may indeed have threats to employ blows to bestow but not commands to give you would have united according to the law of god those whom man wished to put asunder you would have extended towards these unhappy innocents the ministry they had a right to claim from you god himself would have been surety for the consequences because you had followed his will by following another's you have come in as answerable and for what consequences but supposing all human resources failed you supposing no way of escape was open when you looked anxiously around you thought about it sought for it then you might have known that when your poor children were married they would themselves have provided their escape that they were ready to flee from the face of their powerful enemy and had already designed a place of refuge but even without this did you not remember that you had a superior how would he have this authority to rebuke you for having been wanting in the duties of your office did he not feel himself bound to assist you in fulfilling them why did you not think of acquainting your bishop with the impediment that infamous violence had placed in the way of the exercise of your ministry the very advice of perpetua thought don abondidio pettishly who in the midst of this conversation had most vividly before his eyes the image of the bravos and the thought that don rodrigo was still alive and well and that he would some day or other be returning in glory and triumph and furious with revenge and though the presence of so high a dignitary together with his countenance and language filled him with confusion and inspired him with fear yet it was not such a fear as completely to subdue him or expel the idea of resistance because this idea was accompanied by the recollection that after all the cardinal employed neither musket nor sword nor bravos why did you not remember pursued the bishop that if there were no other retreat open to these betrayed innocents i at least was ready to receive them and put them in safety had you directed them to me the desolate to a bishop as belonging to him as a precious part i don't say of his charge but of his riches and as to yourself i should have become anxious for you i should not have slept till i was sure that not a hair of your head would be injured do you think i had not the means of securing your life think you that he who was so very bold would have remitted nothing of his boldness when he was aware that his plots and contrivances were known elsewhere were known to me that i was watching him and was resolved to use all the means within my power in your defence didn't you know that if men too often promise more than they can perform so they not unfrequently threaten more than they would attempt to execute didn't you know that inequity depends not only on its own strength but often also on the fears and credulity of others just perpetua's arguments again thought don abondidio never reflecting that his singular concurrence of his servant and federigo boremio in deciding on what he might and should have done would tell very much against him but you pursued the cardinal in conclusion saw nothing and would see nothing but your own temporal danger what wonder that it seemed to you sufficient to outweigh every other consideration it was because i myself saw those terrible faces escape from don abondidio in reply i myself heard their words your illustrious lordship can talk very well but you ought to be in a poor priest's shoes and find yourself brought to the point no sooner however had he uttered these words than he bit his tongue with vexation he saw that he had allowed himself to be too much carried away by petulance and said to himself now comes the storm but raising his eyes doubtfully 
he was utterly astonished to see the countenance of that man whom he never could succeed in divining or comprehending pass from solemn air of authority and rebuke to a sorrowful and pensive gravity tis too true said federigo such is our miserable and terrible condition we must rigorously exact from others what god only knows whether we should be ready to yield we must judge correct reprove and god knows what we ourselves should do in the same circumstances what we actually have done in similar ones but woe unto me had i to take my own weaknesses as the measure of other people's duties or the rule of my own teaching yet i certainly ought to give a good example as well as a good instruction to others and not to be like the pharisees who laid men with burdens grievous to be borne while they themselves touched not the burden with one of their fingers well then my son my brother as the errors of those in authority are often better known to others than to themselves if you are aware of my having from pusillanimity or from any other motive failed in any part of my duty tell me of it candidly and help me to amend so that where example has been wanting confession at least may supply its place remonstrate freely with me on my weaknesses and then my words will acquire more value in my mouth because you will feel more vividly than they are not mine but are the words of him who can give both to you and me the necessary strength to do what they prescribe oh what a holy man but what a tormentor thought don abondidio he doesn't even spare himself that i should examine interfere with criticize and accuse even himself he then said aloud o oh my lord you are joking with me who does not know the fortitude of mine the intrepid zeal of your illustrious lordship and in his heart he added even too much so i did not ask you for praise which makes me tremble said federigo for god knows my failings and what i know of them myself is enough to confound me but i wish that we should humble ourselves together before him that we might depend upon him together i would for your own sake that you should feel how your conduct has been and your language still is opposed to the law you nevertheless preach and according to which you will be judged all falls upon me said don abondidio but these people who have told you this didn't probably tell you too of their having introduced themselves treacherously into my house to take me by surprise and to contract a marriage contrary to the laws they did tell me my son but it is this that grieves that depresses me to see you still anxious to excuse yourself still thinking to excuse yourself by accusing others still accusing others of what ought to make part of your own confession who placed them i don't say under the necessity but under the temptation to do what they have done would they have sought this irregular method had not the legitimate one been closed against them would they have thought of snaring their pastor had they been received to his arms assisted advised by him or of surprising him had he not concealed himself or do you lay the blame upon them and are you indignant because after so many misfortunes what do i say in the midst of misfortune they have said a word or two to give vent to their sorrows to their and your pastor that the appeals of the oppressed and the complaints of the afflicted are odious to the world is only too true but we but what advantage would it have been to you had they remained silent would it turn to your profit that their cause should be left entirely to the judgment of god is it not a fresh reason why you should love these persons and you have many already that they have afforded you an opportunity of hearing the sincere voice of your pastor that they have given you the means of knowing more clearly 
and in part discharging the great debt you owe them ah if they have provoked offended annoyed you i would say to you and need i say it love them exactly for that reason love them because they have suffered because they still suffer because they are yours because they are weak because you have need of pardon to obtain which think of what efficacy their prayer may be don abandidio was silent but it was no longer an unconvinced and scornful silence it was that of one who has more things to think about than to say the words he had heard were unexpected consequences novel applications of a doctrine he had nevertheless long believed in his heart without a thought of disputing it the misfortunes of others from the contemplation of which his fears of personal misfortune had hitherto diverted his mind now made a new impression upon him and if he did not feel all the contrition which the address was intended to produce for this same fear was ever at hand to execute the office of defensive advocate yet he felt it in some degree he experienced dissatisfaction with himself a kind of pity for others a mixture of compunction and shame it was if we may be allowed the comparison like the crushed and humid wick of a candle which on being presented to the flame of a large torch at first smokes spurts crackles and will not ignite but it lights at length and well or ill burns he would have accused himself bitterly he would even have wept had it not been for the thought of don rodrigo and as it was betrayed sufficient emotion to convince the cardinal that his words had not been entirely without effect now pursued he the one a fugitive from his home the other on the point of abandoning it both with two good reasons for absenting themselves and without a probability of ever meeting again here even if god proposes to reunite them now alas they have too little need of you now you have no opportunity of doing them any service nor can our limited foresight predict any for the future but who knows whether a god of mercy may not be preparing some for you ah suffer them not to escape seek them be on the watch for them beseech him to create them for you i will not fail my lord i will not fail i assure you replied don abandidio in a tone that showed it came from the heart ah yes my son yes exclaimed federigo and with a dignity full of affection he concluded heaven knows how i should have wished to hold a different conversation with you we have both lived long heaven knows if it has not been painful to me to be obliged thus to grieve your gray hairs with reprimands how much more gladly i would have shared with you our common cares and sorrows and conversed with you on the blessed hope to which we have so nearly approached god grant that the language which i have been compelled to use may be of use to us both you would not wish that he should call me to account at the last day for having countenanced you in a course of conduct in which you have so unhappily fallen short of your duty let us redeem the time the hour of midnight is at hand the bridegroom cannot tarry let us therefore keep our lamps burning let us offer our hearts miserable and empty as they are to god that he may be pleased to fill them with that charity which amends the past which is a pledge of the future which fears and trusts weeps and rejoices with true wisdom which becomes in every instance the virtue of which we stand in need so saying he left the room followed by don abandidio here our anonymous author informs us that this was not the only interview between these two persons nor lucia the only subject of these interviews but that he had confined himself to the mention of this one that he might not digress too far from the principal object of his narrative 
and for the same reason he does not make mention of other notable things said and done by federigo throughout the whole course of his visitation or of his liberality or of the dissensions composed and the ancient feuds between individuals families and entire towns extinguished or which was at last far more frequent suppressed or of the sundry ruffians and petty tyrants tamed either for life or for some time all of them things which occurred more or less in every part of the diocese where this excellent man made any stay he then goes on to say how next morning donna presidi came according to agreement to fetch lucia and to pay her respects to the cardinal who spoke in high terms of the young girl and recommended her warmly to the signora lucia parted from her mother it may be imagined with what tears left her cottage and a second time said farewell to her native village with that sense of doubly bitter sorrow which is felt on leaving a spot which was once dearly loved and can never be so again but this parting from her mother was not the last for donna Prasidi had announced that she should still reside some time at their country house which was not very far off and agnes had promised her daughter to go thither to give and receive a more mournful adieu end of chapter twenty six part one chapter twenty six part two of the betrothed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the betrothed by alessandro manzoni chapter twenty six part two the cardinal was himself just starting for another parish when the curate of that in which the castle of the unnamed was situated arrived and requested to speak to him on being admitted he presented a packet and a letter from that nobleman wherein he besought federigo to prevail upon lucia's mother to accept a hundred scudi of gold which were contained in the parcel to serve either as a dowry for the young girl or for any other use which the two women might deem more suitable requesting him at the same time to tell them that if ever on any occasion they thought he could render them any service the poor girl knew too well where he lived and that for him this would be one of the most desirable events that could happen the cardinal immediately sent for agnes who listened with equal pleasure and amazement to the courteous message and suffered the packet to be put into her hand without much scrupulous ceremony may god reward the signor for it said she and will your illustrious lordship thank him very kindly and don't say a word about it to anybody because this is a kind of country excuse me sir i know very well that a gentleman like you won't chatter about these things but you understand me home she went as quickly as possible shut herself up in her room unwrapped the parcel and however prepared by anticipation beheld with astonishment so many of those coins altogether and all her own of which she had perhaps never seen more than one at once before and that but seldom she counted them over and then had some trouble in putting them together again and making the whole hundred stand up upon their edges for every now and then they would jut out and slide from under her inexpert fingers at length however she succeeded in rolling them up after a fashion put them in a handkerchief so as to make quite a large parcel and wrapping a piece of cord several times round it went and tucked it into a corner of her straw mattress 
the rest of the day was spent in castle building devising plans for the future and longing for the morrow after going to bed she lay for a long time awake with the thought of the hundred scudi she had beneath her to keep her company and when asleep she saw them in her dreams by break of day she arose and set off in good time towards the villa where her daughter was residing though lucia's extreme reluctance to speak of her vow was in no degree diminished she had on her part resolved to force herself to open her mind to her mother in this interview as it would be the last they should have for a long time scarcely were they left alone when agnes with a look full of animation and at the same time in a suppressed tone of voice as if there were some one present who she was afraid would hear began i've a grand thing to tell you and proceeded to relate her unexpected good fortune god bless this signor said lucia now you have enough to be well off yourself and you can also do good to others why replied agnes don't you see how many things we may do with so much money listen i have nobody but you but you too i may say for for the time that he began to address you i've always considered renzo as my son the whole depends upon whether any misfortune has happened to him seeing he gives no sign of being alive but oh surely all won't go ill with us we'll hope not we'll hope not for me i should have liked to lay my bones in my native country but now that you can't be there thanks to that villain and when i remember that he is near even my country has become hateful to me and with you too i can be happy anywhere i was always inclined to go with you both to the very end of the world and have ever been in readiness but how could we do it without money do you understand now the little sum that the poor fellow had been scarcely able to lay by with all his frugality justice came and cleared it away but the lord has sent us a fortune to make up for it well when he has found a way of letting us know that he is alive where he is and what are his intentions i'll come to milan and fetch you i i'll come myself once upon a time i should have thought twice about such a thing but misfortune makes one experienced and independent i've gone as far as monza and know what it is to travel i'll bring with me a proper companion a relation as i may say alessio of magianico for to say the truth a fit person isn't to be found in the country at all i'll come with him we'll pay the expense and do you understand but perceiving that instead of cheering up lucia became more and more dejected and only exhibited emotion unmixed with pleasure she stopped abruptly in the midst of her speech and said but what's the matter with you don't you see it poor mamma exclaimed lucia throwing her arm around her neck and burying her weeping face in her bosom what is the matter again asked her mother anxiously i ought to have told you at first said lucia raising her head and composing herself but i never had the heart to do it pity me but tell me then now i can no longer be that poor fellow's wife why why with a head hung down a beating heart and tears rolling down her cheeks like one who relates something which though a misfortune is unalterable lucia disclosed her vow and at the same time clasping her hands again besought her mother's forgiveness for having hitherto concealed it from her she implored her not to speak of such a thing to any living being and to give her help and facilitate the fulfilment of what she had promised agnes remained stupefied with consternation she would have been angry with her for her silence to her mother but the more serious thoughts the case itself aroused stifled this personal vexation 
she would have reproached her for the act but it seemed to her that that would be a murmuring against heaven the more so as lucia began to depict more vividly than ever the horrors of that night the absolute desolation and the unhoped for deliverance between which the promise had been so expressly so solemnly made and all the while example after example rose to the recollection of the listener which she had often heard repeated and had repeated herself to her daughter of strange and terrible punishments following upon the violation of a vow after a few moments of astonishment she said and what would you do now now replied lucia it is the lord who must think for us the lord and the madonna i have placed myself in their hands they have not forsaken me hitherto they will not forsake me now that the mercy i ask for myself of the lord the only mercy after the salvation of my soul is that he will let me rejoin you and he will grant it to me yes i feel sure he will that day in that carriage o oh, most holy virgin those men who would have told me that they were bringing me to this that they would bring me to join my mother the next day but not to tell your mother of it at once said agnes with a kind of anger subdued by affection and pity oh pity me i had not the heart and what use would it have been to grieve you so long ago and renzo said agnes shaking her head ah exclaimed lucia with a sudden start i must think nothing more of that poor fellow long ago god had not destined see how it appears that it was his will we should be kept asunder and who knows but no no the lord will have preserved him from danger and will make him even happier without me but now you see replied agnes if it were not that you are bound forever for all the rest if no misfortune has happened to renzo i might have found a remedy with so much money but should we have got this money replied lucia if i had not passed through such a night it is the lord who has ordered everything as it is his will will be done and here her voice was choked with tears at this unexpected argument agnes remained silent and thoughtful in a few moments however lucia suppressing her sobs resumed now that the deed is done we must submit to it with cheerfulness and you my poor mother you can help me first by praying to the lord for your unhappy daughter and then that poor fellow must be told of it you know will you see to this and do me also this kindness for you can think about it when you can find out where he is get someone to write to him find a man oh your cousin alicio is just the man a prudent and kind person who has always wished us well and won't gossip and tell tales get him to write the things just as it is where i have been how i have suffered and that god has willed it should be thus and that he must set his heart at rest and that i can never never be anybody's wife and tell him of it in a kind and clever way explain to him that i have promised that i have really made a vow when he knows that i have promised the madonna he has always been good and religious and you the moment you have any news of him get somebody to write to me let me know that he is well and then let me never hear anything more agnes with much feeling assured her daughter that everything should be done as she desired there's one thing more i have to say resumed lucia this poor fellow if he hadn't had the misfortune to think of me all that has happened to him never would have happened he's a wanderer in the wide world they've ruined him on setting out in life they've carried away all he had all those little savings he had made poor fellow you know why and we have so much money o oh, mother as the lord has sent us so much wealth and you look upon this poor fellow true enough as belonging to you 
yes as your son oh divided between you for most assuredly god won't let us want look out for the opportunity of a safe bearer and send it to him for heaven knows how much he wants it well what do you think replied agnes i'll do it indeed poor youth why do you think i was so glad of this money but i certainly came here very glad so i did well i'll send it to him poor youth but he too i know what i would say certainly money gives pleasure to those who want it but it isn't this that will make him rich lucia thanked her mother for her ready and liberal assent with such deep gratitude and affection as would have convinced an observer that her heart still secretly clung to renzo more perhaps than she herself believed and what shall i a poor solitary woman do without you said agnes weeping in her turn and i without you my poor mother and in a stranger's house and down there in milan but the lord will be with us both and afterwards will bring us together again between eight and nine months hence we shall see each other once more here and by that time or even before it i hope he will have disposed matters to our comfort leave it to him i will ever ever beseech the madonna for this mercy if i had anything else to offer her i would do it but she is so merciful that she will obtain it for me as a gift with these and other similar and oft-repeated words of lamentation and comfort of opposition and resignation of interrogation and confident assurance with many tears and after long and renewed embraces the women tore themselves apart promising by turns to see each other the next autumn at the latest as if the fulfilment of these promises depended upon themselves and as people always do nevertheless in similar cases meanwhile a considerable time passed away and agnes could hear no tidings of renzo neither letter nor message reached her from him and among all those whom she could ask from bergamo or the neighborhood no one knew anything at all about him nor was she the only one who made inquiries in vain cardinal federigo who had not told the poor woman merely out of compliment that he would seek for some information concerning the unfortunate man had in fact immediately written to obtain it having returned to milan after his visitation he received a reply in which he was informed that the address of the person he had named could not be ascertained that he had certainly made some stay in such a place where he had given no occasion for any talk about himself but that one morning he had suddenly disappeared that a relative of his with whom he had lodged there knew not what had become of him and could only repeat certain vague and contradictory rumors which were afloat that the youth had enlisted for the levant had passed into germany or had perished in fording a river but that the writer would not fail to be on the watch and if any better authenticated tidings came to light would immediately convey them to his most illustrious and very reverend lordship these and various other reports at length spread throughout the territory of lesio and consequently reached the ears of agnes the poor woman did her utmost to discover what was the true account and to arrive at the origin of this and that rumour but she never succeeded in tracing it further than they say which even at the present day suffices by itself to attest the truth of facts sometimes she had scarcely heard one tale when someone would come and tell her not a word of it was true only however to give her another in compensation equally strange and disastrous the truth is all these rumors were alike unfounded the governor of milan and captain-general in italy 
don gonzalos fernandez de cardoba had complained bitterly to the venetian minister resident at milan because a rogue and public robber a promoter of plundering and massacre the famous lorenzo tramaglino who while in the very hands of justice had excited an insurrection to force his escape had been received and harbored in the bergamanskan territory the minister in residence replied that he knew nothing about it he would write to venice that he might be able to get his excellency any explanation that could be procured on the subject it was a maxim of venetian policy to second and cultivate the inclination of milanese silk weavers to immigrate into the bergamanskan territory and with this object to provide many advantages for them more especially that without which every other was worthless we mean security as however when two great diplomatists dispute in however trifling a matter third parties must always have a taste in the shape of consequences bartolo was warned in confidence it was not known by whom that renzo was not safe in that neighbourhood and that he would do wisely to place him in some other manufacture for a while even under a false name bartolo understood the hint raised no objections explained the matter to his cousin took him with him in a carriage conveyed him to another new silk mill about fifteen miles off and presented him under the name of antonio riviolta to the owner who was a native of the milanese and an old acquaintance this person though the times were so bad needed little entreaty to receive a workman who was recommended to him as honest and skilful by an intelligent man like bartolo on the trial of him afterwards he found he had only reason to congratulate himself on the acquisition excepting that at first he thought the youth must be naturally rather stupid because when any one called antonio he generally did not answer soon after an order came from venice in peaceable form to the sheriff of bergamo requiring him to obtain and forward information whether in his jurisdiction or more expressly in such a village such as an individual was to be found the sheriff having made the necessary researches in the manner he saw was desired transmitted a reply in the negative which was transmitted to the minister at milan who transmitted it to don gonzalo fernandez de cordova there was not wanting inquisitive people who tried to learn from bartolo why this youth was no longer with him and where he had gone to the first inquiry he replied nay he has disappeared but afterwards to get rid of the most pertinacious without giving them a suspicion of what was really the case he contrived to entertain them some with one some with another of the stories we have before mentioned always however as uncertain reports which he also had heard related without having any positive accounts but when inquiries came to be made of him by commission from the cardinal without mentioning his name and with a certain show of importance and mystery merely giving him to understand that it was in the name of the, a great personage bartolo became the more guarded and deemed it the more necessary to adhere to his general method of reply nay as a great personage was concerned he gave out by wholesale all the stories which he had published one by one of his various disasters let it not be imagined that such a person as don gonzalo bore any personal enmity to the poor mountain silk weaver that informed perhaps of his irreverence and ill language towards his moorish king chained by the throat he would have wreaked his vengeance upon him or that he thought him so dangerous a subject as to be worth pursuing even in flight and not suffer to live even at a distance 
like the roman senate with hannibal don gonzalos had too many and too important affairs in his head to trouble himself about renzo's doings and if it seemed that he did not trouble himself about them it arose from a singular combination of circumstances by which the poor unfortunate fellow without desiring it and without being aware of it either then or even afterwards found himself linked as by a very subtle and invisible chain to these same too many and too important affairs end of chapter twenty six part two chapter twenty seven part one of the betrothed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the betrothed or e promesi sposi by alessandro manzoni chapter twenty seven part one it has already occurred to us more than once to make mention of the war which was at this time raging for the succession of the states of the duke vicenzo gonzaga the second of that name but it has always occurred in a moment of great haste so that we have never been able to give more than a cursory hint of it now however for the due understanding of our narrative a more particular notice of it is required they are matters which any one who knows anything of history must be acquainted with but as from a just estimate of ourselves we must suppose that this work can be read by none but the ignorant it will not be amiss that we should here relate as much as will suffice to give some idea of them to those who need it we have said that on the death of this duke the first in the line of succession carlo gonzaga head of a younger branch now established in france where he possessed the duchies of nevers and retel had entered upon the possession of mantua and we now add of montferrat for our haste made us leave this name on the point of the pen the spanish minister who was resolved to any compromise we have said this too to exclude the new prince from these two fiefs and who to exclude him wanted some pretext because wars made without any pretext would be unjust had declared himself the upholder of the claims which another gonzaga ferrante prince of the guastala pretended to have upon mantua and carlo emmanuel i duke of savoy and margarita gonzaga dowager duchess of lorraine upon montferrat don gonzalo who was of the family of the great commander and bore his name who had already made war in flanders and was extremely anxious to bring one into italy was perhaps the person who made most stir that this might be undertaken and in the meanwhile interpreting the intentions and anticipating the orders of the above-named minister he concluded a treaty with the duke of savory for the invasion and partition of montferrat and afterwards readily obtained a ratification of it from the count duke by persuading him that the acquisition of casale would be very easy which was the most strongly defended point of the portion assigned to the king of spain he protested however in the king's name against any intention of occupying the country further than under the name of a deposit until the sentence of the emperor should be declared who partly from the influence of others partly from private motives of his own had in the meanwhile denied the investiture to the new duke and intimated to him that he should give up to him a sequestration of the controverted states afterwards having heard the different sides he would restore them to him who had the best claim to these conditions the duke of nevers would not consent he had however 
friends of some eminence in the cardinal de richelieu the venetian nobleman and the pope but the first of these at that time engaged in the siege of la rochelle and in a war with england and thwarted by the party of the queen mother maria de medici who for certain reasons of her own was opposed to the house of nevers could give nothing but hopes the venetians would not stir nor even declare themselves in his favour unless a french army were first brought into italy and while secretly aiding the duke as they best could they contented themselves with putting off the court of madrid and the governor of milan with protests propositions and peaceable or threatening admonitions according to circumstances urban the eighth recommended nevers to his friends interceded in his favour with his enemies and designed projects of accommodation but would not hear a word of sending men into the field by this means the two confederates for offensive measures were enabled the more securely to begin their concerted operations carlo emmanuel invaded montferrat from his side don gonzalo willingly laid siege to casale but did not find in the undertaking all the satisfaction he had promised himself for it must not be imagined that war is a rose without a thorn the court did not provide him with nearly all the means he demanded his ally on the contrary assisted him too much that is to say after having taken his own portion he went on to take that which was assigned to the king of spain don gonzalo was enraged beyond expression but fearing that if he made any noise about it this duke as active in intrigues and fickle in treaty as bold and valiant in arms would revolt to the french he was obliged to shut his eyes to it gnaw the bit put on a satisfied air the siege besides went on badly being protracted to a great length and sometimes thrown back owing to the steady cautious and resolute behaviour of the besieged the lack of sufficient numbers on the part of the besiegers and according to the report of some historian the many false steps taken by don gonzalo on which point we leave truth to choose her own side being inclined even as it were really so to consider it a very happy circumstance if it were the cause that in this enterprise there were some fewer than usual slain beheaded or wounded and cataris paribus rather fewer tiles injured in casala in the midst of these perplexities the news of the sedition at milan arrived to the scene of which he repaired in person here in the report which was given him mention was also made of the rebellious and clamorous flight of renzo and of the real or supposed doings which had been the occasion of his arrest and they could also inform him that this person had taken refuge in the territory of bergamo this circumstance arrested don gonzalo's attention he had been informed from another quarter that great interest had been felt at venice in the insurrection at milan that they had supposed he would be obliged on this account to abandon the siege of casala and that they imagined he was reduced to great despondency and perplexity about it the more so as shortly after this event the tidings had arrived so much desired by these noblemen and dreaded by himself of the surrender of la rochelle feeling considerably annoyed both as a man and a politician that they should entertain such an opinion of his proceedings he sought every opportunity of undeceiving them and persuading them by induction that he had lost none of his former boldness for to say explicitly i have no fear is just to say nothing one good plan is to show displeasure to complain and to expostulate accordingly the venetian ambassador having waited upon him to pay his respects and at the same time to read in his countenance and behaviour how he felt within don gonzalo 
after having spoken lightly of the tumult like a man who had already provided a remedy for everything made those complaints about renzo which the reader already knows as he is also acquainted with what resulted from them in consequence from that time he took no further interest in an affair of so little importance which as far as he was concerned was terminated and when a long time afterwards the reply came to him at the camp of casale whither he had returned and where he had very difficult things to occupy his mind he raised and threw back his head like a silkworm searching for a leaf reflected for a moment to recall more clearly to his memory a fact of which he had only retained a shadowy idea remembered the circumstances had a vague momentary recollection of the person passed on to something else and thought no more about it but renzo who from the little which he had darkly comprehended was far from supposing so benevolent an indifference had for a time no other thought or rather to speak more correctly no other care than to keep himself concealed it may be imagined whether he did not ardently long to send news of himself to the women and receive some from them in exchange but there were two great difficulties in the way one was that he also would have been forced to trust to an amanuensis for the poor fellow knew not how to write nor even read in the broad sense of the word and if when asked the question as the reader may perhaps remember by the doctor arzenka garbugli he replied in the affirmative it was not certainly a boast a mere bravado as they say it was the truth that he could manage to read print when he could take his time over it writing however was a different thing he would be obliged then to make a third party the depository of his affairs and of a secret so jealously guarded and it was not easy in those times to find a man who could use his pen and in whom confidence could be placed particularly in a country where he had no old acquaintances the other difficulty was to find a bearer a man who was going just to the place he wanted who would take charge of the letter and really recollect to deliver it all these too qualifications rather difficult to be met within one individual at length by dint of searching and sounding he found somebody to write for him but ignorant where the women were or whether they were still at monza he judged it better to enclose the letter directed to agnesi under cover to father cristoforo with a line or two also for him the writer undertook the charge moreover of forwarding the packet and delivered it to one who would pass not far from pescorenico this person left it with many strict charges at an inn on the road at the nearest point to the monastery and as it was directed to a convent it reached this destination but what became of it afterwards was never known renzo receiving no reply sent off a second letter nearly like the first which he enclosed in another to an acquaintance or distant relation of his at lecco he sought for another bearer and found one this time the letter reached the person to whom it was addressed agnesi posted off to magianico had it read and interpreted to her by her cousin alessio concerted with him a reply which he put down in writing for her and found means of sending it to antonio rivolta in his present place of abode all this however not quite so expeditiously as we have recounted it renzo received the reply and in time sent an answer to it in short a correspondence was set on foot between the two parties neither frequent nor regular but still kept up by starts and at intervals to form some idea however of this correspondence 
it is necessary to know a little how such things went on in those days indeed how they go on now for in this particular i believe there is little or no variation the peasant who knows not how to write and finds himself reduced to the necessity of communicating his ideas to the absent has recourse to one who understands the art taking him as far as he can from among those of his own rank for with others he is either shamefaced or afraid to trust them he informs them with more or less order and perspicuity of past events and in the same manner describes to him the thoughts he is to express the man of letters understands part misunderstands part gives a little advice proposes some variation says leave it to me then he takes the pen transfers the idea he has received as best he can from speaking to writing corrects it in his own way improves it puts in flourishes abbreviates or even omits according as he deems most suitable for his subject for so it is and there is no help for it he who knows more than his neighbours will not be a passive instrument in their hands and when he interferes in other people's affairs he will force them to do things his own way in addition to all this it is not always quite a matter of course that the above-named literate himself expresses all that he intended nay sometimes it happens just the reverse as indeed it does even to us who write for the press when the letter thus completed reaches the hands of the correspondent who is equally unpractised in his a b c he takes it to another learned genius of that tribe who reads and expounds it to him questions arise on the matter of understanding it because the person interested presuming upon his acquaintance with the antecedent circumstances asserts that certain words mean such and such a thing the reader resting upon his greater experience in the art of composition affirms that they mean another at last the one who does not know is obliged to put himself into the hands of the one who does and trusts him the task of writing a reply which executed like the former example is liable to a similar style of interpretation if in addition the subject of the correspondence be a rather delicate topic if secret matters be treated of in it which it is desirable should not be understood by a third party in case the letter should go astray if with this view there be a positive intention of not expressing things quite clearly then however short a time the correspondence is kept up the parties invariably finish by understanding each other as well as the two schoolmen who had disputed for four hours upon abstract mutations not to take our simile from living beings lest we expose ourselves to have our ears boxed now the case of our two correspondents was exactly what we have described the first letter written in renzo's name contained many subjects primarily besides an account of the flight by far more concise but at the same time more confused than that which we have given was a relation of his actual circumstances from which both agnese and her interpreter were far from deriving any lucid or tolerably correct idea then he spoke of secret intelligence change of name his being in safety but still requiring concealment things in themselves not very familiar to their understandings and related in the letter rather enigmatically then followed warm and impassioned inquiries about lucia's situation with dark and mournful hints of the rumours which had reached even his ears there were finally uncertain and distant hopes and plans in reference to the future 
and for the present promises and entreaties to keep their plighted faith, not to lose patience or courage, and to wait for better days. Some time passed away, and Agnesi found a trusty messenger to convey an answer to Renzo, with the fifty scudi assigned to him by Lucia. At the sight of so much gold, he knew not what to think, and, with a mind agitated by wonder and suspense, which left no room for gratification, he set off in search of his amanuensis, to make him interpret the letter and find the key to so strange a mystery. Agnesi's scribe, after lamenting in the letter the want of perpiscuity in Renzo's epistle, went on to describe in a way at least quite as much to be lamented the tremendous history of that person, so he expressed himself, and here he accounted for the fifty scudi, then he went on to speak of the vow, employing much circumlocution in the expression of it, but adding, in more direct and explicit terms, the advice to set his heart at rest and think no more about it. Renzo very nearly quarrelled with the reader. He trembled, shuddered, became enraged with what he had understood, and with what he could not understand. Three or four times did he make him read over the melancholy writing, now comprehending better, now finding what had first appeared clear, more and more incomprehensible. And in this fervour of passion, he insisted upon his amanuensis immediately taking pen in hand and writing a reply. After the strongest expressions imaginable of pity and horror at Lucia's circumstances, write, he pursued, as he dictated to his secretary, that I won't set my heart at rest, and that I never will, and that this is not advice to be giving to a lad like me, and that I won't touch the money, that I'll put it by, and keep it for the young girl's dowry, that she already belongs to me, and that I know nothing about a vow, and that I have often heard say that the Madonna interests herself to help the afflicted, and obtains favours for them, but that she encourages them to despise and break their word I never heard, and that this vow can't hold good, and that with this money we have enough to keep house here, and that I am somewhat in difficulties now, it's only a storm which will quickly pass over, and other similar things. Agnese received this letter also, and replied to it and the correspondence continued in the manner we have described. End of chapter 27, part 1 Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England Chapter 27, part 2 of The Betrothed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Betrothed, or I Promesi Sposi, by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter 27, Part 2 Lucia felt greatly relieved when her mother had contrived, by some means or other, to let her know that Renzo was alive, safe, and acquainted with her vow and desired nothing more than that he should forget her, or, to express it more exactly, that he should try to forget her. She, on her part, made a similar resolution a hundred times a day with respect to him, and employed to every means she could think of to put it into effect. She continued to work indefatigably with her needle, trying to apply her whole mind to it, and when Renzo's image presented itself to her view, would begin to repeat or chant some prayers to herself. But that image, just as if it were actually by pure malice, did not generally come so openly. It introduced itself stealthily behind others, so that the mind might not be aware of having harboured it, till after it had been there for some time. Lucia's thoughts were often with her mother, 
how should it have been otherwise and the ideal renzo would gently creep in as a third party as the real person has so often done so with everybody in every place in every remembrance of the past he never failed to introduce himself and if the poor girl allowed herself sometimes to penetrate in fancy into the obscurities of the future there too he would appear as if it were only to say i ten to one shall not be there however if not to think of him at all were a hopeless undertaking yet lucia succeeded up to a certain point in thinking less about him and less intensively than her heart would have wished she would have even succeeded better had she been alone in desiring to do so but there was donna Presede, who bent on her part upon banishing the youth from her thoughts had found no better expedient than constantly talking about him well she would say have you given up thinking about him i am thinking of nobody replied lucia donna Presede, however not to be appeased by so evasive an answer replied that there must be deeds not words and enlarged upon the usual practices of young girls who she said when they have set their hearts upon a dissolute fellow and it is just to such they have a leaning won't consent to be separated from them an honest and rational contract to a worthy man a well-tried character which by some accident happens to be frustrated they are quickly resigned but let it be a villain and it is an incurable wound and then she commenced a panegyric upon the poor absentee the rascal who had come to milan to plunder the town and massacre the inhabitants and tried to make lucia confess all the knavish tricks he had played in his own country lucia with a voice tremulous with shame sorrow and such indignation as could find place in her gentle breast and humble condition affirmed and testified that the poor fellow had done nothing in his country to give occasion for anything but good to be said of him she wished she said that some one were present from his neighbourhood that the lady might hear his testimony even on his adventures at milan the particulars of which she could not learn she defended him merely from the knowledge that she had of him and his behaviour from his very childhood she defended him or intended to defend him from the simple duty of charity from her love of truth and to use just the expression by which she described her feelings to herself as her neighbour but donna Prasede drew fresh arguments from these apologies to convince lucia that she had quite lost her heart to this man and to say the truth in these moments it is difficult to say how the matter stood the disgraceful picture the old lady drew of the poor youth revived from opposition more vividly and distinctly than ever in the mind of the young girl the idea which long habit had established there the recollection she had stifled by force returned in crowds upon her aversion and contempt recalled all her old motives of esteem and sympathy and blind and violent hatred only excited stronger feelings of pity with these feelings who can say how much there might or might not be of another affection which follows upon them and introduces itself so easily into the mind let it be imagined what it would do in one whence it was attempted to eject it by force however it may be the conversation on lucia's side was never carried to any great length for words were very soon resolved into tears had donna Prasede been induced to treat her in this way for some inveterate hatred towards her these tears might perhaps have vanquished and silenced her but as she spoke with the intention of doing good she went on without allowing herself to be moved by them as groans and imploring cries may arrest the weapons of an enemy but not the instrument of the surgeon having however discharged her duty for that time she would turn from reproaches and denunciation to exhortation and advice sweetened also by a little praise thus designing to temper the bitter with the sweet the better to obtain her purpose by working upon the heart under every state of feeling these quarrels however which had always nearly the same beginning middle and end left no resentment properly speaking in the good lucia's heart against the harsh sermonizer 
who after all treated her in general very kindly and even in this instance evinced a good intention yet they left her in such agitation with such a tumult of thoughts and affections that it required no little time and much effort to regain her former degree of calmness it was well for her that she was not the only one to whom donna Presede had to do good for by this means these disputes could not occur so frequently besides the rest of the family all of whom were persons of more or less needing amendment and guidance beside all the other occasions which offered themselves to her or she contrived to find of extending the same kind of office of her own free will to many to whom she was under no obligations she had also five daughters none of whom were at home but who gave her more to think about than if they had been three of these were nuns two were married hence donna Presede naturally found herself with three monasteries and two houses to superintend a vast and complicated undertaking and the more arduous because two husbands backed by fathers mothers and brothers three abbesses supported by other dignitaries and many nuns would not accept her superintendence it was a complete warfare alias five warfares concealed and even courteous up to a certain point but ever active ever vigilant there was in every one of these places a continued watchfulness to avoid her solicitude to close the door against her counsels to elude her inquiries and to keep her in the dark as far as possible on every undertaking we do not mention the resistance of the difficulties she encountered in the management of other still more extraneous affairs it is well known that one must generally do good to men by force the place where her zeal could best exercise itself and have full play was in her own house here everybody was subject in everything and for everything to her authority saving don ferrante with whom things went on in a matter entirely peculiar a man of studious turn he neither loved to command nor obey in all household matters his wife was the mistress with his free consent but he would not submit to be her slave and if when requested he occasionally lent her the assistance of his pen it was because it suited his taste and after all he knew how to say no when he was not convinced of what she wished him to write use your own sense he would say in such cases do it yourself since it seems so clear to you donna Presede, after vainly endeavouring for some time to induce him to recant and to do what she wanted would be obliged to content herself with murmuring frequently against him with calling him one who hated trouble a man who would have his own way and a scholar a title which though pronounced with contempt was generally mixed with a little complacency don ferrante passed many hours in his study where he had a considerable collection of books scarcely less than three hundred volumes all of them choice works and the most highly esteemed on their numerous several subjects in each of which he was more or less versed in astrology he was deservedly considered as more than a dilettante for he not only possessed the generic notions and common vocabulary of influences aspects and conjunctions but he knew how to talk very aptly and as it were ex cathedra of the twelve houses of the heavens of the great circles of lucid and obscure degrees of exaltation and dejection of transitions and revolutions in short of the most assured and most recondite principles of science and it was for perhaps twenty years that he maintained in long and frequent disputes the system of cardano against another learned man who was staunchly attached to that of alcabizio from mere obstinacy as don ferrante said who readily acknowledging the superiority of the ancients could not however endure that unwillingness to yield to the moderns even when they evidently had reason on their side he was also more than indifferently acquainted with the history of the science he could on an occasion quote the most celebrated predictions which had been verified and reason clearly and learnedly on other celebrated predictions which had failed showing that the fault was not in the science but in those who knew not how to apply it he had learnt as much of ancient philosophy as might have sufficed him but still went on acquiring more from the study of diogenes laertius 
as however these systems how beautiful soever they may be cannot all be held at once and as to be a philosopher it is necessary to choose an author so don ferrante had chosen aristotle who he used to say was neither ancient nor modern he was the philosopher and nothing more he possessed also various works of the wisest and most ingenious disciples of that school among the moderns those of its impugners he would never read not to throw away time as he said nor buy not to throw away money surely by way of exception did he find room in his library for those celebrated two-and-twenty volumes de subtilitate and for some other anti-peripatetic work of cardano's in consideration of his value in astrology he said that he who could write the treatise don restitutione temporum et motum colestium and the book duodecim geniturarum deserved to be listened to even when he erred that the great defect of this man was that he had too much talent and that no one could conceive what he might have arrived at even in philosophy had he kept himself in the right way in short although in the judgment of the learned don ferrante passed for a consummate peripatetic yet he did not deem that he knew enough about it himself and more than once he was obliged to confess with great modesty that essence universals the soul of the world and the nature of things were not so very clear as might be imagined he had made a recreation rather than a study of natural philosophy the very works of aristotle on this subject he had rather read than studied and yet with this slight perusal with the notices incidentally gathered from treatises on general philosophy with a few cursory glances at the magia naturale of porta at the three histories lapidum animalium plantarum of cardano at the treatise on herbs plants and animals by albert magnus and a few other works of less note he could entertain a party of learned men for a while with dissertations on the most wonderful virtues and most remarkable curiosities of many medicinal herbs he could minutely describe the forms and habits of sirens and the solitary phoenix and explain how the salamander exists in the fire without burning how the remora that diminutive fish has strength and ability completely to arrest a ship of any size in the high seas how drops of dew become pearls in the shell how the chameleon feeds on air how ice being generally hardened is formed into crystal in the course of time with many others of the most wonderful secrets of nature into those of magic and witchcraft he had penetrated still more deeply as it was a science says our anonymous author much more necessary and more in vogue in those days in which the facts were of far higher importance and it was more within reach to verify them it is unnecessary to say that he had no other object in view in such a study than to inform himself and to become acquainted with the very worst arts of the sorcerers in order that he might guard against them and defend himself and by the guidance principally of the great martino del rio a leader of the science he was capable of discoursing ex professo upon the fascination of love the fascination of sleep the fascination of hatred and the infinite varieties of these three principal genuses of enchantment which are only too often again says our anonymous author beheld in practice at the present day attended by such lamentable effects not less vast and profound was his knowledge of history particularly universal history in which his authors were tarcagnotta dolce bugatti campagna and guazzo in short all the most highly esteemed but what is history said don ferrante frequently without politics a guide who walks on and on with no one following to learn the road and who consequently throws away his steps as politics without history is one who walks without a guide there was therefore a place assigned to statistics on his shelf where among many humbler rank and less renown appeared in all their glory bedino calvacante sansovino paruta and boccalini 
there were two books however which don ferrante infinitely preferred above all others on this subject two which up to a certain time he used to call the first without ever being able to decide which of the two this rank should exclusively belong one was the principia and discorsi of the celebrated florentine secretary a great rascal certainly said don ferrante but profound the other the ragion di stato of the no less celebrated giovanni botero an honest man certainly said he again but shrewd shortly after however just at the period which our story embraces a work came to light which terminated the question of preeminence by surpassing the work of even those two matadors said don ferrante a book in which was enclosed and condensed every trick of the system that might be known and every virtue that it might be practised a book of small dimensions but all of gold in one word the statista regnante of don valeriano castiglione that most celebrated man of whom it might be said that the greatest scholars rivalled each other in sounding his praises and the greatest personages in trying to rob him of them that man whom pope urban the eighth honoured as is well known with magnificent encomiums whom the cardinal borghese and the viceroy of naples don pietro di toledo entreated to relate one the doings of pope paul v the other the wars of his catholic majesty in italy and both in vain that man whom louis the thirteenth king of france at the suggestion of cardinal richelieu nominated his historiographer on whom don carlo emmanuel of savoy conferred the same office in praise of whom not to mention other lofty testimonials the duchess christina daughter of the most christian king henry the fourth could in a diploma among many other titles enumerate the certainty of the reputation he is obtaining in italy of being the first writer of our times but if in all the above-mentioned sciences don ferrante might be considered a learned man there was one in which he merited and enjoyed the title of professor the science of chivalry not only did he argue on it in a really masterly manner but frequently requested to interfere in affairs of honour always gave some decision he had in his library and one may say indeed in his head the works of the most renowned writers on this subject paris del pozo fausto de loggiano urea musio rome albergato the first and second forno of torcato tasso of whose other works jerusalem delivered as well as jerusalem taken he had ever in readiness and could quote from memory on occasion all the passages which might serve as a text on the subject of chivalry the author however of all authors in his estimation was our celebrated francesco birago with whom he had more than once associated in giving judgment on cases of honour and who on his side spoke of don ferrante in terms of particular esteem and from the time that the discorsi cavalleresci of this renowned writer made their appearance he predicted without hesitation that this work would destroy the authority of olivano and would remain together with its other noble sisters as a code of primary authority among posterity and every one may see says our anonymous author how this prediction has been verified from this he passes on to the study of belles lettres but we begin to doubt whether the reader has really any great wish to go forward with us in this review and even to fear that we may already have won the title of servile copyist for ourself and that of a bore to be shared with the anonymous author for having followed him out so simply even thus far into a subject foreign to the principal narrative and in which probably he was only so diffuse for the purpose of parading erudition and showing that he was not behind his age however leaving written what is written that we may not lose our labour we will omit the rest to resume the thread of our story the more willingly as we have a long period to traverse without meeting with any of our characters and a longer still before finding those in whose success the reader will be most interested 
if anything in the whole story has interested him at all until the autumn of the following year sixteen twenty nine they all remained some willingly some by force almost in the state in which we left them nothing happening to any one and no one doing anything worthy of being recorded the autumn at length approached in which agnese and lucia had counted upon meeting again but a great public event frustrated that expectation and this certainly was one of its most trifling effects other great events followed which however made no material change in the destinies of our characters at length new circumstances more general more influential and more extensive reached even to them even to the lowest of them according to the world's scale it was like a vast sweeping and irresistible hurricane which uprooting trees tearing off roots levelling battlements and scattering their fragments in every direction stirs up the straws hidden in the grass pries into every corner for the light and withered leaves which a gentler breeze would only have lodged there more securely and bears them off in its headlong course of fury now that the private events which yet remain for us to relate may be rendered intelligible it will be absolutely necessary for us even here to promise some kind of account of these public ones and thus make a still further digression end of chapter 27 part 2 recording by alan mapstone in oxford england chapter 28 part 1 of the betrothed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter 28, Part 1. After the sedition of St. Martin's and the following day, it seemed that abundance had returned to Milan as by enchantment the bread shops were plentifully supplied the price as low as in the most prolific years and flour in proportion they who during those two days had employed themselves in shouting or doing something worse had now excepting a few who had been seized reason to congratulate themselves and let it not be imagined that they spared these congratulations after the first fear of being captured had subsided in the squares at the corners of the street and in the taverns there was undisguised rejoicing a general murmur of applauses and half-uttered boasts of having found a way to reduce bread to a moderate price in the midst however of this vaunting and festivity there was and how could it be otherwise a secret feeling of disquietude and presentiment that the thing could not last long they besieged the bakers and meal sellers as they had before done in the former artificial and transient abundance procured by the first tariff of antonio ferrer he who had a little money in advance invested it in bread and flour which were stored up in chests small barrels and iron vessels by thus emulating each other in enjoying present advantage they rendered i do not say its long duration impossible for such as it was of itself already but even its continuance from moment to moment ever more difficult and lo on the fifteenth of november antonio ferrer de orden de su excellencia issued a proclamation in which all who had any corn or flour in their houses were forbidden to buy either one or the other and every one else to purchase more than would be required for two days under pain of pecuniary and corporal punishments at the will of his excellency it contained also intimations to the elders a kind of public officer and insinuations to all other persons to inform against offenders 
orders to magistrates to make strict search in any houses which might be reported to them together with fresh commands to the bakers to keep their shops well furnished with bread under pain in case of failure of five years in the galleys or even greater penalties at the will of his excellency he who can imagine such a proclamation executed must have a very clever imagination and certainly had all those issued at that time taken effect the duchy of milan would have had at least as many people on the seas as great britain itself may have at present at any rate as they ordered the bakers to make so much bread it was also necessary to give some orders that the materials for making it should not fail they had contrived as in times of scarcity the endeavor is always renewed to reduce into bread different elementary materials usually consumed under another form they had contrived i say to introduce rice into a composition called mixed bread on the twenty third of november an edict was published to limit to the disposal of the superintendent and the twelve members who constituted the board of provision one half of the dressed rice rizioni it was then and is still called there which every one possessed with the threat to any one who should dispose of it without permission of these noblemen of the loss of the article and a fine of three crowns a bushel the honesty of this proceeding every one can appreciate but it was necessary to pay for this rice and at a price very disproportioned to that of bread the burden of supplying the enormous inequality had been imposed upon the city but the council of the decirioni who had undertaken to discharge the debt in behalf of the city deliberated the same day the twenty third of november about remonstrating with the governor on the impossibility of any longer maintaining such an engagement and the governor in a decree of the seventh of december fixed the price of the above-named rice at twelve livres per bushel to those who should demand a higher price as well as to those who should refuse to sell he threatened the loss of the article and a fine of equal value and greater pecuniary and even corporal punishment including the galleys at the will of his excellency according to the nature of the case and the rank of the offender the price of undressed rice had been already limited before the insurrection as the tariff or to use the most famous term of modern annals the maximum of wheat and other of the commonest grains had probably been established in different decrees which we have not happened to meet with bread and flour being thus reduced to a moderate price at milan it followed of consequence that people flocked thither in crowds to obtain a supply to obviate this inconvenience as he said don gonzalo in another edict of the fifteenth of december prohibited carrying bread out of the city beyond the value of twenty pence under penalty of the loss of the bread itself and twenty-five crowns or in the case of inability of two stripes in public and greater punishment still as usual at the will of his excellency on the twenty-second of the same month and why so late it is difficult to say a similar order was issued with regard to flour and grain the multitude had tried to procure abundance by pillage and incendiarism the legal arm would have maintained it with the galleys and the scourge the means were convenient enough in themselves but what they had to do with the end the reader knows how they actually answered their purpose he will see directly it is easy too to see and not useless to observe the necessary connection between these stranger measures each was an inevitable consequence of the antecedent one and all of the first which fixed a price upon bread so different to that which would have resulted from the real state of things 
such a provision ever has and ever must have appeared to the multitude as consistent with justice as simple and easy of execution hence it is quite natural that in the deprivations and grievances of a famine they should desire it implore it and if they can enforce it in proportion then as the consequences began to be felt it is necessary that they whose duty it is should provide a remedy for each by a regulation prohibiting men to do what they were impelled to do by the preceding one we may be permitted to remark here in passing a singular coincidence in a country and at a period by no means remote a period the most clamorous and most renowned of modern history in similar circumstances similar provisions obtained the same we may almost say in substance with the sole difference of proportions and in nearly the same succession they obtained in spite of the march of intellect and the knowledge which had spread over europe and in that country perhaps more than any other and this principally because the great mass of the people whom this knowledge had not yet reached could in the long run make their judgment prevail and as it were there said compel the hands of those who made the laws but to return to our subject on a review of the circumstances there were two principal fruits of the insurrection destruction and actual loss of provision in the insurrection itself and a consumption while the tariff lasted immense immeasurable and so to say jovial which rapidly diminished the small quantity of grain that was to have sufficed till the next harvest to these general effects may be added the punishment of four of the populace who were hung as ringleaders of the tumult two before the bakehouse of the crutches and two at the end of the street where the house of the superintendent of provisions was situated as to the rest the historical accounts of those times have been written so much at random that no information is to be found as to how and when this arbitrary tariff ceased if in the failure of positive notices we may be allowed to form a conjecture we are inclined to believe that it was withdrawn shortly before or soon after the twenty fourth of december which was the day of the execution as to the proclamations after the last we have quoted of the twenty second of the same month we find no more on the subject of provisions whether it be that they have perished or have escaped our researches or finally that the government discouraged if not instructed by the inefficiencies of these remedies and quite overwhelmed with different matters abandoned them to their own course we find indeed in the records of more than one historian inclined as they were rather to describe great events than to note the cause and progress of them a picture of the country and chiefly of the city in the already advanced winter and following spring when the cause of the evil the disproportion that is between food and demand for it which far from being removed was even increased by the remedies which temporarily suspended its effects when the true cause i say of the scarcity or to speak more correctly the scarcity itself was operating without a check and exerting its full force it was not even checked by the introduction of a sufficient supply of corn from without to which remedy were opposed the insufficiency of public and private means the poverty of the surrounding countries the prevailing famine the tediousness and the restriction of commerce and the laws themselves tending to the production and violent maintenance of moderate prices we will give a sketch of the mournful picture at every step the shops closed manufactories for the most part deserted the streets presenting an indescribable spectacle an incessant train of miseries a perpetual abode of sorrows 
professed beggars of long standing now become this smallest number mingled and lost in a new swarm and sometimes reduced to contend for alms with those from whom in former days they had been accustomed to receive them apprentices and clerks dismissed by shopkeepers and merchants who when their daily profits diminished or entirely failed were living sparingly on their savings or on their capital shopkeepers and merchants themselves to whom the cessation of business had brought failure and ruin workmen in every trade and manufacture the commonest as well as the most refined the most necessary as well as those more subservient to luxury wandering from door to door and from street to street leaning against the corners stretched upon the pavement along the houses and churches begging piteously or hesitating between want and a still unsubdued shame emaciated weak and trembling from long fasting and the cold that pierced through their tattered and scanty garments which still however in many instances retain traces of having been once in a better condition as their present idleness and despondency ill disguised indications of former habits of industry and courage mingled in the deplorable throng and forming no small part of it were servants dismissed by their masters who either had sunk from mediocrity into poverty or otherwise from wealthy and noble citizens had become unable in such a year to maintain their accustomed pomp of retinue and for each one so to say of these different needy objects was a number of others accustomed in part to live by their gains children women and aged relatives grouped around their old supporters or dispersed in search of relief elsewhere there were also easily distinguishable by their tangled locks by the relics of their showy dress or even by something in their carriage and gestures and by that expression which habits impress upon the countenance the more marked and distinct as the habits are strange and unusual many of that vile race of bravos who having lost in the common calamity their wickedly acquired substance now went about imploring it for charity subdued by hunger contending with others only in entreaties and reduced in person they dragged themselves along through the streets which they had so often traversed with a lofty brow and a suspicious and ferocious look dressed in sumptuous and fantastic liveries furnished with rich arms plumed decked out and perfumed and humbly extended the hand which had so often been insolently raised to threaten or treacherously to wound but the most frequent the most squalid the most hideous spectacle was that of the country people alone in couples or even in entire families husbands and wives with infants in their arms or tied up in a bundle upon their backs with children dragged along by the hand or with old people behind some there were who having had their houses invaded and pillaged by the soldiery had fled thither either as residents or passengers in a kind of desperation and among these were some who displayed stronger incentives to compassion and greater distinction in misery in the scars and bruises from the wounds they had received in the defence of their few remaining provisions while others gave way to blind and brutal licentiousness others again unreached by that particular scourge but driven from their homes by those two from which the remotest corner was not exempt sterility and prices more exorbitant than ever to meet what were called the necessities of war had come and were continually pouring into the city as to the ancient seat and ultimate asylum of plenty and pious munificence the newly arrived might be distinguished not only by a hesitating step and novel air but still more by a look of angry astonishment 
at finding such an accumulation such an excess such a rivalry of misery in a place where they had hoped to appear singular objects of compassion and to attract to themselves all assistance and notice the others who for more or less time had haunted the streets of the city prolonging life by the scanty food obtained as it were by chance in such a disparity between supply and demand or expressed in their looks and carriage still deeper and more anxious consternation various in dress or rather rags as well as appearance in the midst of the common prostration there were the pale faces of the marshy districts the bronze countenances of the open and hilly country and the ruddy complexion of the mountaineer all alike wasted and emaciated with sunken eyes a stare between sternness and idiocy matted locks and long and ghastly beards bodies once plump and inured to fatigue now exhausted by want shriveled skin on their parched arms legs and bony breasts which appeared through their disordered and tattered garments while different from but not less melancholy than this spectacle of wasted vigor was that of a more quickly subdued nature of languor and a more self-abandoning debility in the weaker sex and age here and there in the streets and crossways along the walls and under the eaves of the houses were layers of trampled straw and stubble mixed with dirty rags yet such revolting filth was the gift and the provision of charity there were places of repose prepared for some of those miserable wretches where they might lay their heads at night occasionally even during the day some one might be seen lying there whom faintness and abstinence had robbed of breath and the power of supporting the weight of his body sometimes these wretched couches bore a corpse sometimes a poor exhausted creature would suddenly sink to the ground and remain a lifeless body upon the pavement bending over some of these prostrate sufferers a neighbor or passer-by might frequently be seen attracted by a sudden impulse of compassion in some places assistance was tendered organized with more distant foresight and proceeding from a hand rich in the means and experienced in the exercise of doing good on a large scale the hand of the good federigo he had made a choice of six priests whose ready and persevering charity was united with and ministered to by a robust constitution these he divided into pairs and assigned to each a third part of the city to perambulate followed by porters laden with various kinds of food together with other more effective and more speedy restoratives and clothing every morning these three pairs dispersed themselves through the streets in different directions approached those whom they found stretched upon the ground and administered to each the assistance he was capable of receiving some in the agonies of death and no longer able to partake of nourishment received at their hands the last succors and the consolations of religion to those whom food might still benefit they dispensed soup eggs bread or wine while to others exhausted by longer abstinence they offered jellies and stronger wines reviving them first if need were with cordials and powerful acids at the same time they distributed garments to those who were most indecorously and miserably clothed nor did their assistance end here it was the good bishop's wish that at least where it could be extended efficacious and more permanent relief should be administered those poor creatures who felt sufficiently strengthened by the first remedies to stand up and walk were also provided by the same kindly ministry with a little money that returning need and the failure of further succor might not bring them again immediately into their first condition for the rest they sought shelter and maintenance in some of the neighboring houses 
those among the inhabitants who were well off in the world afforded hospitality out of charity and on the recommendation of the cardinal and where there was the will without the means the priests requested that the poor creature might be received as a boarder agreed upon the terms and immediately defrayed a part of the expense they then gave notice of those who were thus lodged to the parish priests that they might go to see them and they themselves would also return to visit them it is unnecessary to say that federigo did not confine his care to this extremity of suffering nor wait till the evil had reached its height before exerting himself his ardent and versatile charity must feel all be employed in all hasten where it could not anticipate and take so to say as many forms as there were varieties of need in fact by bringing together all his means saving with still more rigorous economy and applying sums destined to other purposes of charity now alas rendered of secondary importance he had tried every method of making money to be expended entirely in alleviating poverty he made large purchases of corn which he dispatched to the most indigent parts of his diocese and as the succours were far from equalling the necessity he also sent plentiful supplies of salt with which says ripamonte relating the circumstances the herbs of the field and the bark from the trees might be converted into human sustenance he also distributed corn and money to the clergy of the city he himself visited it by districts dispensing alms he relieved in secret many destitute families in the archiepiscopal palace large quantities of rice were daily cooked and according to the account of the contemporary writer the physician alessandro tadino in his raguaglio which we shall frequently have occasion to quote in the sequel two thousand porringers of this food were here distributed every morning but these fruits of charity which we may certainly specify as wonderful when we consider that they proceeded from one individual and from his sole resources for federigo habitually refused to be made a dispenser of the liberality of others these together with the bounty of other private persons if not so copious at least more numerous and the subsidies granted by the council of the decurioni to meet this emergency the dispensation of which was committed to the board of provision where after all in comparison of the demand scarce and inadequate while some few mountaineers and inhabitants of the valleys who were ready to die of hunger had their lives prolonged by the cardinal's assistance others arrived at the extremest verge of starvation the former having consumed their measured supplies returned to the same state in other parts not forgotten but considered as less straitened by a charity which was compelled to make distinctions the suffering became fatal in every direction they perished from every direction they flocked to the city here two thousand we will say of famishing creatures the strongest and the most skilful in surmounting competition and making way for themselves obtained perhaps a bowl of soup so as not to die that day but many more thousands remained behind envying those shall we say more fortunate ones when among them who remained behind were often their wives children or parents and while in two or three parts of the city some of the most destitute and reduced were raised from the ground revived recovered and provided for for some time in a hundred other quarters many more sank languished or even expired without assistance without alleviation throughout the day a confused humming of lamentable entreaties was to be heard in the streets at night a murmur of groans broken now and then by howls suddenly bursting upon the ear by loud and long accents of complaint or by deep tones of invocation 
terminating in wild shrieks it is worthy of remark that in such an extremity of want in such a variety of complaints not one attempt was ever made not one rumor ever raised to bring about an insurrection at least we find not the least mention of such a thing yet among those who lived and died in this way there was a great number of men brought up to anything rather than patient endurance there were indeed in hundreds those very same individuals who on st martin's day had made themselves so sensibly felt nor must it be imagined that the example of those four unhappy men who bore in their own persons the penalty of all was what now kept them in awe what force could not the sight but the remembrance of punishments have on the minds of a dispersed and reunited multitude who saw themselves condemned as it were to a prolonged punishment which they were already suffering but so constituted are we mortals in general that we rebel indignantly and violently against medium evils and bow in silence under extreme ones we bear not with resignation but stupefaction the weight of what at first we had called insupportable the void daily created by mortality in this deplorable multitude was every day more than replenished there was an incessant concourse first from the neighboring towns then from all the country then from the cities of the state to the very borders even of others and in the meantime old inhabitants were every day leaving milan some to withdraw from the sight of so much suffering others being driven from the field so to say by new competitors for support in a last desperate attempt to find sustenance elsewhere anywhere anywhere at least where the crowds and the rivalry and begging were not so dense and importunate these obsolete bound travellers met each other on their different routes all spectacles of horror and disastrous omens of the fate that awaited them at the end of their respective journeys they prosecuted however the way they had once undertaken if no longer with the hope of changing their condition at least not to return to a scene which had become odious to them and to avoid the sight of a place where they had been reduced to despair some even whose last vital powers were destroyed by abstinence sank down by the way and were left where they expired still more fatal tokens to their brethren in condition an object of horror perhaps of reproach to other passengers i saw writes ripamonte lying in the road surrounding the wall the corpse of a woman half-eaten grass was hanging out of her mouth and her contaminated lips still made almost a convulsive effort she had a bundle at her back and secured by bands to her bosom hung an infant which with bitter cries was calling for the breast some compassionate persons had come up who raising the miserable little creature from the ground brought it some sustenance thus fulfilling in a measure the first maternal office end of chapter twenty eight part one chapter twenty eight part two of the betrothed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the betrothed by alessandro manzoni chapter twenty eight part two the contrast of gay clothing and rags of superfluidity and misery the ordinary spectacle of ordinary times had in these peculiar ones entirely ceased rags and misery had invaded almost every rank and what now at all distinguished them was but an appearance of frugal mediocrity the nobility were seen walking in becoming and modest or even dirty and shabby 
clothing some because the common cause of misery had affected their fortunes to this degree or even given a finishing hand to fortunes already much dilapidated others either from fear of provoking public desperation by display or from a feeling of shame at thus insulting public calamity petty tyrants once hated and looked upon with awe and accustomed to wander about with an insolent train of bravos at their heels now walked almost unattended crestfallen and with a look which seemed to offer an entreat peace others who in prosperity also had been of more humane disposition and more civil bearing appeared nevertheless confused distracted and as it were overpowered by the continual view of a calamity which excluded not only the possibility of relief but we may also say the power of commiseration they who were able to afford any assistance were obliged to make a melancholy choice between hunger and hunger between extremity and extremity and no sooner was the compassionate hand seen to drop anything into the hand of a wretched beggar than a strife immediately rose between the other miserable wretches those who retained still a little strength pressed forward to solicit with more importunity the feeble aged people and children extended their emaciated hands mothers from behind raised and held out their weeping infants miserably clad in their tattered swaddling clothes and reclining languidly in their arms thus passed the winter and the spring for some time the board of health had been remonstrating with the board of provision on the danger of contagion which threatened the city from so much suffering accumulated in and spread throughout it and had proposed that all the vagabond mendicants should be collected together into the different hospitals while this plan was being debated upon and approved while the means methods and places were being devised to put it into effect corpses multiplied in the streets every day bringing additional numbers and in proportion to this followed all the other concomitants of loathsomeness misery and danger it was proposed by the board of provision as more practicable and expeditious to assemble all the mendicants healthy or diseased in one place the lazaretto and there to feed and maintain them at the public expense and this expedient was resolved upon in spite of the board of health which objected that in such an assemblage the evil would only be increased which they wished to obviate the lazaretto at milan perchance this story should fall into the hands of any one who does not know it either by sight or description is a quadrilateral and almost equilateral enclosure outside the city to the left of the gate called the porta orientale and separated from the bastions by the width of the fosse a road of circumvallation and a smaller moat running round the building itself the two larger sides extend to about the length of five hundred paces the other two perhaps fifteen less all on the outside divided into little rooms on the ground floor while running round three sides of the interior is a continuous vaulted portico supported by small light pillars the number of the rooms was once two hundred and eighty eight some larger than others but in our days a large aperture made in the middle and a smaller one in one corner of the side that flanks the highway have destroyed i know not how many at the period of our story there were only two entrances one in the center of the side which looked upon the city wall the other facing it in the opposite side in the midst of the clear and open space within rose a small octagonal temple which is still in existence 
the primary object of the whole edifice begun in the year fourteen eighty nine with a private legacy and afterwards continued with the public money and that of other testators and donors was as the name itself denotes to afford a place of refuge in cases of necessity to such as were ill of the plague which for some time before that epoch and for a long while after it usually appeared two four six or eight times a century now in this now in that european country sometimes taking a great part of it sometimes even traversing the whole so to say from one end to the other at the time of which we are speaking the lazaretto was merely used as a repository for goods suspected of conveying infection to prepare it on this occasion for its new destination the usual forms were rapidly gone through and having hastily made the necessary cleansings and prescribed experiments all the goods were immediately liberated straw was spread out in every room purchases were made of provisions of whatever kind and in whatever quantities they could be procured and by a public edict all beggars were invited to take shelter there many willingly accepted the offer all those who were lying ill in the streets or squares were carried thither and in a few days there were altogether more than three thousand who had taken refuge there but far more were they who remained behind whether it were that each one expected to see others go and hoped that there would thus be a smaller party left to share the relief which could be obtained in the city or from the natural repugnance to confinement or from the distrust felt by the poor of all that is proposed to them by those who possess wealth or power a distrust always proportioned to the common ignorance of those who feel it and those who inspire it to the number of the poor and the strictness of the regulations or from the actual knowledge of what the offered benefit was in reality or whether it were all these put together and whatever else it might be certain it is that the greater number paying no attention to the invitation continued to wander about begging through the city this being perceived it was considered advisable to pass from invitation to force bailiffs were sent round who drove all the mendicants to the lazaretto who even brought those bound who made any resistance for each one of whom a premium of ten soldi was assigned to them so true it is that even in the scarcest times public money may always be found to be employed foolishly and though as it has been imagined and even expressly intended by the provision a certain number of beggars made their escape from the city to go and live or die elsewhere if it were only in freedom yet the compulsion was such that in a short time the number of refugees what with guests and prisoners amounted to nearly ten thousand we must naturally suppose that the women and children were lodged in separate quarters though the records of the time make no mention of it regulations besides and provisions for the maintenance of good order would certainly not be wanting but the reader may imagine what kind of order could be established and maintained especially in those times and under such circumstances in so vast and diversified an assemblage where the unwilling inmates associated with the willing those to whom mendacity was a mournful necessity and subject of shame with those whose trade and custom it had long been many who had been trained to honest industry in the fields or warehouses with many others who had been brought up in the streets taverns or some other vile resorts to idleness roguery scoffing and violence how they fared all together for lodging and food might be sadly conjectured had we no positive information on the subject but we have it they slept crammed and heaped together by twenty and thirty in each little cell 
or lying under the porticos on pallets of putrid and fetid straw or even on the bare ground it was ordered indeed that the straw should be fresh and abundant and frequently changed but in fact it was scarce bad and never renewed there were orders likewise that the bread should be of good quality for what administration ever decreed that bad commodities should be manufactured and dispensed but how to obtain under the existing circumstances and in such confusion what in ordinary cases could not have been procured even for a less enormous demand it was affirmed as we find in the records of the times that the bread of the lazaretto was adulterated with heavy but unnutritional materials and it is too likely that this was not a mere unfounded complaint there was also a great deficiency of water that is to say of wholesome spring water the common beverage must have been from the moat that washed the walls of the enclosure shallow slow in places even muddy and become too what the use and the vicinity of such and so vast a multitude must have rendered it to all these causes of mortality the more effective as they acted upon diseased or enfeebled bodies was added the most unpropitious season obstinate rains followed by a drought still more obstinate and with it an anticipated and violent heat to these evils were added a keen sense of them the tedium and frenzy of captivity a longing to return to old habits grief for departed friends anxious remembrances of absent ones disgust and dread inspired by the misery of others and many other feelings of despair or madness either brought with them or first awakened there together with the apprehension and constant spectacle of death which was rendered frequently by so many causes and had become itself a new and powerful cause nor is it to be wondered at that mortality increased and prevailed in this confinement to such a degree as to assume the aspect and with many the name of pestilence whether it were that the union and augmentation of all these causes only served to increase the activity of a merely epidemic influenza or as it seems frequently to happen in less severe and prolonged famines that a real contagion had gained ground there which in bodies disposed and prepared for it by the scarcity and bad quality of food by unwholesome air by uncleanliness by exhaustion and by consternation found its own temperature so to say and its own season the conditions in short necessary for its birth preservation and multiplication if one unskilled in these matters may be allowed to put forth these sentiments after the hypotheses propounded by certain doctors of medicine and repropounded at length with many arguments and much caution by one as diligent as he is talented or whether again the contagion first broke out in the lazaretto itself as according to an obscure and inexact account it seems was thought by the physicians of the board of health or whether it were actually in existence and hovering above before that time which seems perhaps the most likely if we recollect that the scarcity was already universal and of long date and the mortality frequent and that when once introduced there it spread with fresh and terrible rapidity owing to the accumulation of bodies which were rendered still more disposed to receive it from the increasing efficacy of the other causes whichever of these conjectures be the true one the daily number of deaths in the lazaretto shortly exceeded a hundred while all the rest here was languor suffering fear lamentations and horror in the board of provision there was shame stupefaction and incertitude they consulted and listened to the advice of the board of health and could find no other course than to undo what had been done with so much preparation 
so much expense and so much unwillingness they opened the lazaretto and dismissed all who had any strength remaining who made their escape with a kind of furious joy the city once more resounded with its former clamor but more feeble and interrupted it again saw that more diminished and more miserable crowd says ripamonti when remembering how it had been thus diminished the sick were transported to santa maria della stella at that time a hospital for beggars and here the greater part perished in the meanwhile however the blessed fields began to whiten the mendicants from the country set off each one to his own parts for this much desired harvest the good federigo dismissed them with last effort and new invention of charity to every countryman who presented himself at the archiepiscopal palace he gave a guillo and a reaping sickle with the harvest the scarcity at length ceased the mortality however whether epidemic or contagious though decreasing from day to day was protracted even into the season of autumn it was on the point of vanishing when behold a new scourge made its appearance many important events of that kind which are more peculiarly denominated historical facts had taken place during this interval a cardinal richelieu having as we have said taken la rochelle and having patched up an accommodation with the king of england had proposed and carried by his potential voice in the french council that some effectual succor should be rendered to the duke of nevers and had at the same time persuaded the king himself to conduct the expedition in person while making the necessary preparations the count de nassau imperial commissary suggested at mantua to the new duke that he should give up the states into ferdinand's hands or that the latter would send an army to occupy them the duke who in more desperate circumstances had scorned to accept so hard and little to be trusted a condition and encouraged now by the approaching aid from france scorned it so much the more but in terms in which the no was wrapped up and kept at a distance as much as might be and with even more apparent but less costly proposals of submission the commissary took his departure threatening that they would come to decide it by force in the month of march the cardinal richelieu made a descent with the king at the head of an army he demanded a passage from the duke of savoy entered upon a treaty which however was not concluded and after an encounter in which the french had the advantage again negotiated and concluded an agreement in which the duke stipulated among other things that cordova should raise the siege of casali pledging himself in case of his refusal to join with the french for the invasion of the duchy of milan don gonzalo reckoning it too a very cheap bargain withdrew his army from casali which was immediately entered by a body of french to reinforce the garrison it was on this occasion that Eccellini addressed to king louis his famous sonnet sudate o foci a preparar metalli and another in which he exhorted him to repair immediately to the deliverance of terra santa but there is a fatal decree that the advice of poets should not be followed and if any doings happen to be found in history in conformity with their suggestions we may safely affirm that they were resolved upon beforehand the cardinal richelieu determined instead to return to france on affairs which he considered more urgent gerolamo soranzo the venetian envoy urged indeed much stronger reason to divert his resolution but the king and the cardinal paying no more attention to his prose than to the verses of Achillini, returned with the greater part of the army leaving only six thousand men in susa to occupy the pass and maintain the treaty 
while this army was retiring on one hand that of ferdinand headed by the count de colalto approached on the other it invaded the country of grisons and valtellini and prepared to descend upon the milanese besides all the terrors to which the announcement of such a migration gave rise the alarming rumor got abroad and was confirmed by express tidings that the plague was lurking in the army of which there were always some symptoms at that time in the german troops according to varchi in speaking of that which a century before had been introduced into florence by their means alessandro tadino one of the conservators of the public health there were six besides the president four magistrates and two physicians was commissioned by the board as he himself relates in his ragu aglio already quoted to remonstrate with the governor on the fearful danger which threatened the country if that vast multitude obtained a passage through it to mantua as the report ran from the whole behavior of don gonzalo it appeared he had a great desire to make a figure in history which in truth cannot avoid giving an account of some of his doings but as often happens it knew not or took no pains to record an act of his the most worthy of remembrance and attention the answer he gave to the physician tadino on this occasion he replied that he knew not what to do that the reasons of interest and reputation which had caused the march of that army were of greater weight than the represented danger but that nevertheless he must try to remedy it as well as he could and must then trust in providence to remedy it therefore as well as he could the two physicians of the board of health the above-mentioned tadino and senatore setella son of the celebrated lodovicio proposed in this committee to prohibit under severe penalties the purchase of any kind of commodities whatsoever from the soldiers who were about to pass but it was impossible to make the president understand the advantage of such a regulation a kind-hearted man says tadino who would not believe that the probability of the death of so many thousands must follow upon traffic with these people and their goods we quote this extract as one of the singularities of those times for certainly since there have been boards of health no other president of one of them ever happened to use such a, an argument if argument it be as to don gonzalo this reply was one of his last performances here for the ill success of the war promoted and conducted chiefly by himself was the cause of his being removed from his post in the course of the summer on his departure from milan a circumstance occurred which by some contemporary writer is noticed as the first of that kind that ever happened there to a man of his rank on leaving the palace called the city palace surrounded by a great company of noblemen he encountered a crowd of the populace some of whom preceded him in the way and others followed behind shouting and upbraiding him with imprecations as being the cause of the famine they had suffered by the permission they said he had given to carry corn and rice out of the city at his carriage which was following the party they hurled worse missiles than words stones bricks cabbage stalks rubbish of all sorts the usual ammunition in short of these expeditions repulsed by the guards they drew back but only to run augmented on the way by many fresh parties to prepare themselves at the porta ticinese through which gate he would shortly have to pass in his carriage when the equipage made its appearance followed by many others they showered down upon them all both with hands and slings a perfect torrent of stones the matter however went no further the marquis ambrogio spinola was dispatched to supply his place 
whose name had already acquired in the wars of flanders the military renown it still retains in the meanwhile the german army had received definite orders to march forward to mantua and in the month of september they entered the duchy of milan the military forces in those days were still chiefly composed of volunteers enlisted under commanders by profession sometimes by commission from this or that prince sometimes also on their own account that they might dispose of themselves and their men together these were attracted to this employment much less by the pay than by the hopes of plunder and all the gratifications of military license there is no fixed and universal discipline in an army so composed nor was it possible easily to bring into concordance the independent authority of so many different leaders these two in particular were not very nice on the subject of discipline nor had they been willing can we see how they could have succeeded in establishing and maintaining it for soldiers of this kind would either have revolted against an innovating commander who should have taken it into his head to abolish pillage or at least would have left him by himself to defend his colors besides as the princes who hired these troops sought rather to have hands enough to secure their undertakings than to proportion the number to their means of remuneration which were generally very scanty so the payments were for the most part late on account and by little at a time and the spoils of the countries they were making war upon or overran became as it were a compensation tacitly accorded to them it was a saying of wallenstein's scarcely less celebrated than his name that it was easier to maintain an army of a hundred thousand men than one of twelve thousand and that of which we are speaking was in great part composed of men who under his command had desolated germany in that war so celebrated among other wars both for itself and for its effects which afterwards took its name from the thirty years of its duration it was then the eleventh year there was besides his own special regiment conducted by one of his lieutenants of the other leaders the greatest part had commanded under him and there were also more than one of those who four years afterwards had to assist in bringing him to that evil end which everybody knows there were twenty eight thousand foot and seven thousand horse and in descending from valtellini to reach the territory of mantua they had to follow more or less closely the course of the adda where it forms two branches of a lake then again as a river to its junction with the po and afterwards for some distance along the banks of this river on the whole eight days march in the duchy of milan a great part of the inhabitants retired to the mountains taking with them their most valuable effects and driving their cattle before them others stayed behind either to tend upon some sick person or to defend their houses from the flames or to keep an eye upon precious things which they had concealed underground some because they had nothing to lose and a few villains also to make acquisitions when the first detachment arrived at the village where they were to halt they quickly spread themselves through this and the neighboring ones and plundered them directly all that could be eaten or carried off disappeared not to speak of the destruction of the rest of the fields laid waste of the houses given to the flames the blows the wounds the rapes committed all the expedients all the defences employed to save property often proved useless sometimes even more injurious to the owners the soldiers far more practised in the stratagems of this kind of war too rummaged every corner of the dwellings tore down walls easily discovered in the gardens the newly disturbed soil penetrated even to the hills to carry off the cattle went into caves under the guidance of some villain 
as we have said, in search of any wealthy inhabitant who might be concealed there, despoiled his person, dragged him to his house, and, by dint of threats and blows, compelled him to point out his hidden treasure. At length, however, they took their departure, and the distant sound of drums or trumpets gradually died away on the ear. This was followed by a few hours of death-like calm, and then a new hateful clashing of arms, a new hateful rumbling, announced another squadron. These, no longer finding anything to plunder, applied themselves with the more fury to make destruction and havoc of the rest. Burning furniture, doorposts, beams, casks, wine vats, and sometimes even the houses, they seized and ill-used the inhabitants with double ferocity, and so on, from worst to worst, for twenty days, for into this number of detachments the army was divided. Cholizio was the first town of the duchy invaded by these fiends. Afterwards they threw themselves into Bellano, thence they entered and spread themselves through Valsassina, and then poured down into the territory of Leccio. End of chapter 28 Part 2"'Chapter 29, Part 1 of The Betrothed. "'This is a LibriVox recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. "'For more information or to volunteer, "'please visit LibriVox.org. "'Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. "'The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. "'Chapter 29, Part 1 and here we find that persons of our acquaintance were sharers in the widespread alarm one who saw not don abondidio the day that the news were suddenly spread of the descent of the army of its near approach and destructive proceedings knows very little of what embarrassment and consternation really are they are coming they are thirty there are forty there are fifty thousand they are devils, heretics, antichrists. They've sacked Cortenova. They've set fire to Premaluna. They've devastated Introbio, Pasturo, Parisio. They've been seen at Balabio. They'll be here tomorrow. Such were the reports that passed from mouth to mouth, some hurrying to and fro, others standing in little parties, together with tumultuous consultations hesitation whether to fly or remain the women assembling in groups and all utterly at a loss of what to do don abondidio who had resolved before any one else and more than any one else to fly by any possible mode of flight and to any conceivable place of retreat discovered insuperable obstacles and fearful dangers what shall i do exclaimed he where shall i go the mountains letting alone the difficulty of getting there were not secure it was well known that the german foot soldiers climbed them like cats where they had the least indication or hope of finding booty the lake was wide there was a very high wind besides the greater part of the boatmen fearing they might be compelled to convey soldiers or baggage had retreated with their boats to the opposite side. The few that had remained were gone off overladen with people, and, distressed by their own weight and violence of the storm, were considered in greater peril every moment. It was impossible to find a vehicle, horse, or conveyance of any kind to carry him away from the road the army had to traverse, and on foot don abondidio could not manage any great distance and feared being overtaken by the way the confines of the bergamascan territory were not so very far off but that his limbs could have borne him thither at a stretch but a report had been already spread that a squadron of capelletti had been dispatched from bergamo in haste who were occupying the borders to keep the german troops in order 
and those were neither more nor less devils incarnate than these and on their part did the worst they could the poor man ran through the house with eyes starting from his head and half out of his senses he kept following perpetua to concert some plan with her but perpetua busied in collecting the most valuable household goods and hiding them under the floor or in any other out-of-the-way place pushed by hurriedly eager and preoccupied with her hands or arms full and replied i shall have done directly putting these things away safely and then will do what others do don abandidio would have detained her and discussed with her the different courses to be adopted but she what with her business and her hurry and the fear which she too felt within and the vexation which that of her master excited was in this juncture less tractable than she had ever been before others do the best they can and so will we i beg your pardon but you are good for nothing but to hinder one do you think that others haven't skins to save too that the soldiers are only coming to fight with you you might even lend a hand at such a time instead of coming crying and bothering at one's feet with these and similar answers she at length got rid of him having already determined when this bustling operation was finished as well as might be to take him by the arm like a child and to drag him along to one of the mountains left thus alone he retreated to the window looked listened or seeing someone passing cried out in a half crying and half reproachful tone do your poor curate this kindness to seek some horse some mule some ass for him is it possible that nobody will help me oh what people wait for me at least that i may go with you wait till you are fifteen or twenty to take me with you that i may not be quite forsaken will you leave me in the hand of dogs don't you know they are nearly all lutherans who think it a meritorious deed to murder a priest will you leave me here to be martyred oh what a set oh what a set but to whom did he address these words to men who were passing along bending under the weight of their humble furniture and their thoughts turned towards that which they were leaving at home exposed to plunder one driving before him a young cow another dragging after him his children also laden as heavily as they could bear while his wife carried in her arms such as were unable to walk some went on their way without replying or looking up others said eh sir you too must do as you can happy you who have no family to think for you must help yourself and do the best you can oh poor me exclaimed don abandidio oh what people what hard hearts there's no charity everybody thinks of himself but nobody will think for me and he set off again in search of perpetua oh i just wanted you said she your money what shall we do give it to me and i'll go and bury it in the garden here by the house together with the silver and the knives and forks but 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 give it here keep a few pence for whatever may happen and then leave it to me don abandidio obeyed went to his trunk took out his little treasure and handed it to perpetua who said i'm going to bury it in the garden at the foot of the fig tree and went out soon afterwards she reappeared with a packet in her hand containing some provision for the appetite and a small empty basket in the bottom of which she hastily placed a little linen for herself and her master saying at the same time you carry the riviere at least but where are we going where are all the rest going first of all we'll go into the street and there we shall see and hear what's best to be done at this moment agnes entered also carrying a basket slung over her shoulder and with an air of one who comes to make an important proposal agnes herself equally resolved not to await guests 
of this sort alone as she was in the house and with little of the money of the unnamed still left had been hesitating for some time about a place of retreat the remainder of those scudi which in the months of famine had been of such use to her was now the principal cause of her anxiety and irresolution from having heard how in the already invaded countries those who had any money had found themselves in a worse condition than anybody else exposed alike to the violence of the strangers and the treachery of their fellow countrymen true it was that she had confided to no one save don abundidio the wealth that had fallen so to say into her lap to him she had applied from time to time to change her escudo into silver always leaving him something to give to some one who was poorer than herself but hidden riches particularly with one who is not accustomed to handle much keep the possessor in continual suspicion of the suspicion of others while however she was going about hiding here and there as best she could what she could not manage to take with her and thinking about the scudi which she kept sewn up in her stays she remembered that together with them the unnamed had sent her the most ample proffers of service she remembered what she had heard related about his castle being in so secure a situation where nothing could reach it against its owner's will but birds and she resolved to go and seek an asylum there wondering how she was to make herself known to the signor don abundidio quickly occurred to her mind who after the conversation we have related with the archbishop had always shown her particular marks of kindness the more heartily as he could do so without committing himself to any one and the two young people being far enough off the probability was also distant that a request would be made him which would have put this kindness to a very dangerous test thinking that in such confusion the poor man would be still more perplexed and dismayed than herself and that this course might appear desirable also to him she came to make the proposal finding him with perpetua she suggested it to them both together what say you to it perpetua asked don abondidio i say that it is an inspiration from heaven and that we mustn't lose time but set off at once on our journey and then and then and then when we get there we shall find ourselves very well satisfied it is well known now that the signor desires nothing more than to benefit his fellow creatures and i've no doubt he'll be glad to receive us there on the borders and as it were in the air the soldiers certainly won't come and then and then we shall find something to eat there for up in the mountains when this little store is gone and so saying she placed it in the basket upon the linen we should find ourselves very badly off he's converted he's really converted isn't he why should we doubt it any longer after all that's known about him nay after what you yourself have seen and supposing we should be going to put ourselves in prison what prison i declare with all your silly objections i beg your pardon you'd never come to any conclusion well done agnes it was certainly a capital thought of yours and setting the basket on a table she passed her arms through the straps and lifted it upon her back couldn't we find some man said don abondidio who would come with us as a guard to his curate if we should meet any ruffians for there are plenty of them roving about what help could you two give me another plan to waste time exclaimed perpetua to go now and look for a man when everybody has to mind himself up with you go and get your breviary and hat and let us set off don abondidio obeyed and soon returned with the breviary under his arm his hat on his head and his staff in his hand and the three companions went out by a little door 
which led into the churchyard. Perpetua locked it after her, rather not to neglect an accustomed form than from any faith she placed in bolts and doorposts, and put the key in her pocket. Don Abondidio cast a glance at the church in passing, and muttered between his teeth, It's the people's business to take care of it, for it is they who use it. If they've the least love for their church, they'll see to it. If they've not, why, it's their own lookout. They took the road through the fields, each silently pursuing his way, absorbed in thought on his own particular circumstances, and looking rather narrowly around. More particularly Don Abandidio, who was in continual apprehension of the apparition of some suspicious figure, or something not to be trusted. However, they encountered no one. All the people were either in their houses to guard them, to prepare bundles, and to put away goods, or on the roads which led directly to the mountain heights. After heaving a few deep sighs, and then giving vent to his vexation in an interjection or two, Don Abondidio began to grumble more connectedly. He quarreled with the Duke of Nevers, who might have been enjoying himself in France and playing the prince there, yet was determined to be Duke of Mantua, in spite of the world, with the emperor, who ought to have sense for the follies of others, to let matters take their own course and not stand so much upon punctilio, for, after all, he would always be emperor, whether Titius or Sempronius were Duke of Mantua, and, above all, with the governor whose business it was to do everything he could to avert these scourges of the country, while, in fact, he was the very person to invite them, all from the pleasure he took in making war. I wish, said he, that these gentry were here to see and try how pleasant it is. They will have a fine account to render." but in the meanwhile we have to bear it who have no blame in the matter do let these people alone for they'll never come to help us said perpetua this is some of your usual prating i beg your pardon which just comes to nothing what rather gives me uneasiness what's the matter perpetua who had been leisurely going over in her mind during their walk her hasty packing and stowing away now began her lamentations at, at having forgotten such a thing and badly concealed such another here she had left traces which might serve as a clue to the robbers there well done cried don abondidio gradually sufficiently relieved from fear for his life to allow of anxiety for his worldly goods and chattels well done did you really do so? Where was your head? What? exclaimed Perpetua, coming to an abrupt pause for a moment, and resting her hands on her sides, as well as the basket she carried would allow. What? Do you begin now to scold me in this way, when it was you who almost turned my brain, instead of helping and encouraging me? I believe I've taken more care of the things of the house than of my own. I'd not a creature to lend me a hand. I've been obliged to play the parts of both Martha and Magdalene. If anything goes wrong, I've nothing to say. I've done more than my duty now. Agnes interrupted these disputes by beginning, in her turn, to talk about her own grievances, she lamented not so much the trouble and damage as finding all her hopes of soon meeting her lucia dashed to the ground for the reader may remember this was the very autumn on which they had so long calculated it was not at all likely that donna presidi would come to reside in her country house in that neighbourhood under such circumstances on the contrary, she would more probably have left it, had she happened to be there, as all the other residents in the country were doing. The sight of the different places they passed brought these thoughts to Agnes's mind more vividly, and increased the ardor of her desires. 
leaving the footpath through the fields they had taken the public road the very same along which agnes had come when bringing home her daughter for so short a time after having stayed with her at the tailor's the village was already in sight we will just say how de do to these good people said agnes yes and rest there a little for i begin to have had enough of this basket and to get a mouthful to eat too said perpetua on condition we don't lose time for we are not journeying for our amusement concluded don abandidio they were received with open arms and welcomed with much pleasure it reminded them of a former deed of benevolence do good to as many as you can here remarks our author and you will the more frequently happen to meet with countenances which bring you pleasure agnes burst into a flood of tears on embracing the good woman which was a great relief to her and could only reply with sobs to the questions which she and her husband put about lucia she is better off than we are said don abandidio she's at milan out of all danger and far away from these diabolical dangers are the signor curate and his companion making their escape then asked the tailor certainly replied both master and servant in one breath oh how i pity you both we are on our way said don abundidio to the castle of that's a very good thought you'll be as safe there as in paradise and you've no fear here said don abandidio i tell you signor curate they won't have to come here to halt or as you know the saying is in polite language in ospitazione we are too much out of their road thank heaven at the worst there'll only be a little party of foragers which god forbid but in any case there's plenty of time we shall first hear the intelligence from the other unfortunate towns where they go to take up their quarters it was determined to stop here and take a little rest and it was just the dinner hour my friends said the tailor will do me the favor of sharing my poor table at any rate you will have a hearty welcome perpetua said she had brought some refreshments with them and after exchanging a few complimentary speeches they agreed to put all together and dine in company end of chapter twenty nine part one chapter twenty nine part two of the betrothed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni Chapter 29, Part 2 The children gathered with great glee round their old friend Agnesi. Very soon, however, the tailor desired one of his little girls, the same that had carried that gift of charity to the widow Maria, who knows if any reader remembers it, to go and shell a few early chestnuts, which were deposited in one corner, and then put them to roast. "'And you,' he said to a little boy, "'go into the garden and shake the peach tree till some of the fruit falls, and bring them all here. Go.' "'And you,' said he to another, "'go climb the fig tree and gather a few of the ripest figs. You know that business too well already.' He himself went to tap a little barrel of wine, his wife to fetch a clean tablecloth. Perpetua took out the provisions. The table was spread. A napkin and earthenware plate were placed at the most honorable seat for Don Abondio, with a knife and fork which Perpetua had in the basket. The dinner was dished, and the party seated themselves at the table, and partook of the repast, if not with great merriment, at least with much more than any of the guests had anticipated enjoying that day. "'What say you, Signor Curate, to a turnout of this sort?' said the tailor. "'I could fancy I was reading the history of the Moors in France.' what say i to think that even this trouble should fall to my lot well you've chosen a good asylum resumed the host people would be puzzled to get up there by force and you'll find company there 
It's already reported that many have retreated thither, and many more are daily arriving. I would fain hope, said Donna Bondio, that we shall be well received. I know this brave signor, and when I once had the pleasure of being in his company, he was so exceedingly polite. And he sent word to me, said Ignisi, by his most illustrious lordship, that if I ever wanted anything I had only to go to him. A great and wonderful conversion, resumed Don Abondio, and does he really continue to persevere? Oh, yes, said the tailor, and he began to speak at some length upon the holy life of the unnamed, and how from being a scourge to the country he had become its example and benefactor. And all those people he kept under him, that household, rejoined Don Abondio, who had more than once heard something about them, but had never been sufficiently assured of the truth. They are most of them dismissed, replied the tailor, and they who remain have altered their habits in a wonderful way. In short, this castle has become like the Thebaide. You, signor, understand these things. He then began to recall with Agnesi the visit of the cardinal. A great man, said he, a great man. Pity that he left us so hastily, for I did not and could not do him any honor. How often I wish I could speak to him again, a little more at my ease. Having left the table, he made them observe an engraved likeness of the cardinal, which he kept hung up on one of the doorposts, in veneration for the person, and also that he might be able to say to any visitor that the portrait did not resemble him. For he himself had had an opportunity of studying the cardinal close by, and at his leisure, in that very room. Did they mean this thing here for him? said Agnesi. It's like him in dress, but— It doesn't resemble him, does it? said the tailor. I always say so, too. But it bears his name, if nothing more. It serves as a remembrance. Don Abondio was in a great hurry to be going. The tailor undertook to find a conveyance to carry them to the foot of the ascent, and having gone in search of one, shortly returned to say that it was coming. Then, turning to Don Abondio, he added, Signor Curie, if you should ever like to take a book with you up there to pass away the time, I shall be glad to serve you in my poor way, for I sometimes amuse myself a little with reading. They're not things to suit you, being all in the vulgar tongue, but perhaps— Thank you, thank you, replied Don Abondio. Under present circumstances, one has hardly brains enough to attend to what we are bid to read. While offering and refusing thanks, and exchanging condolence, good wishes, invitations, and promises to make another stay there on their return, the cart arrived at the front door. Putting in their baskets, the traveling party mounted after them, and undertook with rather more ease and tranquillity of mind the second half of their journey. The tailor had related the truth to Don Abondio about the unnamed. From the day on which we left him, he had steadily persevered in the course he had proposed to himself, atoning for wrongs, seeking peace, relieving the poor, and performing every good work for which an opportunity presented itself. The courage he had formerly manifested in offense and defense now showed itself in abstaining from both one and the other. He had laid down all his weapons, and always walked alone, willing to encounter the possible consequence of the many deeds of violence he had committed, and persuaded that it would be the commission of an additional one to employ force in defense of a life which owed so much to so many creditors, and persuaded, too, that every evil which might be done to him would be an offense offered to God, but with respect to himself a just retribution, and that he, above all, had no right to constitute himself a punisher of such offenses. However, he had continued not less inviolate than when he had kept in readiness for his security so many armed hands and his own. The remembrance of his former ferocity, and the sight of his present meekness, one of which it might have been expected would have left so many longings for revenge, while the other rendered that revenge so easy, conspired instead to procure and maintain for him an admiration which was the principal guarantee for his safety. He was that very man whom no one could humble, and who had now humbled himself. Every feeling of rancor, therefore, formerly irritated by his contemptuous behavior, and by the fears of others, vanished before this new humility. They whom he had offended had now obtained beyond all expectation and without danger a satisfaction which they could not have promised themselves from the most complete revenge, the satisfaction 
of seeing such a man mourning over the wrongs he had committed, and participating, so to say, in their indignation. More than one whose bitterest and greatest sorrow had been for many years that he saw no probability of ever finding himself, in any instance, stronger than this powerful oppressor, that he might revenge himself for some great injury, meeting him afterwards alone, unarmed, and with the air of one who would offer no resistance, felt only an impulse to salute him with demonstrations of respect. In his voluntary abasement, his countenance and behavior had acquired, without his being aware of it, something more lofty and noble, because there was in them, more clearly than ever, the absence of all fear. The most violent and pertinacious hatred felt, as it were, restrained and held in awe by the public veneration for so penitent and beneficent a man. This was carried to such a length that he often found it difficult to avoid the public expression of it which was addressed to him, and was obliged to be careful that he did not evince too plainly in his looks and actions the inward compunction he felt, nor abuse himself too much, lest he should be too much exalted. He had selected the lowest place in church, and woe to any one who should have attempted to preoccupy it. It would have been, as it were, usurping a post of honor. To have offended him, or even to have treated him disrespectfully, would have appeared not so much a criminal or cowardly as a sacrilegious act, and even they who would scarcely have been restrained by this feeling on ordinary occasions participated in it, more or less. These and other reasons sheltered him also from the more remote animadversions of public authority, and procured for him, even in this quarter, the security to which he himself had never given a thought. His rank and family, which had at all times been some protection to him, availed him more than ever, now that personal recommendations, the renown of his conversion, was added to his already illustrious and famous, or rather infamous, name. Magistrates and nobles publicly rejoiced with the people at the change, and it would have appeared very incongruous to come forward irritated against a man who was the subject of so many congratulations. Besides, a government occupied with a protracted and often unprosperous war against active and oft-renewed rebellions, would have been very well satisfied to be freed from the most indomitable and irksome without going in search of another, the more so as this conversion produced reparations which the authorities were not accustomed to obtain, nor even to demand. To molest a saint seemed no very good means to ward off the reproach of having never been able to repress a villain, and the example they would have made of him would have had no other effect than to dissuade others like him from following his example. Probably, too, the share that Cardinal Federigo had had in his conversion, and the association of his name with that of the convent, served the latter as a sacred shield. And in the state of things and ideas of those times, in the singular relations between the ecclesiastical authority and the civil power, which so frequently contended with each other without at all aiming at mutual destruction, nay, were always mingling expressions of acknowledgment and protestations of deference with hostilities, and which not unfrequently cooperated toward a common end without ever making peace. In such a state of things it might also seem in a manner that the reconciliation of the first carried along with it, if not the absolution, at least the forgetfulness of the second, when the former alone had been employed to produce an effect equally desired by both. Thus, that very individual, who had he fallen from his eminence, would have excited emulation among small and great in trampling him underfoot, now, having spontaneously humbled himself to the dust, was reverenced by many and spared by all. True it is that there were indeed many to whom this much-talked-of change brought anything but satisfaction. Many hired perpetrators of crime, many other associates in guilt who thereby lost a great support on which they had been accustomed to depend, and who beheld the threads of a deeply woven plot suddenly snapped, at the moment, perhaps, when they were expecting the intelligence of its completion. But we have already seen what various sentiments were awakened by the announcement of this conversion in the ruffians, who were with their master at the time, and heard it from his own lips. Astonishment, grief, depression, vexation, a little, indeed, of everything except contempt and hatred. The same was felt by the others whom he kept dispersed at different posts, and the same by his accomplices of higher rank, 
when they first learned of the terrible tidings, and by all for the same reasons. Much hatred, however, as we find it in the passages elsewhere cited by Ripamonti, fell to the share of the Cardinal Federigo. They regarded him as one who had intruded like an enemy into their affairs. The unnamed would see to the salvation of his own soul, and nobody had any right to complain of what he did. From time to time, the greater part of the ruffians in his household, unable to accommodate themselves to the new discipline, and seeing no probability that it would ever change, gradually took their departure. Some went in search of other masters, and found employment, perchance, among the old friends of the patron they had left. Others enlisted in the Terzo of Spain or Mantua, and any other belligerent power. Some infested the highways to make war on a smaller scale, and on their own account and others again contented themselves with going about as beggars at liberty. The same courses were pursued by the rest who had acted under his orders in different countries. Of those who had contrived to assimilate themselves to his new mode of life, or had embraced it of their own free will, the greater number, natives of the valley, returned to the fields, or to the trades which they had learnt in their early years, and had afterwards abandoned for a life of villainy. The strangers remained in the castle as domestic servants, and both natives and strangers, as if blessed at the same time with their master, lived contentedly as he did, neither giving nor receiving injuries, unarmed and respected. But when, on the descent of the German troops, several fugitives from the threatened or invaded dominions arrived at his castle to request an asylum, he rejoiced that the weak and oppressed sought refuge within his walls, which had so long been regarded by them at a distance as an enormous scarecrow, received these exiles with expressions of gratitude rather than courtesy. He caused it to be proclaimed that his house would be open to any who should choose to take refuge there, and soon proposed to put not only his castle, but the valley itself into a state of defense, if ever any of the German or Burgomaskian troops should attempt to come thither for plunder. He assembled the servants who still remained with him, like the verses of Torty, few and valiant addressed them on the happy opportunity that God was giving both to them and himself of employing themselves for once in aid of their fellow creatures, whom they had so often oppressed and terrified. And with that ancient tone of command, which expressed a certainty of being obeyed, announced to them in general what he wished them to do, and above all impressed upon them the necessity of keeping a restraint over themselves, that they who took refuge there might see in them only friends and protectors. He then had brought down from one of the garrets all the firearms and other warlike weapons which had been for some time deposited there, and distributed them among his household, ordered that all the peasants and tenants of the valley who were willing to do so should come with arms to the castle, provided those who had none with a sufficient supply, selected some to act as officers, and placed others under their command, assigned to each his post at the entrance and in various parts of the valley, on the ascent, and at the gates of the castle, and established hours and methods of relieving the guards, as in a camp, or as he had been accustomed to do in that very place during his life of rebellion. In one corner of this garret, divided from the rest, were the arms which he alone had borne, his famous carabine, muskets, swords, pistols, huge knives, and poniards, either lying on the ground or set up against the wall. None of the servants laid a finger on them but they determined to ask the signor which he wished to be brought to him. Not one of them, replied he, and whether from a vow or intentional design, he remained the whole time unarmed at the head of this species of garrison. He employed at the same time other men and women of his household or dependents in preparing accommodation in the castle for as many persons as possible, in erecting bedsteads and arranging straw beds, mattresses, and sacks stuffed with straw in the apartments which were now converted into dormitories. He also gave orders that large stores of provisions should be brought in for the maintenance of the guests whom God should send him, and who thronged in in daily increasing numbers. He, in the meanwhile, was never stationary. In and out of the castle, up and down the ascent, round about through the valley, to establish, to fortify, to visit the different posts, to see and be seen, to put and to keep all in order by his directions, oversight, and presence. Indoors and by the way, he gave hearty welcomes to all the newcomers whom he happened to meet, and all who had either seen this wonderful person before, 
or now beheld him for the first time, gazed at him in rapture, forgetting for a moment the misfortunes and alarm which had driven them thither, and turning to look at him, when having severed himself from them, he again pursued his way. End of chapter 29, part 2《Chapter Thirty, Part One of The Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Betrothed by Alessandro Mazzoni. Chapter Thirty, Part One. Though the greatest concourse was not from the quarter by which our three fugitives approached the valley, but rather at the opposite entrance, yet in this second half of their journey they began to meet with fellow travellers companions in misfortune who from crossroads or bypaths had issued or were issuing into the main road in circumstances like these all who happen to meet each other are acquaintances every time that the cart overtook a pedestrian traveller there was an exchanging of questions and replies some had made their escape like our friends without awaiting the arrival of the soldiers some had heard the clanging of arms and kettle-drums, while others had actually beheld them, and painted them as the terror-stricken usually paint the objects of their terror. "'We are fortunate, however,' said the two women. "'Let us thank heaven for it. Our goods must go, but at least we are out of the way.' But Don Abondio could not find so much to rejoice at. Even this concourse, and still more the far greater one which he'd heard was pouring in from the opposite direction, began to throw a gloom over his mind." oh what a state of things muttered he to the women at a moment when there was nobody at hand oh what a state of things don't you see that to collect so many people into one place is just the same thing as to draw all the soldiers here by force everybody is hiding everybody carries off his things nothing's left in the houses so they'll think there must be some treasures up here they'll surely come oh poor me what have i embarked in what should they have to come here for said perpetua they are obliged to go straight on their way and besides i've always heard say that it's better to be a large party when there's any danger a large party a large party replied donna bondio foolish woman don't you know that a single german soldier could devour a hundred of such as they and then if they should take into their heads to play any pranks it would be a fine thing wouldn't it to find ourselves in the midst of a battle oh poor me it would have been less dangerous to have gone to the mountains why should everybody choose to go to one place tiresome folks muttered he in a still lower voice all here still coming 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 one after the other like sheep that have no sense in this way said agnes they might say the same of us hush hush said donna bondio all this talk does no good what's done is done we are here and now we must stay here it will be as providence wills heaven send it may be good but his horror was greatly increased when at the entrance of the valley he saw a large body of armed men some at the door of a house and others quartered in the lower rooms he cast a side glance at them they were not the same faces which it had been his lot to see on his former melancholy entrance or if there were any of the same they were strangely altered but with all this it is impossible to say what uneasiness this sight gave him oh poor me thought he see now if they won't play pranks it isn't likely it could be otherwise i ought to have expected it from a man of this kind but what will he want to do will he make war will he play the king eh oh poor me in circumstances when one would wish to bury oneself underground and this man seeks every way of making himself known and attracting attention it seems as he wished to invite them you see now signor master said perpetua addressing him these are brave people here who will know how to defend us let the soldiers come now these people are not like our clowns who are good for nothing but to drag their legs after them hold your tongue said donna bondio in a low and angry tone hold your tongue you don't know what you are talking about pray heaven that the soldiers may make haste or that they may never come to know what is doing here and that the place is being fortified like a fortress don't you know it's the soldiers business to take fortresses they wish nothing better to take a place by storm is to them like going to a wedding because all they find they take to themselves and the inhabitants they put to the edge of the sword oh poor me well i'll surely see if there's no way of putting oneself in safety on some of these peaks they won't reach me there in a battle oh they won't reach me there 
"'If you're afraid, too, of being defended and helped,' Perpetua was again beginning. But Donna Bondio sharply interrupted her, though still in a suppressed tone. "'Hold your tongue, and take good care you don't report what we've said. Woe unto us if you do. Remember that we must always put on a pleasant countenance here, and approve all we see.' At Malinet they found another watch of armed men, to whom Donna Bondio submissively took off his hat, saying, in the meanwhile, in his heart, "'Alas, alas, I've certainly come to an encampment.' Here the cart stopped, they dismounted. Donna Bondio hastily paid and dismissed the driver, and with his two companions, silently mounted the steep. The sight of those places recalled to his imagination, and mingled with his present troubles, the remembrance of those which he had suffered here once before and agnes who had never seen these scenes and who had drawn to herself an imaginary picture which presented itself to her mind whenever she thought of the circumstances that had occurred here on seeing them now as they were in reality experienced a new and more vivid feeling of those mournful recollections oh signor curate exclaimed she to think that my poor lucia has passed along this road "'Will you hold your tongue, you absurd woman?' cried Donna Bondio in her ear. "'Are those things to be bringing up here? Don't you know we are in his place? It was well for us nobody heard you then, but if you talk in this way—' "'Oh,' said Agnes, "'now that he's a saint—' "'Well, be quiet,' replied Donna Bondio again in her ear. "'Do you think one may say without caution even to saints all that passes through one's mind? Think rather of thanking him for his goodness to you.' "'Oh, I've already thought of that.' "'Do you think I don't know even a little civility?' "'Civility is not to say things that may be disagreeable to a person, "'particular to one who is not accustomed to hear them. "'And understand well, both of you, "'that this is not a place to go chattering about "'and saying whatever may happen to come into your heads. "'It is a great signor's house. "'You know that already. "'See what a household there is all around. "'People of all sorts come here, "'so be prudent if you can. "'Weigh your words, and above all, let there be few of them, and only when there is a necessity. One can't get wrong when one is silent. You do far worse with your perpetua began, but hush, cried Donna Bondio in a suppressed voice, at the same time hastily taking off his hat and making a profound bow, for, on looking up, he had discovered the unnamed coming down to meet them. He, on his part, had noticed and recognised Donna Bondio, and was now hastening to welcome him. "'Signor curate,' said he, when he had reached him, "'I should have liked to offer you my house on a pleasanter occasion, "'but under any circumstances I am exceedingly glad to be able to be of some service to you.' "'Trusting in your illustrious lordship's great kindness,' replied Donna Bondio, "'I have ventured to come under these melancholy circumstances to intrude upon you, "'and as your illustrious lordship sees, I have also presumed to bring company with me. "'This is my housekeeper.' "'She is welcome,' said the unnamed. "'And this,' continued Donna Bondio, "'is a woman to whom your lordship has already been very good, "'the mother of that, of that, of Lucia,' said Agnes. "'Of Lucia?' exclaimed the unnamed, "'turning with a look of shame towards Agnes. "'Been very good. "'I, immortal God, you are very good to me to come here. "'To me, to this house, you are most heartily welcome. "'You bring a blessing with you.' "'Oh, sir,' said Agnes, "'I come to give you trouble. "'I have to,' continued she, "'going very close to his ear, "'to thank you.' "'The unnamed interrupted these words "'by anxiously making inquiries about Lucia, "'and having heard the intelligence they had to give, "'he turned to accompany his new guest to the castle, "'and persisted in doing so "'in spite of their ceremonious opposition. "'Agnes cast a glance at the curate, "'which meant to say, "'You see now,' whether there's any need for you to interpose between us with your advice. "'Have they reached your parish?' asked the unnamed, addressing Donna Bondio. "'No, signor, for I would not willingly await the arrival of these devils,' replied he. "'Heaven knows if I should have been able to escape alive out of their hands and come to trouble your illustrious lordship.' "'Well, well, you may take courage,' resumed the nobleman, "'for you are now safe enough. They'll not come up here, and if they should wish to make the trial, we're ready to receive them.' "'We'll hope they won't come,' said Donna Bondio. "'I hear,' added he, pointing with his finger towards the mountains, "'which enclose the valley on the opposite side. "'I hear that another band of soldiers is wandering about in that quarter too. "'But, but, true,' replied the unnamed. "'But you need have no fear. We are ready for them also. 
between two fires in the meanwhile said donabondio to himself exactly between two fires where have i suffered myself to be drawn and by two silly women and this man seems actually in his element in it all oh what people there are in the world on entering the castle the signor had agnes and perpetua conducted to an apartment in the quarter assigned to the women which occupied three of the four sides of the inner court in the back part of the building and was situated on a jutting and isolated rock overhanging a precipice the men were lodged in the sides of the other court to the right and left and in that which looked on the esplanade the central block which separated the two quadrangles and afforded a passage from one to the other through a wide archway opposite the principal gate was partly occupied with provisions and partly served as a depository for any little property the refugees might wish to secure in this retreat in the quarters appropriated to the men was a small apartment destined for the use of any clergy who might happen to take refuge there hither the unnamed himself conducted donabondio who was the first to take possession of it three or four and twenty days our fugitives remained at the castle in a state of continual bustle forming a large company which at first received constant additions but without any incidents of importance perhaps however not a single day passed without their resorting to arms lance canets were coming in this direction capoletti had been seen in that every time this intelligence was brought the unnamed sent men to reconnoitre and if there were any necessity took with him some whom he kept in readiness for the purpose and accompanied them beyond the valley in the direction of the indicated danger and it was a singular thing to behold a band of brigands armed cap a pie and conducted like soldiers by one who was himself unarmed generally it proved to be only foragers and disbanded pillagers who contrived to make off before they were taken by surprise but once when driving away some of these to teach them not to come again into that neighbourhood the unnamed received intelligence that an adjoining village was invaded and given up to plunder they were soldiers of various corps who having loitered behind to hunt for booty had formed themselves into a band and made a sudden eruption into the land surrounding that where the army had taken up its quarters despoiling the inhabitants and even levying contributions from them the unnamed made a brief harangue to his followers and bid them march forward to the invaded village they arrived unexpectedly the plunderers who had thought of nothing but taking the spoil abandoned their prey in the midst on seeing men in arms and ready for battle coming down upon them and hastily took to flight without waiting for one another in the direction whence they had come he pursued them a little distance then making a halt waited a while to see if any fresh object presented itself and at length returned homewards it is impossible to describe the shouts of applause and benediction which accompanied the troop of deliverers and its leader on passing through the rescued village among the multitude of refugees assembled in the castle strangers to each other and differing in rank habit sex and age no disturbance of any moment occurred the unnamed had placed guards in various posts all of whom endeavoured to ward off any unpleasantness with the care usually exhibited by those who are held accountable for any misdemeanours he had also requested the clergy and others of most authority among those to whom he afforded shelter to walk round the place and keep a watch and as often as he could he himself went about to show himself in every direction while even in his absence the remembrance of who was in the house served as a restraint to those who needed it besides they were all people that had fled from danger and hence generally inclined to peace while the thoughts of their homes and property and in some cases of relatives and friends whom they had left exposed to danger and the tidings they heard from without depressed their spirits and thus maintained and constantly increased this disposition end of chapter thirty part one chapter thirty part two of the betrothed this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Betrothed by Alessandro Mazzoni. Chapter 30, Part 2. There were, however, some unburdened spirits, some men of firmer mould and stronger courage, who tried to pass these days merrily. They had abandoned their homes because they were not strong enough to defend them 
but they saw no use in weeping and sighing over things that could not be helped, or in picturing to themselves and contemplating beforehand, in imagination, the havoc they would only too soon witness with their own eyes. Families acquainted with each other had left their homes at the same time, and had met with each other again in this retreat. New friendships were formed, and the multitude were divided into parties, according to their several habits and dispositions. They who had money and consideration went to dine down in the valley, where eating-houses and inns had been hastily run for the occasion. In some, mouthfuls were interchanged with lamentations, or no subject but their misfortunes was allowed to be discussed. In others, misfortunes were never remembered, unless it were to say that they must not think about them. To those who either could not or would not bear part of the expenses, bread, soup and wine were distributed in the castle, besides other tables which were laid out daily for those whom the Signor had expressly invited to partake of them, and our acquaintances were among this number. Agnes and Perpetua, not to eat the bread of idleness, had begged to be employed in the services which, in so large an establishment, must have been required, and in these occupations they spent a great part of the day, while the rest was passed in chatting with some friends whose acquaintance they had made, or with the unfortunate Donna Bondio. This individual, though he had nothing to do, was nevertheless never afflicted with ennui. His fears kept him company. The direct dread of an assault had, I believe, subsided, or if it still remained, it was one which gave him the least uneasiness because whenever he bestowed upon it the slightest thought, he could not help seeing how unfounded it was. But the idea of the surrounding country, inundated on both sides with brutal soldiers, the armour and armed men he had constantly before his eyes, the remembrance that he was in a castle, together with the thought of the many things that might happen any moment in such a situation, all contributed to keep him in indistinct, general, constant alarm, let alone the anxiety he felt when he thought of his poor home, during the whole time he remained in this asylum, he never once went more than a stone's throw from the building, nor ever set foot on the descent. His sole walk was to go out upon the esplanade, and pace up and down, sometimes to one, sometimes to the other side of the castle, there to look down among the cliffs and precipices, in hopes of discovering some practicable passage, some kind of footpath, by which he might go in search of a hiding place, in case of being very closely pressed. On meeting any of his companions in this asylum, he failed not to make a profound bow or respectful salutation, but he associated with very few. His most frequent conversations were with the two women, as we have related, and to them he poured out all his griefs, at the risk of being sometimes silenced by Perpetua, and completely put to shame, even by Agnes. At table, however, where he sat but little, and talked still less, he heard the news of the terrible march which arrived daily at the castle, either reported from village to village, and from mouth to mouth, or brought thither by some one who had at first determined to remain at home, and had after all made his escape without having been able to save anything, and probably also, after receiving considerable ill-treatment, and every day brought with it some fresh tale of misfortune. Some, who were newsmongers by profession, diligently collected the different rumours, weighed all the various accounts, and then gave the substance of them to the others. They disputed which were the most destructive regiments, and whether infantry or cavalry were the worst. They reported, as well as they could, the names of some of the leaders, related some of their past enterprises, specified the places of halting and the daily marches. That day such a regiment would spread over such a district. Tomorrow it would ravage such another where in the meanwhile another had been playing the very devil and worse. They chiefly, however, sought information, and kept count of the regiments which from time to time crossed the bridge of Lecco, because these might be considered as fairly gone, and really out of the territory. The cavalry of Wallenstein passed it, and the infantry of Maradus. The cavalry of Anslaut, and the infantry under Brandenburgo, the troops of Monte Cuculo, then those of Ferrari, then follow Altringer, then Furstenberg, then Colorado, after then came the Croatians, Torquato Conti, and this, that, and the other leader, and last of all, is heaven's good time, come at length Galasso. The flying squadron of Venetians made their final exit, and the whole country on either hand was once more set at liberty. Those belonging to the invaded villages which were first cleared of their ravages, 
had already begun to evacuate the castle, and every day people continued to leave the place, as after an autumnal storm the birds may be seen issuing on every side from the leafy branches of a great tree, where they had sought a shelter from its fury. Our three refugees were perhaps the last to take their departure, owing to Donna Bondio's extreme reluctance to run the risk, if they returned home immediately, of meeting some straggling soldiers who might still be loitering in the rear of the army. It was in vain Perpetua repeated and insisted that the longer they delayed, the greater opportunities they afforded to the thieves of the neighbourhood to enter the house and finish the business. Whenever the safety of life was at stake, Donna Bondio invariably gained the day, unless, indeed, the imminence of the danger was such as to deprive him of the power of self-defence. On the day fixed for their departure, the unnamed had a carriage in readiness at Melanot, in which he had already placed a full supply of clothes for Agnes. Drawing her a little aside, he also forced her to accept a small store of scuddy, to compensate for the damages she would find at home. Although, striking her breast, she kept repeating that she had still some of the first supply left. "'When you see your poor good Lucia,' said he, the last thing, "'I am already convinced she prays for me, because I have done her so much wrong. Tell her then that I thank her, and trust in God her prayers will return, also in equal blessings upon her own head.' He then insisted upon accompanying his three guests to the carriage. The obsequious and extravagant acknowledgments of Donna Bondio and the complimentary speeches of Perpetua we leave to the reader's imagination. They set off, made a short stay, according to agreement, at the tailor's cottage, and there heard a hundred particulars of the march, the usual tale of theft, violence, destruction, and obscenity. But there, fortunately, none of the soldiery had been seen. "'Ah, Signor Curate,' said the tailor, as he offered him his arm to assist him again into the carriage. They'll have matter enough for a printed book in a scene of destruction like this. As they advanced a little on their journey, our travellers began to witness, with their own eyes, something of what they had heard described. Vineyards despoiled, not as by the vintager, but as though a storm of wind and hail combined, had exerted their utmost energies. Branches strewn upon the earth, broken off and trampled underfoot, stakes torn up, the ground trodden and covered with chips, leaves and twigs, trees uprooted or their branches lopped, hedges broken down, stiles carried away. In the villages too, doors shivered to pieces, windows destroyed, straw, rags, rubbish of all kinds lying in heaps or scattered all over the pavement, a close atmosphere and horrid odours of a more revolting nature proceeding from the houses some of the villagers busy in sweeping out the accumulation of filth within them others in repairing the doors and windows as they best could some again weeping in groups and indulging in lamentations together and as the carriage drove through hands stretched out on both sides at the doors of the vehicle imploring arms with these scenes now before his eyes now pictured in their minds and with the expectation of finding their own houses in just the same state they at length arrived there and found that their expectations were indeed realised. Agnes deposited her bundles in one corner of her little yard, the cleanest spot that remained about the house. She then set herself to sweep it thoroughly, and collect and rearrange the little furniture which had been left her. She got a carpenter and blacksmith to come and mend the doors and window frames, and then, unpacking the linen which had been given her, and secretly counting over her fresh stores of coins, she exclaimed to herself, "'I've fallen upon my feet. God and the Madonna, and that good signor be thanked, I may indeed say, I've fallen upon my feet. Donna Bondio and Perpetua entered the house without the aid of keys, and at every step they took in the passage and counted a fetid odour, a poisonous effluvia, which almost drove them back. Holding their noses they advanced to the kitchen door, entered on tiptoe, carefully picking their way to avoid the most disgusting parts of the filthy straw, which covered the ground, and cast a glance around. Nothing was left whole, but relics and fragments of what once had been, both here and in other parts of the house, were to be seen in every corner. Quills and feathers from perpetuous fowls, scraps of linen, leaves out of Donna Bondio's calendars, remnants of kitchen utensils, all heaped together or scattered in confusion upon the floor. On the hearth might be discovered tokens of a riotous scene of destruction, like a multitude of ordinary ideas, scattered through a widely diffused period by a professional orator. There were the vestiges of extinguished faggots and billets of wood, which showed them to have been once the arm of a chair, 
a table foot, the door of a cupboard, a bedpost, or a stave of the little cask which contained the wine so beneficial to Donna Bondio's stomach. The rest was cinders and coal, and with some of these very coals, the spoilers, by way of recreation, had scrawled on the walls distorted figures, doing their best by the help of sundry square caps, shaven crowns and large bands, to represent priests studiously exhibited in all manner of horrible and ludicrous attitudes, an intention certainly in which such artists could not possibly have failed. "'Ah, the dirty pigs!' exclaimed Perpetua. "'Ah, the thieves!' cried Donna Bondio. And as if making their escape, they went out by another door that led into the garden. Once more drawing their breath, they went straight up to the fig tree, but even before reaching it, they discovered that the ground had been disturbed, and both together uttered an exclamation of dismay, and on coming up, they found in truth, instead of the dead, only the empty tomb. This gave rise to some disputes. Donna Bondio began to scold Perpetua for having hidden it so badly. It may be imagined whether she would fail to retort, and after indulging in mutual recrimination till they were tired, they returned with many a lingering look, cast back at the empty hole, grumbling into the house. They found things nearly in the same state everywhere. Long and diligently they worked to cleanse and purify the house, the more so, as it was then extremely difficult to get any help, and they remained for I know not what length of time, as if in encampment, arranging things as best they could, and bad was the best, and gradually restoring doors, furniture and utensils, with money lent to them by Agnes. In addition to these grievances, the disaster was, for some time afterwards, the source of many other very ticklish disputes. For Perpetua, by dint of asking, peeping, and hunting out, had come to know for certain that some of her master's household goods, which were thought to have been carried off or destroyed by the soldiers, were instead safe and sound with some people in the neighbourhood, and she was continually tormenting her master to make a stir about them and claim his own. A cord more odious to Donna Bondio could not have been touched, considering that his property was in the hands of ruffians, of that species of persons, that is to say, with whom he had it most at heart to remain at peace. "'But if I don't want to know about these things,' said he, "'how often am I to tell you that what is gone is gone? "'Am I to be harassed in this way too, because my house has been robbed?' "'I tell you,' replied Perpetua, "'that you would let the very eyes be eaten out of your head. "'To rob others is a sin, but with you it is a sin not to rob you.' "'Very proper language for you, certainly,' answered Donna Bondio. "'Will you hold your tongue?' Perpetua did hold her tongue, but not so directly, and even then everything was a pretext for beginning again, so that the poor man was at last reduced to the necessity of suppressing every lamentation on the lack of this or that article of furniture at the moment he most wanted to give vent to his regrets, for more than once he had been doomed to hear, "'Go seek it at such a one's who has it, and who wouldn't have kept it till now if he hadn't had to do with such an easy man.' Another and more vivid cause of disquietude was the intelligence that soldiers continued daily to be passing in confusion, as he had too well conjectured. Hence he was ever in apprehension of seeing a man, or even a band of men arriving at his door, which he had had repaired in haste the first thing, and which he kept barred with the greatest precaution. But, thank heaven, this catastrophe never occurred. These terrors, however, were not appeased when a new one was added to their number. But here... We must leave the poor man on one side, for other matters are now to be treated of than his private apprehensions, the misfortunes of a few villages, or a transient disaster. End of chapter 30, part 2「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリングス」の「ルポスコリング
we now come to relate the principal incidents of this calamity in the milanese or rather in milan almost exclusively for almost exclusively of that city do the records of the time treat nearly as it always and everywhere happens for good reasons or bad and to say the truth it is not only our object in this narrative to represent the state of things in which our characters will shortly be placed but at the same time to develop as far as may be in so limited a space and from our pen an event in the history of our country more celebrated than well known of the many contemporary accounts there is not one which is sufficient by itself to convey a distinct and connected idea of it as there is not perhaps one which may not give us some assistance in forming that idea in every one not excepting that of ripamonte which considerably exceeds all the rest both in copiousness and its selection of facts and still more in its method of viewing them essential facts are omitted which are recorded in others in every one there are errors of material importance which may be detected and rectified with the help of some other or in the few printed manuscript acts of public authority which still remain and we may often discover in one those causes the effects of which were found partially developed in another in all too a strange confusion of times and things prevailed and a perpetual wandering backwards and forwards as it were at random without design special or general the character by the by of books of all classes in those days chiefly among such as were written in the vulgar tongue at least in italy whether also in the rest of europe the learned will know and we shrewdly suspect it so to have been no writer of later date has attempted to examine and compare these memoirs with the view of extracting thence a connected series of events a history of this plague so that the idea generally formed of it must necessarily be very uncertain and somewhat confused a vague idea of the great evils and great errors and assuredly there were both one and the other beyond what can possibly be imagined an idea composed more of opinions than of facts mingled indeed with a few scattered events but unconnected sometimes with their most characteristic circumstances and without distinction of time that is to say without perception of cause and effect of course and progress we having examined and compared with at least much diligence all the printed accounts more than one unpublished one and in comparison to the few that remain on the subject many official documents have endeavoured to do not perhaps all that is needed but something which has not hitherto been done we do not propose relating every public act nor all the results worthy in some degree of remembrance still less do we pretend to render needless to such as would gain no more complete acquaintance with the subject the perusal of the original writings we are too well aware what lively peculiar and so to say incommunicable force invariably belongs to works of that kind in whatever manner designed and executed we have merely endeavoured to distinguish and ascertain the most general and important facts to arrange them in their real order of succession so far as the matter and the nature of them will allow to observe their reciprocal effect and thus to give for the present and until some one else shall do better a succinct but plain and continuous account of this calamity throughout the whole trackman of the territory traversed by the army corpses might be found either in the houses or lying upon the highway very shortly single individuals or whole families began to sicken and die of violent and strange complaints with symptoms unknown to the greater part of those who were then alive there were only a few who had ever seen them before the few that is who could remember the plague which fifty-three years previously had desolated a great part of italy indeed but especially the milanese where it was then and is still called the plague of san carlo so powerful is charity among the various and awful recollections of a general calamity she could cause that of one individual to predominate because she had inspired him with the feelings and actions more memorable even than the evils themselves 
she could set upon him in men's minds as a symbol of all these events because in all she had urged him onward and held him to the view as guide and helper example and voluntary victim and could frame for him as it were an emblematical device out of a public calamity and name it after him as though it had been a conquest or discovery the oldest physician of his time ludovico setala who had not only seen that plague but had been one of its most active intrepid and though not then very young most celebrated successful opponents and who now in strong suspicion of this was on the alert and busily collecting information reported on the twentieth of october in the council of the board of health that the contagion had undoubtedly broken out in the village of chiuso the last in the territory of lecco and on the confines of the bergamascan district no resolution however was taken on this intelligence as appears from the narrative of tadino similar tidings arrived from lecco and bellano the board then decided upon and contented themselves with dispatching a commissioner who should take a physician from como by the way and accompany him on a visit to the places which had been signified both of them either from ignorance or from some other reason suffered themselves to be persuaded by an ignorant old barber of bellano that this sort of disease was not the pestilence but in some places the ordinary effects of the autumnal exhalations from the marshes and elsewhere of the privations and sufferings undergone during the passage of the german troops this affirmation was reported to the board who seemed to have been perfectly satisfied with it but additional reports of the mortality in every quarter pouring in without intermission two deputies were dispatched to see and provide against it the above-named tadino and an auditor of the committee when these arrived the evil had spread so widely that proofs offered themselves to their view without being sought for they passed through the territory of lecco the val Sassina, the shores of the lake of como and the district denominated il monte di brenaza and la guerra da ada and everywhere found the towns barricaded others almost deserted and the inhabitants escaped and encamped in the fields or scattered throughout the country who seemed says tadino like so many wild savages carrying in their hands one a sprig of mint another of rue another of rosemary another a bottle of vinegar they made inquiries as to the number of deaths which was really fearful they visited the sick and dead and everywhere recognized the dark and terrible marks of the pestilence they then speedily conveyed the disastrous intelligence by letter to the board of health who on receiving it on the thirtieth of october prepared says tadino to issue warrants to shut out of the city any persons coming from the countries where the plague had shown itself and while preparing the decree they gave some summary orders beforehand to the custom-house officers in the meanwhile the commissioners in great haste and precipitation made what provisions they knew or could think of for the best and returned with the melancholy consciousness of their insufficiency to remedy or arrest an evil already so far advanced and so widely disseminated on the fourteenth of november having made their report both by word of mouth and afresh in writing to the board they received from this committee a commission to present themselves to the governor and to lay before him the state of things they went accordingly and brought back word that he was exceedingly sorry to hear such news and had shown a great deal of feeling about it but the thoughts of war were more pressing said belli graviores ise curas so says ripamonti after having ransacked the records of the board of health and compared them with tadino who had been specially charged with this mission it was the second if the readers remember for this purpose and with this result two or three days afterwards the eighteenth of november the governor issued a proclamation in which he prescribed public rejoicing for the birth of the prince charles the first-born son of the king philip the fourth without thinking of or without caring for the danger of suffering a large concourse of people under such circumstances everything as in common times just as if he had never been spoken to about anything 
this person was as we have elsewhere said the celebrated ambroglio spinola sent for the very purpose of adjusting this war to repair the errors of don gonzalo and incidentally to govern and we may here incidentally mention that he died a few months later in that very war which he had so much at heart not wounded in the field of battle but on his bed of grief and anxiety occasioned by reproaches affronts and ill-treatment of every kind received from those whom he had served history has bewailed his fate and remarked upon the ingratitude of others it has described with much diligence his military and political enterprises and extolled his foresight activity and perseverance it might also have inquired what he did with all these when pestilence threatened and actually invaded a population committed to his care or rather entirely given up to his authority but that which leaving censure diminishes our wonder at his behaviour which even creates another and greater feeling of wonder is the behaviour of the people themselves of those i mean who unreached as yet by the contagion had so much reason to fear it on the arrival of the intelligence from the territories which were so grievously infected with it territories which formed almost a semicircular line round the city in some places not more than twenty or even eighteen miles distant from it who would not have thought that a general stir would have been created that they would have been diligent in taking precautions whether well or ill selected or at least have felt a barren disquietude nevertheless if in anything the records of the times agree it is in attesting that there was none of these the scarcity of the antecedent year the violence of the soldiery and their suffering of mind seems to them more than enough to account for the mortality and if any one had attempted in the streets shops and houses to throw out a hint of danger and mention the plague it would have been received with incredulous scoffs or angry contempt the same incredulity or to speak more correctly the same blindness and perversity prevailed in the senate in the council of the decurioni and in all the magistrates i find that cardinal federigo immediately on learning the first cases of a contagious sickness enjoined his priests in a pastoral letter among other things to impress upon the people the importance and obligation of making known every similar case and of delivering up any infected or suspected goods and this too may be reckoned among his praiseworthy peculiarities the board of health solicited precautions and cooperation it was all but in vain and in the board itself their solicitude was far from equalling the urgency of the case it was the two physicians as tadino frequently affirms and as appears still better from the whole context of his narrative who persuaded and deeply sensible of the gravity and imminence of the danger urged forward that body which was then to urge forward others we have already seen how on the first tidings of the plague there had been indifference and remissness in acting and even in obtaining information we now give another instance of dilatoriness not less portentous if indeed it was not compelled by obstacles interposed by the superior magistrates that proclamation in the form of warrants resolved upon on the thirtieth of october was not completed till the twenty-third of the following month nor published till the twenty-ninth the plague had already entered milan tadino and ripamonti would record the name of the individual who first brought it thither together with the other circumstances of the person and the fact and in truth in observing the beginnings of a widespread destruction which in the victims not only cannot be distinguished by name but their numbers can scarcely be expressed with any degree of exactness even by the thousand one feels a certain kind of interest in ascertaining those first and few names which could be noted and preserved it seems as if this sort of distinction a precedence in extermination invests them and all the other minutiae which would otherwise be most indifferent with something fatal and memorable 
but one and the other historian can say that it was an italian soldier in the spanish service but in nothing else do they agree not even in the name according to tadino it was a person of the name of pietro antonio lavato quartered in the territory of lecco according to ricamonti a certain pier paolo locati quartered at chiavenna they differ also as to the day of his entrance into milan the first placing it on the twenty second of october the second on the same day in the following month yet it cannot be on either one or the other both the dates contradict others which are far better authenticated yet ripamonti writing by order of the general council of the de curioni ought to have had many means at his command of gaining the necessary information and tadino in consideration of his office might have been better informed than any one else on the subject of this nature in short comparing other dates which as we have said appear to us more authentic it would seem that it was prior to the publication of the warrants and if it were worth while it might even be proved or near so that it must have been very early in that month but the reader will doubtless excuse us the task however it may be this soldier unfortunate himself and the bearer of misfortune to others entered the city with a large bundle of clothes purchased or stolen from the german troops he went to stay at the house of one of his relatives in the suburbs of the port oriental near to the capuchin convent scarcely had he arrived there when he was taken ill he was conveyed to the hospital here a spot discovered under one of the armpits excited some suspicion in the mind of the person who tended him of what was in truth the fact and on the fourth day he died the board of health immediately ordered his family to be kept separate and confined within their own house and his clothes and the bed on which he had lain at hospital were burned two attendants who had there nursed him and a good friar who had rendered him his assistance were all three within a few days seized with the plague the suspicions which had here been felt from the beginning of the nature of the disease and the precautions taken in consequence prevented the further spread of the contagion from this source but the soldier had left seed outside which delayed not to spring up and shoot forth the first person in whom it broke out was the master of the house where he had lodged one carlo colonna a lute player all the inmates of the dwelling were then by order of the board conveyed to the lazaretto where the greater number took to their beds and many shortly died of evident infection in the city that which had been already disseminated there by intercourse with the above-mentioned family and by clothes and furniture belonging to them preserved by relations lodgers or servants from the searches and the flames prescribed by the board as well as that which was afresh introduced by defectiveness in the regulations by negligence in executing them and by dexterity in eluding them continued lurking about and slowly insinuating itself among the inhabitants all the rest of the year and in the earlier months of sixteen thirty the year which followed from time to time now in this now in that quarter someone was seized with the contagion someone was carried off with it and the very infrequency of the cases contributed to lull all suspicions of pestilence and confirmed the generality more and more in the senseless and murderous assurance that plague it was not and never had been for a moment many physicians too echoing the voice of the people was it in this instance also the voice of heaven derided the ominous predictions and threatening warnings of the few 
and always had at hand the names of common diseases to qualify every case of pestilence which they were summoned to cure with what symptom or token soever it evinced itself the reports of these instances when they reached the board of health at all reached it for the most part tardily and uncertainly dread of sequestration and the lazaretto sharpened every one's wits they concealed the sick they corrupted the grave diggers and elders and obtained false certificates by means of bribes from subalterns of the board itself deputed by it to visit and inspect the dead bodies as however on every discovery they succeeded in making the board ordered the wearing apparel to be committed to the flames put the houses under sequestration and sent the inmates to the lazaretto it is easy to imagine what must have been the anger and dissatisfaction of the generality of the nobility merchants and lower orders persuaded as they were that they were mere causeless vexations without any advantage the principal odium fell upon the two doctors are frequently mentioned tadino and senatore setala son of the senior physician and reached such a height that thenceforward they could not publicly appear without being assailed with opprobrious language if not with stones and certainly the situation in which these individuals were placed for several months is remarkable and worthy of being recorded seeing a horrible scourge advancing towards them laboring by every method to repulse it and yet meeting with obstacles not only in the arduousness of the task but from every quarter in the unwillingness of the people and being made the general object of execration and regarded as the enemies of their country pro patria ostibus says ripamonti sharers also in the hatred were the other physicians who convinced like them of the reality of the contagion suggested precautions and sought to communicate to others their melancholy convictions the most knowing taxed them with credulity and obstinacy while with the many it was evidently an imposture a planned combination to make a profit by the public fears End of chapter 31, part 1 Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England Chapter 31, part 2 of The Betrothed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the Betrothed, or E Promesi Sposi, by Alessandro Manzoni, Chapter Thirty One, Part Two. The aged physician Ludovico Setala, who had almost attained his eightieth year, who had been professor of medicine in the University of Pavia, and afterwards of moral philosophy at Milan, the author of many works at that time in very high repute eminent for the invitations he had received to occupy the chairs of other universities ingolstadt pisa bologna and padua and for his refusal of all these honours was certainly one of the most influential men of his time to his reputation for learning was added that of his life and to admiration for his character a feeling of goodwill for his great kindness in curing and benefiting the poor yet there is one circumstance which in our minds disturbs and overclouds the sentiment of esteem inspired by these merits but which at that time must have rendered it stronger and more general the poor man participated in the commonest and most fatal prejudices of his contemporaries he was in advance of them but not distinguished from the multitude a station which only invites trouble and often causes the loss of an authority acquired by other means nevertheless that which he enjoyed in so great a degree 
was not only insufficient to overcome the general opinion on this subject of the pestilence but it could not even protect him from the animosity and the insults of that part of the populace which readily steps from opinions to their exhibition by actual deeds one day as he was going in a litter to visit his patients crowds began to assemble round him crying out that he was the head of those who were determined in spite of everything to make out that there was a plague that it was he who put the city in alarm with his gloomy brow and shaggy beard and all to give employment to the doctors the multitude and their fury went on increasing so that the bearers seeing their danger took refuge with their master in the house of a friend which fortunately happened to be at hand all this occurred to him for having foreseen clearly stated what was really the fact and wished to save thousands of his fellow creatures from the pestilence when having by his deplorable advice co-operated in causing a poor unhappy wretch to be put to the torture racked and burnt as a witch because one of her masters had suffered extraordinary pains in his stomach and another some time before had been desperately enamoured of her he had received from the popular voice additional reputation for wisdom and what is intolerable to think of the additional title of the well-deserving towards the latter end of march however sickness and deaths began rapidly to multiply first in the suburbs of the porta oriental and then in all the other quarters of the city with the unusual accompaniments of spasms palpitation lethargy delirium and those fatal symptoms livid spots and sores and these deaths were for the most part a rapid violent and not unfrequently sudden without any previous tokens of illness those physicians who were opposed to the belief of contagion unwilling now to admit what they had hitherto derided yet obliged to give a generical name to the new malady which had become too common and too evident to go without one adopted that of malignant or pestilential fevers a miserable expedient a mere play upon words which was productive of much harm because while it appeared to acknowledge the truth it only contributed to the disbelief of what it was most important to believe and discern viz that the infection was conveyed by means of the touch the magistrates like one awakening from a deep sleep began to lend a little more ear to the appeals and proposals of the board of health to support its proclamations and second the sequestrations prescribed and the quarantines enjoined by this tribunal the board was also constantly demanding money to provide for the daily expenses of the lazaretto now augmented by so many additional services and for this they applied to the decurioni while it being decided which was never done i believe except by practice whether such expenses should be charged to the city or to the royal exchequer the high chancellor also applied importunately to the de curione by order too of the governor who had again returned to lay siege to the unfortunate casale the senate likewise applied to them imploring them to see to the best method of victualling the city before they should be forbidden in the case of the unhappy dissemination of the contagion to have any intercourse with other countries and to find means of maintaining a large proportion of the population which was now deprived of employment the de curione endeavoured to raise money by loans and taxes and of what they thus accumulated they gave a little to the board of health a little to the poor purchased a little corn and thus in some degree supplied the existing necessity the severest sufferings had not yet arrived in the lazaretto where the population although decimated daily continued daily on the increase there was another arduous undertaking to ensure attendance and subordination to preserve the enjoined separations and to maintain in short or rather to establish the government prescribed by the board of health 
for from the very first everything had been in confusion from the ungovernableness of many of the inmates and the negligence or connivance of the officials the board of the de curione not knowing which way to turn bethought themselves of applying to the capuchins and besought the father commissary as he was called of the province who occupied the place of the father provincial lately deceased to give them a competent person to govern this desolate kingdom the commissary proposed to them as their governor one father felice cassati a man of advanced age who enjoyed a great reputation for charity activity and gentleness of disposition combined with a strong mind a character which as the sequel will show was well deserved and as his coadjutor and assistants one michele pozzo bonelli still a young man but grave and stern in mind as in countenance gladly enough were they accepted and on the thirtieth of march they entered the lazaretto the president of the board of health conducted them round as it were to put them in possession and having assembled the servants and officials of every rank proclaimed father felice in their presence governor of the place with primary and unlimited authority in proportion as the wretched multitude there assembled increased other capuchins resorted thither and here were superintendents confessors administrators nurses cooks overlookers of the wardrobe washerwomen in short everything that was required father felice ever diligent ever watchful went about day and night through the porticoes chambers and open spaces sometimes carrying a spear sometimes armed only with hair cloth he animated and regulated every duty pacified tumults settled disputes threatened punished reproved comforted dried and shed tears at the very outset he took the plague recovered and with fresher clarity resumed his first duties most of his brethren here sacrificed their lives and all joyfully such a dictatorship was certainly a strange expedient strange as was the calamity strange as were the times and even did we know more about it this alone would suffice as an argument as a specimen indeed of a rude and ill-regulated state of society but the spirit the deeds the self-sacrifice of these friars deserve no less than they should be mentioned with respect and tenderness and with that species of gratitude which one feels en masse as it were for the great services rendered by men to their fellows to die in a good cause is a wise and beautiful action at any time under any state of things whatsoever for had not ye fathers repaired hither says Torino, assuredly ye whole city would have been annihilated for it was a miraculous thing that ye fathers effected so much for ye public benefit in so short a space of time and receiving no assistance or at least very little from ye city contrived by their industry and prudence to maintain so many thousands of poor in ye lazaretto among the public also this obstinacy in denying the pestilence gave way naturally and gradually disappeared in proportion as the contagion extended itself and extended itself too before their own eyes by means of contact and intercourse and still more when after having been for some time confined to the lower orders it began to take effect upon the higher and among these as he was then the most eminent so by us now the senior physician Setala deserves express mention people must at least have said the poor old man was right but who knows he with his wife two sons and seven persons in his service all took the plague one of these sons and himself recovered the rest died these cases says tadino occurring in the city in the first families dispose the nobility and common people to think 
and the incredulous physicians and the ignorant and rash lower orders began to bite their lips grind their teeth and arch their eyebrows in amazement but the revolutions the reprisals the vengeance so to say of the contrived obstinacy are sometimes such as to raise a wish that it had continued unshaken and unconquered even to the last against reason and evidence and this was truly one of those occasions they who had so resolutely and perseveringly impugned the existence of a germ of evil near them or among them which might propagate itself by natural means and make much havoc unable now to deny its propagation and unwilling to attribute it to those means for this would have been to confess at once a great delusion and a great error were so much the more inclined to find some other cause for it and to make good any that might happen to present itself unhappily there was one in readiness in the ideas and traditions common to that time not only here but in every part of europe of magical arts diabolical practices people sworn to disseminate the plague by means of contagious poisons and witchcraft these and similar things had already been supposed and believed during many other plagues and at milan especially in that half a century before it may be added that even during the preceding year a despatch signed by king philip the fourth had been forwarded to the governor in which he was informed that four frenchmen had escaped from madrid who were sought upon suspicion of spreading poisonous and pestilential ointments and requiring to be on the watch perchance they should arrive at milan the governor communicated the dispatch to the senate and the board of health and thenceforward it seems they thought no more about it when however the plague broke forth and was recognized by all the return of this intelligence to memory may have served to confirm and support the vague suspicion of an iniquitous fraud it may even have been the first occasion of creating it but two actions one of blind and undisciplined fear the other of i know not what malicious mischief were what converted this vague suspicion of a possible attempt into more than suspicion and with many a certain conviction of a real plot some persons who fancied they had seen people on the evening of the seventeenth of may in the cathedral anointing a partition which was used to separate the spaces assigned to the two sexes had this partition and a number of benches enclosed within it brought out during the night although the president of the board of health having repaired thither with four members of his committee and having inspected the screen the benches and the stoops of holy water and found nothing that could confirm the ignorant suspicion of a poisonous attempt had declared to humour other people's fancies and rather to exceed in caution than from any conviction of necessity that it would be sufficient to have the partition washed this mass of piled up furniture produced a strong impression of consternation among the multitude to whom any object so readily became an argument it was said and generally believed that all the benches walls and even the bell ropes in the cathedral had been rubbed over with unctuous matter nor was this affirmed only at the time all the records of contemporaries some of them written after a lapse of many years which allude to this incident speak of it with equal certainty of asservation and we should be obliged to conjecture its true history did we not find it in a letter from the board of health to the governor preserved in the archives of san fedele from which we have extracted it and whence we have quoted the words we have written in italics next morning a new stranger and more significant spectacle struck the eyes and minds of the citizens in every part of the city they saw the doors and walls of the houses stained and daubed with long streaks of i know not what filthiness something yellowish and whitish spread over them as if with a sponge 
whether it were a base inclination to witness a more clamorous and more general consternation or a still more wicked design to augment the public confusion or whatever else it may have been the fact is attested in such a manner that it seems to us less rational to attribute it to a dream of the imagination than to a wickedly malicious trick not entirely new indeed to the wit of man not alas deficient in corresponding effects in every place so to say and every age Ripamonti, who frequently on this subject of the anointing ridicules and still more frequently deplores the popular credulity here affirms that he had seen this plastering and then describes it in the above quoted letter the gentlemen of the board of health relate the circumstances in the same terms they speak of inspections of experiments made with this matter upon dogs without any injurious effect and add that they believe such temerity proceeded rather from insolence than from any guilty design an opinion which evinces that up to this time they retain sufficient tranquillity of mind not to see what really did not exist other contemporary records not to reckon their testimony as to the truth of the fact signify at the same time that it was at first the opinion of many that this bespattering had been done in joke in a mere frolic none of them speak of any one who denied it and had there been any they certainly would have mentioned them were it only to call them irrational i have deemed it not out of place to relate and put together these particulars in part little known in part entirely unknown of a celebrated popular delirium because in errors and especially in the errors of a multitude what seems to me most interesting and most useful to observe is the course they have taken their appearances and the ways by which they could enter men's minds and hold sway there the city already tumultuously inclined was now turned upside down the owners of the houses with lighted straw burned at the besmeared spots and passers-by stopped gazed and shuddered murmured strangers suspected of this alone and at that time easily recognized by their dress were arrested by the people in the streets and consigned to prison here interrogations and examinations were made of captured captors and witnesses no one was found guilty men's minds were still capable of doubting weighing understanding the board of health issued a proclamation in which they promised reward and impunity to any one who would bring to light the author or authors of the deed in any wise not thinking it expedient say these gentlemen in the letter we have quoted which bears the date of the twenty first of may but which was evidently written on the nineteenth the day signified in the printed proclamation that this crime should by any means remain unpunished specially in times so perilous and suspicious we have for the consolation and peace of the people this day published an edict etc in the edict however there is no mention at least no distinct one of that rational and tranquillizing conjecture they had suggested to the governor a reservation which indicates at once a fierce prejudice in the people and in themselves a degree of obsequiousness so much the more blamable as the consequences might prove more pernicious while the board were thus making inquiries many of the public as is usually the case had already found the answer among those who believe this to be a poisonous ointment some were sure that it was an act of revenge by don gonzalo fernandez de cordoba for the insults received at his departure some that it was an idea of cardinal richelieu's to desolate milan and make himself the master of it without trouble others again it is not known with what motives would have it that the count Calato was the author of the plot or wallenstein or this or that milanese nobleman there wanted not to as we have said those who saw nothing in this occurrence but a mischievous jest and attributed it to the students to gentlemen 
to officers who were weary of the siege of Casale. It did not appear, however, as had been dreaded, that infection and universal slaughter immediately ensued. And this was probably the cause that this first fear began by degrees to subside, and the matter was, or seemed to be, forgotten. There was, after all, a certain number of persons not yet convinced that it was indeed the plague. And because, both in the lazaretto and in the city, some were restored to health, it was affirmed, the final arguments for an opinion contradicted by evidence are always curious enough, it was affirmed by the common people, and even yet by many partial physicians, that it was not really the plague, or all would have died. To remove every doubt, the Board of Health employed an expedient conformable to the necessity of the case, a means of speaking to the eye, such as the times may have required or suggested. On one of the festal days of Whitsuntide, the citizens were in the habit of flocking to the cemetery of San Gregorio, outside the Porta Orientale, to pray for the souls of those who had died in the former contagion, and whose bodies were there interred and borrowing from devotion an opportunity of amusement and sightseeing, everyone went thither in his best and gayest clothing. One whole family, amongst others, had this day died of the plague. At the hour of the thickest concourse, in the midst of the carriages, riders on horseback and foot passengers, the corpses of this family were, by order of the board, drawn naked on a car to the above-named burying ground in order that the crowd might behold in them the manifest token, the revolting seal and symptom of the pestilence. A cry of horror and consternation arose whenever the car was passing. A prolonged murmur was predominant where it had passed. Another murmur preceded it. The real existence of the plague was more believed. Besides, every day it continued to gain more belief by itself. And that very concourse would contribute not a little to propagate it. First, then, it was not the plague. Absolutely not, by no means. The very utterance of the term was prohibited. Then it was pestilential fevers. The idea was indirectly admitted in an adjective. Then it was not the true nor real plague, that is to say, it was the plague, but only in a certain sense not positively and undoubtedly the plague, but something to which no other name could be affixed. Lastly, it was the plague without doubt, without dispute. But even then another idea was appended to it, the idea of poison and witchcraft, which altered and confounded that conveyed in the word they could no longer repress. There is no necessity, I imagine, to be well versed in the history of words and ideas, to perceive that many others have followed a similar course. Heaven be praised that there have not been many of such a nature, and of so vast importance, which contradict their evidence at such a price, and to which accessories of such a character may be annexed. It is possible, however, both in great and trifling concerns, to avoid in great measure so lengthened and crooked a path by following the method which has so long been laid down of observing, listening, comparing, and thinking before speaking. But speaking, this one thing by itself, is so much easier than all the others put together, that even we, I say, we men in general, are somewhat to be pitied. End of chapter 31, part 2 Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Chapter 32, Part 1 of The Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small. The Betrothed by Alessandra Manzoni Chapter 32, Part 1 The difficulty of providing for the mournful exigencies of the times becoming daily greater, it was resolved on the 4th of May 
in the council of the Curioni, to have recourse for aid and favor to the governor, and, accordingly, on the twenty-second, two members of that body were dispatched to the camp, who represented to him the sufferings and poverty of the city, the enormous expenditure, the treasury exhausted and involved in debt, its future revenue in pledge, and the current taxes unpaid by reason of the general impoverishment produced by so many causes, and especially by the havoc of the military. They submitted to his consideration that, according to laws and customs which have never been repealed, and by a special decree of Charles V, the expenses of the pestilence ought to be defrayed from the king's exchequer, that, in the plague of 1576, the governor, the Marquis of Ayamonte, had not indeed remitted all the taxes of the chamber, but had relieved the city with forty thousand scudi from that same chamber. And finally they demanded four things. That, as once before already, the taxes should not be exacted. That the chamber should grant some supplies of money. That the governor should acquaint the king with the misery of the city and the territory. And that the duchy should be exempted from again quartering the military as it had been already wasted and destroyed by the former troops. Spinola gave in reply condolences and fresh exhortations. He said he was sorry he did not happen to be in the city, that he might use all his endeavors for its relief, but he hoped that all would be compensated for by the zeal of these gentlemen, that this was the time to expend without parsimony, and to do all they could by every means, and as to the express demands, he would provide for them in the best way the times and existing necessities would allow. Nor was there any further result. There were indeed more journeys to and fro, new requisitions and replies, but I do not find that they came to any more determinate conclusions. Some time later, when the plague was at its greatest height, the governor thought fit to transfer his authority, by letters patent, to the High Chancellor Ferrer, he having, as he said, to attend to the war. Together with this resolution, the de Curioni had also taken another, to request the Cardinal Archbishop to appoint a solemn procession, bearing through the city the body of San Carlo. The good prelate refused, for many reasons. This confidence in an arbitrary measure displeased him, and he feared that if the effect should not correspond to it, which he had also reason to fear, confidence would be converted into offense. He feared further that, if indeed there were poisoners about, the procession would afford too convenient opportunities for crime. If there were not, such a concourse of itself should not fail to disseminate the contagion more widely, a danger far more real. For the suppressed suspicions of poisonous ointments had, meanwhile, revived more generally and more violently than ever. People had again seen or this time they fancied they had seen anointed walls, entrances to public buildings, doors of private houses, and knockers. The news of these discoveries flew from mouth to mouth, and, as it happens even more than usual in great prepossessions, the report produced the same effect that the sight of it would have done. The minds of the populace, ever more and more embittered by the actual presence of suffering, and irritated by the pertinacity of the danger, Embrace this belief the more willingly, for anger burns to execute its revenge, and would rather attribute evils to human wickedness, upon which it might vent its tormenting energies, than acknowledge them from a source which leaves no other remedy than resignation. A subtle, instantaneous, exceedingly penetrating poison were words more than enough to explain the virulence, and all other most mysterious and unusual accompaniments of the contagion. It was said that this venom was composed of toads, of serpents, of saliva and matter from infected persons, of worse still, of everything, in short, that wild and perverse fancy could invent, which was foul and atrocious. To these was added witchcraft, by which any effect became possible, every objection lost its force, every difficulty was resolved. If the anticipated effects had not immediately followed upon the first anointing, the reason was now clear. It had been the imperfect attempt of novices in the art of sorcery. Now it was more matured, 
and the wills of the perpetrators were more bent upon their infernal project. Now, had any one still maintained that it had been a mere trick, had any one still denied the existence of a conspiracy, he would have passed for a deluded or obstinate person, if, indeed, he would not have fallen under the suspicion of being interested in diverting public scrutiny from the truth, of being an accomplice, a poisoner. The term very soon became common, solemn, tremendous. With such a persuasion that poisoners there were, some must almost infallibly be discovered. All eyes were on the lookout. Every act might excite jealousy, and jealousy easily became certainty, and certainty fury. Ripamonti relates two instances, informing us that he had selected them not as the most outrageous among the many which daily occurred, but because, unhappily, he could speak of both as an eyewitness. On the day of I know not what solemnity, an old man more than eighty years of age was observed, after kneeling in prayer, to sit down, first, however, dusting the bench with his cloak. "'That old man is anointing the benches!' exclaimed with one voice some women who witnessed the act. The people who happened to be in church, in church, fell upon the old man. They tore his gray locks, heaped upon him blows and kicks, and dragged him out half dead to convey him to prison, to the judges, to torture. I beheld him dragged along in this way, says Ripamonti, nor could I learn anything further about his end, but indeed I think he could not have survived many moments. The other instance, which occurred the following day, was equally strange, but not equally fatal. Three French lads in company, one a scholar, one a painter, and the third a mechanic, who had come to see Italy, to study its antiquities, and to try and make money, had approached I know not exactly what part of the exterior of the cathedral, and stood attentively surveying it. One, two, or more passers-by stopped and formed a little group, to contemplate and keep their eye on these visitors, whom their costume, their headdress, and their wallets proclaimed to be strangers, and what was worse, Frenchmen. As if to assure themselves that it was marble, they stretched out their hands to touch it. This was enough. They were surrounded, seized, tormented, and urged by blows to prison. Fortunately, the Hall of Justice was not far from the cathedral, and by still greater good fortune they were found innocent and set at liberty. Nor did such things happen only in the city. The frenzy had spread like the contagion. The traveller who was met by peasants out of the highway or on the public road was seen loitering and amusing himself, or stretched upon the ground to rest. The stranger in whom they fancied they saw something singular and suspicious in countenance or dress, these were poisoners. At the first report of whomsoever it might be, even at the cry of a child, the alarm was given, and the people flocked together. The unhappy victims were pelted with stones, or if taken were violently dragged to prison, and the prison, up to a certain period, became a haven of safety. But the decurioni, not discouraged by the refusal of the judicious prelate, continued to repeat their entreaties, which were noisily seconded by the popular vote. The bishop persevered for some time, and endeavored to dissuade them. So much and no more could the discretion of one man do against the judgment of the times, and the pertinacity of the many. In this state of opinion, with the idea of danger, confused as it was at that period, disputed, and very far from possessing the evidence which we have for it, it will not be difficult to comprehend how his good reasons might, even in his own mind, be overcome by the bad ones of others. Whether besides, in his subsequent concession, a feebleness of will had or had not any share, is a mystery of the human heart. Certainly, if, in any case, it be possible to attribute error wholly to the intellect, and to relieve the conscience of responsibility, it is when one treats of those rare persons, and assuredly the cardinal was one of that number, throughout whose whole life is seen a resolute obedience to conscience, 
without regard to temporal interests of any kind. On the repetition of the entreaties, then, he yielded, gave his consent to the procession, and further, to the desire, the general eagerness, that the urn which contained the relics of San Carlo should afterwards remain exposed for eight days to the public concourse on the high altar of the cathedral. I do not find that the Board of Health or the other authorities made any opposition or remonstrance of any kind. The above-named board merely ordered some precautions, which, without obviating the danger, indicated their apprehension of it. They gave more strict regulations about the admission of persons into the city, and to ensure the execution of them kept all the gates shut, as also, in order to exclude from the concourse as far as possible the infected and suspected, they caused the doors of the condemned houses to be nailed up, which, so far as the bare assertion of a writer, and a writer of those times, is to be valued in such matters, amounted to about five hundred. Three days were spent in preparations, and on the eleventh of June, which was the day fixed, the procession started by early dawn from the cathedral. A long file of people led the way, chiefly women, their faces covered with ample silken veils, and many of them barefoot, and clothed in sackcloth. Then followed bands of artificers, preceded by their several banners, the different fraternities, and habits of various shades and colors. Then came the brotherhoods of monks, then the secular clergy, each with the insignia of his rank, and bearing a lighted wax taper. In the center, amidst the brilliancy of still more numerous torches, and the louder tones of the chanting, came the coffin, under a rich canopy, supported alternately by four cannons, most pompously attired. Through the crystal sides appeared the venerated corpse, the limbs enveloped in splendid pontifical robes, and the skull covered with a mitre, and under the mutilated and decomposed features some traces might still be distinguished of his former countenance, such as it was represented in pictures, and as some remembered seeing and honoring it during his life. Behind the mortal remains of the deceased pastor, says Ripamonti, from which we chiefly have taken this description, and near him in person, as well as in merit, blood, and dignity, came the Archbishop Federigo. Then followed the rest of the clergy, and close behind them the magistrates, in their best robes of office, after them the nobility, some sumptuously apparelled, as for a solemn celebration of worship, others in token of humiliation, clothed in mourning, or walking barefoot, covered with sackcloth, and the hoods drawn over their faces, all bearing large torches. A mingled crowd of people brought up the rear. The whole street was decked out as at a festival. The rich had brought out their most showy decorations, the fronts of the poorer houses were ornamented by the wealthier neighbors, or at the public expense. Here and there, instead of ornaments, or over the ornaments themselves, were leafy branches of trees. Everywhere were suspended pictures, mottoes, and emblematical devices. On the window ledges were displayed vases, curiosities of antiquity, and valuable ornaments, and in every direction were torches. At many of these windows the sick, who were put under sequestration, beheld the pomp, and mingled their prayers with those of the passengers. The other streets were silent and deserted, save where some few listened at windows to the floating murmur in the distance, while others, and among these even nuns might be seen, mounted on the roofs, perchance they might be able to distinguish afar off the coffin, the retinue, in short, something. The procession passed through all quarters of the city. At each of the crossways, or small squares, which terminate the principal streets in the suburbs, and which then preserved the ancient name of Karobi, now reduced only to one, they made a halt, depositing the coffin near the cross, which had been erected in every one by San Carlo during the preceding pestilence, some of which are still standing, so that they returned not to the cathedral, till considerably past midday. But, lo, the day following, just while the presumptuous confidence, nay, in many the fanatical assurance, prevailed, 
that the procession must have cut short the progress of the plague. The mortality increased in every class, in every part of the city, to such a degree and with so sudden a leap that there was scarcely any one who did not behold in the very procession itself the cause and occasion of this fearful increase. But, oh, wonderful and melancholy force of popular prejudices, the greater number did not attribute this effect to so great and so prolonged a crowding together of persons, nor to the infinite multiplication of fortuitous contact, but rather to the facilities afforded to the poisoners of executing their iniquitous designs on a large scale. It was said that, mixing in the crowd, they had infected with their ointment everybody they had encountered. But as this appeared neither a sufficient nor appropriate means for producing so vast a mortality, which extended itself to every rank, as apparently it had not been possible even for an eye the most watchful and the most quick-sighted from suspicion, to detect any unctuous matter or spots of any kind during the march, recourse was had for the explanation of the fact to the other fabrication, already ancient, and received at that time in the common scientific learning of Europe, of magical and venomous powders. It was said that these powders, scattered along the streets, and chiefly at the places of halting, had clung to the trains of the dresses, and still more to the feet of those who had that day, in great numbers, gone about barefoot. That very day, therefore, of the procession, says a contemporary writer, saw piety contending with iniquity perfidy with sincerity, and loss with acquisition. It was, on the contrary, poor human sense contending with the phantoms it had itself created. From that day the contagion continued to rage with increasing violence. In a little while there was scarcely a house left untouched, and the population of the lazaretto, according to Samaglia above quoted, amounted to from two to twelve thousand. In the course of time, according to almost all reports, it reached sixteen thousand. On the fourth of July, as I find in another letter from the Conservators of Health to the Governor, the daily mortality exceeded five hundred. Still later, when the plague was at its height, it reached, and for some time remained, at twelve to fifteen hundred, according to the most common computation, and, if we may credit Tadino, it sometimes even exceeded three thousand five hundred. It may be imagined what must now have been the difficulties of the decurioni, upon whom was laid the burden of providing for the public necessities, and repairing what was still reparable in such a calamity. They were obliged every day to replace, every day to augment, public officers of numerous kinds, monati, by which denomination even then at Milan of ancient date and uncertain origin, were designated those who were devoted to the most painful and dangerous services of a pestilence, by taking corpses from the houses, out of the streets, and from the lazaretto, transporting them on carts to the graves, and burying them, carrying or conducting the sick to the lazaretto, overlooking them there, and burning and cleansing infected or suspected goods. Apparatori, whose special office it was to precede the carts, warning passengers by the sound of a little bell to retire, and the commissari, who superintended both the other classes under the immediate orders of the Board of Health. The council had also to keep the lazaretto furnished with physicians, surgeons, medicines, food, and all the other necessaries of an infirmary, and to provide and prepare new quarters for the newly arising needs. For this purpose they had cabins of wood and straw, hastily constructed in the unoccupied space within the lazaretto, and another lazaretto was erected, also of thatched cabins, with an enclosure of boards capable of containing four thousand persons. These not being sufficient, two others were decreed. They even began to build them, but, from the deficiency of means of every kind, they remained uncompleted. Means, men, and courage failed, in proportion as the necessity for them increased, and not only did the execution fall so short of the projects and decrees, not only were many too clearly acknowledged necessities deficiently provided for, even in words, but they arrived at such a 
pitch of impotency and desperation that many of the most deplorable and urgent cases were left without succor of any kind. A great number of infants, for example, died of absolute neglect, their mothers having been carried off by the pestilence. The Board of Health proposed that a place of refuge should be founded for these and for destitute lying-in women, that something might be done for them, but they could obtain nothing. The decurioni of the city, says Tadino, were no less to be pitied, who found themselves harassed and oppressed by the soldiery, without any bounds or regard whatsoever, as well as those of the unfortunate duchy, seeing that they could get no help or provision from the governor, because it happened to be a time of war, and they must needs treat the soldiery well. So important was the taking of Casali, so glorious appeared the fame of victory, independent of the cause of the object for which they contended. So also an ample but solitary grave which had been dug near the lazaretto, being completely filled with corpses, and fresh bodies which became day by day more numerous, remaining therefore in every direction, unburied. The magistrates, after having in vain sought for hands to execute the melancholy task, were compelled to acknowledge that they knew not what course to pursue. Nor was it easy to conjecture what would be the end, had not extraordinary relief been afforded. The President of the Board of Health solicited it almost in despair, and with tears in his eyes, from those two excellent friars who presided at the lazaretto, and Father Michel pledged himself to clear the city of dead bodies in the course of four days. At the expiration of eight days he had not only provided for the immediate necessity, but for that also which the most ominous foresight could have anticipated for the future. With a friar for his companion, and with officers granted him for this purpose by the President, he set off out of the city in search of peasants, and partly by the authority of the Board of Health, partly by the influence of his habit and his words, he succeeded in collecting two hundred, whom he distributed in three separate places to dig the ample graves. He then dispatched Manati from the lazaretto to collect the dead, and on the day appointed his promise was fulfilled. On one occasion the lazaretto was left destitute of physicians, and it was only by offers of large salaries and honors, with much labor, and considerable delay that they could procure them, and even then their number was far from sufficient for the need. It was often so reduced in provisions as to raise fears that the inmates would actually have to die of starvation, and more than once, while they were trying every method of raising money or supplies, with scarcely a hope of procuring them, not to say of procuring them in time, abundant assistance would most opportunely be afforded by the unexpected gift of some charitable private individual. For, in the midst of the common stupefaction and indifference to others, arising from continual apprehensions for themselves, there were yet hearts ever awake to the call of charity, and others in whom charity first sprang up on the failure of all earthly pleasures, as in the destruction and flight of many whose duty it was to superintend and provide, there were others, ever healthy in body, and unshaken in courage, who were always at their posts. While some there even were who, urged by compassion, assumed, and perseveringly sustained, cares to which their office did not call them. End of chapter 32, part 1Chapter thirty two Part two of the Betrothed This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small The Betrothed by Alessandra Manzoni Chapter thirty two Part two the most general and most willing fidelity to the trying duties of the times was conspicuously evinced by the clergy in the lazarettos and throughout the city their assistance never failed where suffering was there were they they were always to be seen mingled with and interspersed among the faint and dying 
faint and dying sometimes themselves. Together with spiritual suckers, they were lavish, as far as they could be, of temporal ones, and freely rendered whatever services happened to be required. More than sixty parish priests in the city alone died of the contagion, about eight out of every nine. Federigo, as was to be expected of him, gave to all encouragement and example. Having seen almost the whole of his archiepiscopal household perish around him, solicited by relatives, by the first magistrates, and by the neighboring princes to withdraw from danger to some solitary country seat, he rejected this counsel and entreaties in the spirit with which he wrote to his clergy, Be ready to abandon this mortal life, rather than the family, the children, committed to us. Go forward into the plague as to life as to a reward, when there is one soul to be won to Christ. He neglected no precautions which did not impede him in his duty, on which point he also gave instructions and regulations to his clergy, and at the same time he minded not, nor appeared to observe, danger where it was necessary to encounter it, in order to do good. Without speaking of the ecclesiastics whom he was constantly with, to commend and regulate their zeal, to arouse such as were lukewarm in the work, and to send them to the posts where others had perished. It was his wish that there should always be free access for any one who had need of him. He visited the lazarettos, to administer consolation to the sick, and encouragement to the attendants. He traversed the city, carrying relief to the poor creatures sequestrated in their houses, stopping at the doors and under the windows to listen to their lamentations, and to offer an exchange words of comfort and encouragement. In short, he threw himself into, and lived in the midst of the pestilence, and was himself astonished at the end that he had come out uninjured. Thus, in public calamities, and in long-continued disturbances of settled habits, of whatever kind, there may always be beheld an augmentation, a sublimation of virtue. But alas! There is never wanting at the same time an augmentation, far more general in most cases, of crime. This occasion was remarkable for it. The villains, whom the pestilence spared and did not terrify, found in the common confusion, and in the relaxation of all public authority, a new opportunity of activity, together with new assurances of impunity, nay, the administration of public authority itself came, in a great measure, to be lodged in the hands of the worst among them. Generally speaking, none devoted themselves to the offices of monati and apparatori, but men over whom the attractions of rapine and license had more influence than the terror of contagion, or any natural object of horror. The strictest orders were laid upon these people the severest penalties threatened to them. Stations were assigned them, and commissaries, as we have already said, placed over them. Over both, again, magistrates and nobles were appointed in every district, with authority to enforce good government summarily on every opportunity. Such a state of things went on and took effect up to a certain period. But with the increase of deaths and desolation, and the terror of the survivors, these officers came to be exempted from all supervision. They constituted themselves, the Monati especially, arbiters of everything. They entered the houses like masters, like enemies, and not to mention their plunder, and how they treated the unhappy creatures reduced by the plague to pass through such hands. They laid them, these infected and guilty hands, on the healthy, children, parents, husbands, wives, threatening to drag them to the lazaretto, unless they redeemed themselves, or were redeemed with money. At other times they set a price upon their service, refusing to carry away bodies already corrupted for less than so many scudi. It was believed, and between the credulity of one party and the wickedness of the other, belief and disbelief are equally uncertain. It was believed, and Tadino asserts it, that both Monati and Apparatori purposely let fall from their carts infected clothes, in order to propagate and keep up the pestilence, which had become to them a means of living, a kingdom. 
a festival. Other wretches, feigning to be Minotti, and carrying little bells tied to their feet, as these officers were required to do, to distinguish themselves and to give warning of their approach, introduced themselves into houses, and there exercised all kinds of tyranny. Some of these, open and void of inhabitants, or inhabited only by a feeble or dying creature, were entered by thieves in search of booty, with impunity. Others were surprised and invaded by bailiffs, who there committed robberies and excesses of every description. Together with the wickedness, the folly of the people increased. Every prevailing error received more or less additional force from the stupefaction and agitation of their minds, and was more widely and more precipitately applied, while every one served to strengthen and aggravate that special mania about poisonings, which, in its effects and ebullitions, was often, as we have seen, itself another crime. The image of this supposed danger beset and tortured the minds of the people far more than the real and existing danger. And while, says Ripamonti, corpses scattered here and there, or lying in heaps ever before the eyes and surrounding the steps of the living, made the whole city like one immense sepulchre. A still more appalling symptom, a more intense deformity, was their mutual animosity, their licentiousness, and their extravagant suspicions. Not only did they mistrust a friend, a guest, but those names which are the bonds of human affection, husband and wife, father and son, brother and brother, were words of terror and dreadful and infamous to tell. The domestic board, the nuptial bed, were dreaded as lurking places, as receptacles of poison. The imaginary vastness and strangeness of the plot distracted people's understandings and subverted every reason for reciprocal confidence. Besides ambition and cupidity, which were at first supposed to be the motives of the poisoners they fancied, they even believed at length that there was something of diabolical, voluptuous delight in this anointing, an attraction predominating over the will. The ravings of the sick, who accused themselves of what they apprehended from others, were considered as revelations, and rendered anything, so to say, credible of any one, and it would have far greater weight even than words, if it happened that delirious patients kept practicing those maneuvers which it was imagined must be employed by the poisoners, a thing at once very probable, and tending to give better grounds for the popular persuasion and the assertions of numerous writers. In the same way, during the long and mournful period of judicial investigation on the subject of witchcraft, the confessions, and those not always exhorted of the accused, serve not a little to promote and uphold the prevailing opinion on this matter. For when an opinion obtains a prolonged and extensive sway, it is expressed in every manner, tries every outlet, and runs through every degree of persuasion, and it is difficult for all, or very many, to believe for a length of time that something extraordinary is being done without someone coming forward who believes that he has done it. Among the stories which this mania about poisoning gave rise to, one deserves to be mentioned for the credit it acquired and the extended dissemination it met with. It was related not, however, by everybody in the same way, for that would be too remarkable a privilege for stories, but nearly so, that such a person, on such a day, had seen a carriage and six standing in the square of the cathedral, containing some great personage with a large suite of lordly aspect, but dark and sunburnt, with fiery eyes, hair standing on end, and a threatening expression about the mouth. The spectator, invited to enter the equipage, complied, and after taking a turn or two, stopped and dismounted at the gate of a palace where, entering with the rest, he beheld horrors and delights, deserts and gardens, caverns and halls, and in these were phantoms seated in council. Lastly, huge chests of money were shown to him, and he was told that he might take as much as he liked, if, at the same time, he would accept a little vessel of unctuous matter, and go about anointing with it 
through the city. Having refused to agree to the terms, he instantly found himself in the place whence he had been taken. This story, generally believed there by the people, and according to Ripamonti, not sufficiently ridiculed by many learned men, traveled through the whole of Italy, and even further. An engraving of it was made in Germany, and the electoral archbishop of Mainz wrote to Cardinal Federigo, to ask what he must believe of the wonderful prodigies related at Milan, and received for answer that they were mere dreams. Of equal value, if not exactly of the same nature, were the dreams of the learned, and equally disastrous were they in their effects. Most of them saw the announcement at once and cause of their troubles in a comet which appeared in the year 1628, and in a conjunction of Saturn with Jupiter, the aforesaid conjunction, writes Tadino, inclining so clearly over the year 1630, that every body could understand it. This prediction, fabricated I know not when, nor by whom, was upon the tongue, as Ripamonti informs us, of everybody who was able to utter it. Another comet, which unexpectedly appeared in the June of the very year of the pestilence, was looked upon as a fresh warning as an evident proof, indeed, of the anointing. They ransacked books, and found only in too great abundance examples of pestilence produced, as they said, by human efforts. They quoted Livy, Tacitus, Dionysus, Homer, and Ovid, and the numberless other ancients who have related or alluded to similar events. And of modern writers they had a still greater abundance. They cited a hundred other authors who have treated theoretically or incidentally spoken of poisons, sorceries, unctions, and powders. Cesalpino was quoted, Cardano, Gravino, Salio, Pareo, Scencio, Zacchia, and finally that fatal Del Rio, who, if the renown of authors were in proportion to the good or evil produced by their works, would assuredly be one of the most eminent. That Del Rio, whose disquisitions on magic, a digest of all that men up to this time had wildly devised on the subject, received as the most authoritative and irrefragable textbook was, for more than a century, the rule and powerful impulse of legal, horrible, and uninterrupted murders. From the inventions of the illiterate vulgar, educated people borrowed what they could accommodate to their ideas. From the inventions of the educated, the vulgar, borrowed what they could understand, and as best they could. And of all, an undigested, barbarous jumble was formed of public irrationality. But that which still further excites our surprise is to see the physicians. Those physicians, I say, who from the beginning had believed in the plague, and especially to Dino, who had predicted it, beheld it enter, and kept his eye on its progress who had affirmed and published that it was the plague, and was propagated by contact, and that if no opposition were made to it, it would become a general infection. To see him, I say, draw a certain argument from these very consequences, for poisonous and magical unctions, to behold him who in Carlo Colonna, the second that died in Milan, had marked delirium as an accompaniment of the malady, afterwards adduce in proof of unctions and a diabolical plot an incident such as this. Two witnesses deposed to having heard one of their friends under the influence of the contagion relate how some persons came one night into his room to proffer him health and riches if he would anoint the houses in the vicinity, and how, on his repeated refusal, they had taken their departure and left in their stead a wolf under the bed and three great cats upon it, which remained there till break of day. Had such a method of drawing conclusions been confined to one individual, it might have been attributed to his own extreme simplicity and want of common sense, and it would not have been worth our while to mention it. But as it was received by many, it is a specimen of the human mind, and may serve to show how a well-regulated and reasonable train of ideas may be disordered by another train of ideas thrown directly across it. In other respects, this Tadino was one of the most renowned men of his time at Milan. Two illustrious and high-deserving writers have asserted that Cardinal Federigo 
entertained some doubt about these poisonings. We would gladly give still more complete commendation to the memory of this excellent and benevolent man, and represent the good prelate in this, as in many other things, distinguished from the multitude of his contemporaries. But we are constrained instead to remark on him another example of the powerful influence of public opinion, even on the most exalted minds. It is evidence, from the way at least in which Ripamonti relates his thoughts on the subject, that from the beginning he had some doubts about it, and throughout he always considered that credulity, ignorance, fear, and a wish to excuse their long negligence in guarding against the contagion, had a considerable share in this opinion, that there was a good deal of exaggeration in it, but at the same time something of truth. There is a small work on this pestilence, written by his own hand, preserved in the Ambrosian Library, and the following is one among many instances where such a sentiment is expressed. On the method of compounding and spreading such poisonous ointments, many and various things are reported, some of which we consider as true, while others appear to us entirely imaginary. Some there were, who to the very last, and even afterwards, thought that it was all imagination, and we learn this not from themselves, for no one had ever sufficient hardihood to expose to the public an opinion so opposed to that of the public, but from those writers who deride it, or rebuke it, or confute it, as the prejudice of a few, an error which no one had ever dared to make the subject of open dispute, but which nevertheless existed. And we learnt it, too, from one who had derived it from tradition. I have met with sensible and well-informed people in Milan, says the good Moratori, in the above-quoted passage, who had received trustworthy accounts from their ancestors, and who were by no means persuaded of the truth of the facts concerning these poisonous ointments. It seems there was a secret outlet for truth. Some remaining domestic confidence, good sense still existed, but it was kept concealed for fear of the popular sense. The magistrates, reduced in number daily, and disheartened and perplexed in everything, turned all their little vigilance, all the little resolution of which they were any longer capable, in search of these poisoners, and too easily did they think they had found them. The judicial sentences which followed in consequence were not certainly the first of such nature, nor indeed can they be considered as uncommon in the history of jurisprudence, for, to say nothing of antiquity, and to mention only some instances and times, more nearly approaching those of which we are treating. In Palermo, in 1526, in Geneva, in 1530, afterwards in 1545, and again in 1574, in Casale Monferrato, in 1536, in Padua, in 1555, in Turin, in 1599, and again in Turin, this same year, 1630. Here, many unhappy creatures were tried, and condemned to punishments the most atrocious, as guilty of having propagated the plague by means of powders, ointments, witchcraft, or all these together. But the affair of the so-called anointings at Milan, as it was, perhaps, the longest remembered and the most widely talked of, so perhaps it is most worthy of observation, or, to speak more exactly, there is further room to make observations upon it, from the remaining existence of more circumstantial and more extensive documents. And although a writer we have, not long ago commended, has employed himself on them, yet his object having been not so much to give the history, properly speaking, as to exact thence political suggestions, for a still more worthy and important purpose, it seemed to us that the history of the plague might form the subject of a new work but it is not a matter to be passed over in a few words, and to treat it with the copiousness it deserves would carry us too far beyond our limits. Besides, after we should have paused upon all these incidents, the reader would certainly no longer care to know those that remain in our narrative, reserving therefore for another publication the account of the former. We will at length return to our characters, not to leave them again, till we reach the end. End of chapter 32, part 2
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni Chapter 33, Part 1 One night, toward the end of August, exactly during the very height of the pestilence, Don Rodrigo returned to his residence at Milan, accompanied by the faithful Griso, one of the three or four who remained to him out of his whole household. He was returning from a company of friends, who were accustomed to assemble at a banquet, to divert the melancholy of the times, and on each occasion some new friends were there, some old ones missing. That day he had been one of the merriest of the party, and among other things had excited a great deal of laughter among the company by a kind of funeral eulogium on the Count Attilio, who had been carried off by the plague two days before. In walking home, however, he felt a languor, a depression, a weakness in his limbs, a difficulty of breathing, and an inward burning heat which he would willingly have attributed entirely to the wine, to late hours, to the season. He uttered not a syllable the whole way, and the first word was when they reached the house to order Griso to light him to his room. When they were there, Griso observed the wild and heated look of his master's face, his eyes almost starting from their sockets, and peculiarly brilliant. He kept, therefore, at a distance, for in these circumstances every ragamuffin was obliged to look for himself, as the saying is, with a medical eye. "'I'm well, you see,' said Don Rodrigo, who read in Griso's action the thoughts which were passing in his mind. "'I'm very well, but I've taken—I've taken perhaps a little too much drink. That was some capital wine, but with a good night's sleep it will go off. I'm very sleepy. Take that light away from before my eyes. It dazzles me. It teases me. It's all the effects of the wine, said Griso, still keeping a distance. But lie down quickly, for sleep will do you good. You're right, if I can sleep. After all, I'm well enough. Put that little bell close to my bed if I should want anything in the night and be on the watch, you know, perchance you should hear me ring. But I shan't want anything. Take away that cursed light directly, resumed he, while Griso executed the order, approaching him as little as possible. The— It plagues me excessively. Griso then took the light, and wishing his master a good night, took a hasty departure, while Rodrigo buried himself under the bedclothes. But the counterpane seemed to him like a mountain— he threw it off and tried to compose himself to rest, for in fact he was dying of sleep. But scarcely had he closed his eyes when he awoke again with a start, as if some wickedly disposed person were giving him a shake, and he felt an increase of burning heat, an increase of delirium. His thoughts recurred to the season, the wine in his debauchery. He would gladly have given them the blame of all, but there was constantly substituted of his own accord for these ideas that which was then associated with all, which entered, so to say, by every sense, which had been introduced into all the conversations at the banquet, since it was much easier to turn it into ridicule than to get out of its reach, the pestilence. After a long battle he at length fell asleep, and began to dream the most gloomy and disquieting dreams in the world. He went on from one thing to another, till he seemed to find himself in a large church, in the first ranks, in the midst of a great crowd of people. There he was wondering how he had got there, how the thought had ever entered his head, particularly at such a time, and he felt in his heart excessively vexed. He looked at the bystanders. They had all pale, emaciated countenances, with staring and glistening eyes and hanging lips. Their garments were tattered and falling to pieces, and through the rents appeared livid spots and swellings. "'Make room, you rabble!' he fancied he cried, looking toward the door, which was far, far away, and accompanying the cry with a threatening expression of countenance, but without moving a limb, nay, even drawing up his body to avoid coming in contact with those polluted creatures who crowded only too closely upon him on every side. But not one of the senseless beings seemed to move, nor even to have heard him, nay, they pressed still more upon him, Above all, it felt as if some one of them, with his elbow, or whatever it might be, was pushing against his left side, between the heart and the armpit, where he felt a painful and, as it were, heavy pressure. 
and if he writhed himself to get rid of this uneasy feeling, immediately a fresh unknown something began to prick him in the very same place. Enraged, he attempted to lay his hand on his sword, and then it seemed as if the thronging of the multitude had raised it up level with his chest, and that it was the hilt of it which pressed so in that spot. And the moment he touched it, he felt a still sharper stitch. He cried out, panted, and would have uttered a still louder cry, when, behold, all these faces turned in one direction. He looked the same way, perceived a pulpit, and saw, slowly rising above its edge, something round, smooth, and shining, then rose, and distinctly appeared, a bald head, then two eyes, a face, and a long white beard, and then the upright figure of a friar, visible above the sides, down to the girdle. It was Friar Cristoforo. Darting a look around upon his audience, he seemed to Don Rodrigo to fix his gaze on him, and at the same time raising his hand in exactly the attitude he had assumed in the room on the ground floor in his palace. Don Rodrigo then himself lifted up his hand in fury, and made an effort as if to throw himself forward and grasp that arm extended in the air. A voice, which had been vainly and secretly struggling in his throat, burst forth in a great howl, and he awoke. He dropped the arm he had in reality uplifted, strove, with some difficulty, to recover the right meaning of everything, for the light of the already advanced day gave him no less uneasiness than that of the candle had done, recognized his bed and his chamber, understood that all had been a dream. The church, the people, the friar, all had vanished, all but one thing, that pain in his left side. Together with this he felt a frightful acceleration of palpitation at heart, a noise and humming in his ears, a raging fire within, and a weight in all his limbs, worse than when he lay down. He hesitated a little before looking at the spot that pained him. At length he uncovered it and glanced at it with a shudder. There was a hideous spot of a livid purple hue. The man saw himself lost. The terror of death seized him and with perhaps still stronger feeling, terror of becoming the prey of the monadi, of being carried off, of being thrown into the lazaretto, and as he deliberated on the way of avoiding this horrible fate, he felt his thoughts become more perplexed and obscure. He felt the moment drawing near that would leave him only consciousness enough to reduce him to despair. He grasped the bell and shook it violently. Griso, who was on the alert, immediately answered its summons. He stood at some distance from the bed, gazed attentively at his master, and was at once convinced of what he had conjectured the night before. Griso, said Don Rodrigo with difficulty, raising himself and sitting up in his bed, you have always been my trusty servant. Yes, Signor. I have always dealt well by you. Of your bounty. The... I am ill, Griso. I had perceived it. If I recover... I will heap upon you more favors than I have ever yet done. Griso made no answer, and stood waiting to see to what all these preambles would lead. I will not trust myself to anybody but you, resumed Don Rodrigo. Do me a kindness, Griso. Command me, said he, replying with this usual formula to that unusual one. Do you know where the surgeon Chiodo lives? I know very well. He is a worthy man, who, if he is paid— will conceal the sick. Go and find him. Tell him I will give him four, six scudi a visit, more if he demands more. Tell him to come here directly, and do the thing cleverly so that nobody may observe it. Well thought of, said Griso. I go, and return. Listen, Griso, give a drop of water first. I am so parched with thirst, I can bear it no longer. Signor, no, replied Griso, nothing without the doctor's leave. These are ticklish complaints. There is no time to be lost. Keep quiet. In the twinkling of an eye, I'll be here with Giotto. So saying, he went out, impatiently shutting the door behind him. Don Rodrigo lay down and accompanied him in imagination to Giotto's house, counting the steps, calculating the time. Now and then he would turn to look at his left side, but quickly averted his face with a shudder. After some time he began to listen eagerly for the surgeon's arrival and this effort of attention suspended his sense of illness, and kept his thoughts in some degree of order. 
All of a sudden he heard a distant sound which seemed, however, to come from the rooms, not the street. He listened still more intently. He heard it louder, more quickly repeated, and with it a trampling of footsteps. A horrid suspicion rushed into his mind. He sat up and gave still greater attention. He heard a dead sound in the next room, as if a weight were being cautiously set down. He threw his legs out of bed as if to get up, peeped at the door, saw it open, and beheld before his eyes and advancing towards him two ragged and filthy red dresses, two ill-looking faces, in one word, two monati. He distinguished two half of Griso's face, who, hidden behind the almost closed door, remained there on lookout. Ah, infamous traitor! Be gone, you rascal! Biandino, Carlado, help! I murdered! shouted Don Rodrigo. He thrust one hand under the bolster in search of a pistol, grasped it, drew it out, but at his first cry the Monati had rushed up to the bed. The foremost is upon him before he can do anything further. He wrenches the pistol out of his hand, throws it to a distance, forces him to lie down again, and keeps him there, crying with a grin of fury mingled with contempt. Ah, villain! Against the Monati! Against the officers of the board! Against those who perform works of mercy! Hold him fast till we carry him off, said his companion, going toward a trunk. Griso then entered, and began with him to force open the lock. Scoundrel! howled Don Rodrigo, looking at him from under the fellow who held him down, and writhing himself under the grasp of his sinewy arms. First let me kill that infamous rascal, said he to the Manati, and afterwards do with me what you will. Then he began to shout with loud cries to his other servants. But in vain he called, for the abominable Griso had sent them all off with pretended orders from their master himself, before going to propose to the Manati to come on this expedition and divide the spoil. "'Be quiet, will you?' said the villain who held him down upon the bed to the unfortunate Don Rodrigo. And turning his face to the two who were seizing the booty, he cried to them, "'Do your work like honest fellows.' "'You! You!' roared Don Rodrigo de Griso, whom he beheld busying himself in breaking open, taking out money and clothes, and dividing them. You, after a fiend of hell, I may still recover, I may still recover. Griso spoke not, nor more than he could help, even turned in the direction whence these words proceeded. Hold him fast, said the other Monato. He's frantic. The miserable being became so indeed. After one last and more violent effort of cries and contortions, he suddenly sank down senseless in a swoon. He still, however, stared fixedly, as if spellbound, and from time to time gave a feeble struggle, or uttered a kind of howl. The Monati took him, one by the feet, the other by the shoulders, and went to deposit him on the hand-barrow, which they had left in the adjoining room. Afterwards one returned to fetch the booty, and then, taking up their miserable burden, they carried all away. Griso remained behind to select in haste whatever more might be of use to him, and making them up into a bundle, took his departure. He had carefully avoided touching the Monati, or being touched by them, but in the last hurry of plunder he had taken from the bedside his master's clothes and shaken them, without thinking of anything but seeing whether there were money in them. He was forced to think of it, however, the next day, for while making merry in a public house, he was suddenly seized with a cold shiver. His eyes became clouded, his strength failed him, and he sank to the ground. Abandoned by his companions, he fell into the hands of the Manati, who, despoiling him of whatever he had about him worth having, threw him upon a car on which he expired before even reaching the Lazaredo, whither his master had been carried. Leaving the latter for the present, in this abode of suffering, we must now go in search of another, whose history would never have been blended with his if it had not been forced upon him whether he would or not. Indeed, we may safely say that neither one nor the other would have any history at all. I mean Renzo, whom we left in the new silk mill under the assumed name of Antonio Rivolta. He had been there about five or six months, if I am not mistaken, when enmity having been openly declared between the Republic and the King of Spain, 
and therefore every apprehension of ill offices and trouble from that quarter having ceased, Bortolo eagerly went to fetch him away, and take him again into his own employment, both because he was fond of him, and because Renzo, being naturally intelligent and skilful in the trade, was of great use to the factotum in a manufactory, without ever being able to aspire at that office himself from his inability to write. As this reason weighed with him in some measure, we were obliged, therefore, to mention it. Perhaps the reader would rather have had a more ideal Bertolo, but what can I say? He must imagine one for himself. We describe him as he was. From the time Renzo continued to work with him, more than once or twice, and especially after having received one of those charming letters from Agnesi, he had felt a great fancy to enlist as a soldier, and make an end of it. Nor were opportunities wanting, for just during that interval the Republic often stood in need of men. The temptation had sometimes been the more pressing to Renzo, because they even talked of invading the Milanese, and it naturally appeared to him that it would be a fine thing to return in the guise of a conqueror to his own home, to see Lucia again, and for once come to an explanation with her. But, by clever management, Bartolo had always contrived to divert him from the resolution. "'If they have to go there,' he would say, "'they can go well enough without you, and you can go there afterward at your convenience. If they come back with a broken head, won't it be better to have been out of the fray? There won't be wanting desperate fellows on the highway for robberies, and before they set foot there. As for me, I am somewhat incredulous. These fellows bark, but let them. The Milanese is not a mouthful so easily swallowed. Spain is concerned in it, my dear fellow. Do you know what it is to deal with Spain? St. Mark is strong enough at home, but it will take something more than that. Have patience. Aren't you well off here? I know what you would say to me, but if it be decreed above that the thing succeed, rest assured it will succeed better by your playing no fooleries. Some saint will help you. Believe me, it's no business of yours. Do you think it would suit you to leave winding silk to go and murder? What would you do among such a set of people? It requires men who are made for it. At other times, Renzo resolved to go secretly disguised and under a false name. But from this project, too, Bartolo always contrived to divert him with arguments that may be too easily conjectured. The plague, having afterwards broken out in the Milanese territory, and even, as we have said, on the confines of the Bergamaskin, it was not long before it extended itself hither, and, be not dismayed, for I am not going to give another history of this. If any one wishes it, it may be found in a work by one Lorenzo Girardelli, written by public order, a scarce and almost unknown work. However, although it contains perhaps more fully than all the rest put together the most celebrated descriptions of pestilences, on so many things does the celebrity of books depend. What I would say is that Renzo also took the plague, and cured himself. That is to say, he did nothing. He was at the point of death, but his good constitution conquered the strength of the malady. In a few days he was out of danger. With the return of life, its cares, its wishes, hopes, recollections, and designs, were renewed with double poignancy and vigor, which is equivalent to saying that he thought more than ever of Lucia. What had become of her, during the time that life was, as it were, an exception, and at so short a distance from her could he learn nothing? And to remain, God knew how long, in such a state of uncertainty! And even when this should be removed, when all danger being over, he should learn that Lucia still survived. There would always remain that other knot, that obscurity about the vow. I'll go myself. I'll go and learn about everything at once, said he to himself, and he said it before he was again in a condition to steady himself upon his feet. Provided she lives. Oh, if she lives, I'll find her, that I will. I'll hear once from her own lips what this promise is. I'll make her see that it cannot hold good and I'll bring her away with me, her and that poor Agnesi, if she's living, who has always wished me well, and I'm sure she does so still. The capture, oh, the survivors have something else to think about now. People go about safely, even here. Will there have been a safe conduct only for bailiffs? And at Milan, everybody says that there are other disturbances there. If I let so good an opportunity pass, plague, only see how that revered instinct of referring and making subservient everything to ourselves may sometimes lead us to apply words. 
I may never have such another. It is well to hope, my good Renzo. Scarcely could he drag himself about when he set off in search of Bortolo, who had so far succeeded in escaping the pestilence, and was still kept in reserve. He did not go into the house, but calling to him from the street made him come to the window. Aha! said Bartolo, you've escaped it then. It's well for you. I'm still rather weak in the limbs, you see, but as to the danger, it's all over. I, I'd gladly be in your shoes. It used to be everything to say, I'm well, but now it counts for very little. He who is able to say, I'm better, can indeed say something. Renzo expressed some good wishes for his cousin, and imparted to him his resolution. "'Go this time, and heaven prosper you,' replied he. "'Try to avoid justice, as I shall try to avoid the contagion. And if it be God's will that things should go well with us both, we shall meet again. Oh, I shall certainly come back. God grant I may not come alone. Well, we will hope. Come back in company, for if God wills we will all work together, and make up a good party. I only hope you may find me alive, and this odious epidemic may have come to an end.' We shall see each other again. We shall see each other again. We must see each other again. I repeat, God grant it. For several days Renzo practiced taking a little exercise to assay and recruit his strength, and no sooner did he deem himself capable of performing the journey than he prepared to set out. Under his clothes he buckled a girdle round his waist, containing those fifty scudi upon which he had never laid a finger and which he had never confided to any one, not even to Bertolo. He took a few more pence with him, which he had saved day after day, by living very economically, put under his arm a small bundle of clothes, and in his pocket a character with the name of Antonio Rivolta, which had been very willingly given to him by his second master. In one pocket of his trousers he placed a large knife, the least that an honest man could carry in those days, and set off on his peregrinations, on the last day of August, three days after Don Rodrigo had been carried to the Lazaretto, he took the way toward Laco, wishing, before venturing himself in Milan, to pass through his village where he hoped to find Agnese alive, and to begin by learning from her some of the many things he so ardently longed to know. The few who had recovered from the pestilence were, among the rest of the population, indeed like a privileged class. A great proportion of the others languished or died, and those who had been hitherto untouched by the contagion lived in constant apprehension of it. They walked cautiously and warily about, with measured steps, gloomy looks, and haste at once and hesitation, for everything might be a weapon against them to inflict a mortal wound. These, on the contrary, almost certain of safety, for to have the plague twice was rather a prodigious than a rare instance, went about in the midst of the contagion freely and boldly, like the knights during one part of the Middle Ages, who encased in steel, wherever steel might be, and mounted on chargers, themselves defended as impenetrably as possible, went rambling about at hazard, whence their glorious denomination of knights errant. Among a poor pedestrian herd of burghers and villagers, who to repel and ward off their blows, had nothing on them but rags, beautiful, sapient, and useful profession, a profession fit to make the first figure in a treatise on political economy. With such security, tempered, however, by the anxiety with which our readers are acquainted, and by the frequent spectacle and perpetual contemplation of the universal calamity, Renzo pursued his homeward way, under a beautiful sky, and through a beautiful country, but meeting nothing. After passing wide tracts of most mournful solitude, but some wandering shadow rather than a living being, or corpses carried to the grave, unhonored by funeral rites, unaccompanied by the funeral dirge. About noon he stopped in a little wood to eat a mouthful of bread and meat which he had brought with him. A fruit he had only too much at his command, the whole length of the way, figs, peaches, plums, and apples at will. He had only to enter a vineyard and extend his arm to gather them from the branches, or to pick them up from the ground, which was thickly strewn with them for the year was extraordinarily abundant in fruit of every kind, and there was scarcely any one to take any care of it. The grapes even hid themselves beneath the leaves, and were left for the use of the first comer. End of chapter 33, part 1
Chapter Thirty Three, Part Two of The Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter Thirty Three, Part Two. Towards evening, he discovered his own village. At this sight, though he must have been prepared for it, he felt his heart began to beat violently. He was at once assailed by a host of mournful recollections and presentiments. He seemed to hear ringing in his ears those inauspicious tolls of the bell, which had, as it were, accompanied and followed him in his flight from the village, and at the same time, he heard, so to say, the death-like silence which actually reigned around. He experienced still stronger agitation on entering the churchyard, and worse still awaited him at the end of his walk, for the spot he had fixed upon as his resting place was the dwelling which he had once been accustomed to call Lucia's cottage. Now it could not be at the best more than Agnes's, and the only favor he begged of heaven was that he might find her living and in health. And in this cottage he proposed asking for a bed, rightly conjecturing that his own would no longer be a place of abode for anything but rats and polecats. To reach that point, therefore, without passing through the village, he took a little by-path that ran behind it the very one along which he had gone in good company on that notorious night when he tried to surprise the curate. About halfway stood on one side his own house, and on the other his vineyard, so that he could enter both for a moment in passing to see a little how his own affairs were going on. He looked forward as he pursued his way anxious, and at the same time afraid to meet with any one. And after a few paces he saw a man seated in his shirt on the ground, resting his back against a hedge of jessamine, in the attitude of an idiot. And from this, and afterwards from his countenance, he thought it was that poor simpleton Gervase, who had gone as the second witness in his ill-fated expedition but going a little nearer, he perceived that it was instead the sprightly Tonio, who had brought his brother with him on that occasion, the contagion robbing him at once of mental as well as bodily vigor, had developed in his look and every action the slight and veiled germ of likeness which he bore to his half-witted brother. Oh, Tonio! said Renzo, stopping before him. Is it you? Tonio raised his eyes, without moving his head. Tonio, don't you know me? Whoever has got it, has got it, answered Tonio, gazing at him with open mouth. It's on you, eh? Poor Tonio, but don't you know me again? Whoever has got it, has got it replied he with a kind of idiotic smile. Seeing he could draw nothing further from him, Renzo pursued his way, still more disconsolate. Suddenly he saw, turning the corner and advancing toward him, a black object which he quickly recognized as Don Abandio. He walked slowly, carrying his stick like one who was alternately carried by it, and the nearer he approached, the more plainly might it be discerned in his pale and emaciated countenance, and in every look, that he, too, had to pass through his share of the storm. He looked askance at Renzo, it seemed, and it did not seem like him. There was something like a stranger in his dress, 
but it was a stranger from the territory of Bergamo. It is he and nobody else, said he to himself, raising his hands to heaven with a motion of dissatisfied surprise, and the staff he carried in his right hand suddenly checked in its passage through the air, and his poor arms might be seen shaking in his sleeves, where once there was scarcely room for them. Renzo hastened to meet him and made a low reverence, for although they had quitted each other in the way the reader knows, he was always, nevertheless, his curate. "'Are you here? You?' exclaimed the latter. "'I am indeed, as you see. Do you know anything of Lucia? What do you suppose I can know? I know nothing. She's at Milan, if she's still in this world, but you and Agnes.' Is she alive? She may be, but who do you suppose can tell? She's not here, but where is she? She's gone to live in Valsassana, among her relations at Pesturo. You know, for they say, the plague doesn't make the havoc there it does here. But you, I say. Oh, I'm very sorry. And Father Cristoforo? He's been gone for some time, but... I know that. They wrote and told me so much. But I want to know if he hasn't yet returned to these parts. Nay, they've heard nothing farther about him. But you... I'm very sorry to hear this, too. But you, I say, what, for heaven's sakes, are you coming to do in this part of the world? Don't you know about that affair of your apprehension? What does it matter? They've something else to think about. I was determined to come for once and see about my affairs. And isn't it well enough known? What would you see about, I wonder? For now there's no longer anybody or anything. And it is wise of you, with that business of your apprehension, to come hither exactly to your own village, into the wolf's very mouth? Do as an old man advises you, who is obliged to have more judgment than you, and who speaks from the love he bears you, buckle your shoes well and set off before anyone sees you to where you came from. And if you've been seen already, return only the more quickly. Do you think that this is the air for you? Don't you know they've been to look for you? That they've ransacked everything and turned all upside down? I know it too well, the scoundrels, but then, but if I tell you I don't care, and is that fellow alive yet, is he here? I tell you nobody's here. I tell you you mustn't think about things here. I tell you, I ask if he's here. Oh, sacred heaven, speak more quietly. Is it possible you've all that fieriness about you after so many things have happened? Is he here, or is he not? Well, well, he's not here. But the plague, my son, the plague, who would go traveling about in such times as these? If there was nothing else but the plague in this world, I mean for myself, I've had it, and am free. Indeed, Indeed, what news is this? When one has escaped a danger of this sort, seems to me he should thank heaven, and, and I do so. And not go look for others, I say. Do as I advise. You've had it too, Signor Curate, if I mistake not. I had it, obstinate and bad enough it was. I'm here by miracle. I need only say it has left me in the state you see. Now I had just need of a little quiet to set me to rights again. I was beginning to be a little better. In the name of heaven, what have you come to do here? Go back. You're always at me with that go back. As for going back, I have reasons enough for not stirring. You say, what do you come for? What do you come for? I've come home home. Tell me, are many dead here? 
Alas, alas, exclaimed Don Abandio, and beginning with Perpetua, he entered upon a long enumeration of individuals and entire families. Renzo had certainly expected something of the kind, but on hearing so many names of acquaintances, friends, and relatives, he had lost his parents many years before. He stood overcome with grief, his head hung down, and only exclaiming from time to time, Poor fellow, poor girl, poor creatures. You see, continued Don Abandio, and it isn't yet over. If those who are left don't use their senses this time and drive the whims out of their brains, there's nothing for it but the end of the world. Don't be afraid. I have no intentions of stopping here. Ah, oh, thank heaven. You at last understand, and you'd better make up your mind to return. Don't trouble yourself about that. What, didn't you once want to do something more foolish than this, even? Never mind me, I say. That is my business. I'm more than seven years old. I hope, at any rate, you won't tell anybody you've seen me. You are a priest. I am one of your flock. You won't betray me? I understand, said Don Abandio, sighing pettishly. I understand. You would ruin yourself and me, too. You haven't gone through enough already, I suppose. And I haven't gone through enough, either. I understand. I understand. And, continuing to mutter these last words between his teeth, he again resumed his way. Renzo stood there, chagrined and discontented, thinking where he could find a lodging. In the funeral list recounted by Don Abandio, there was a family of peasants who had been all swept off by the pestilence, excepting one youth, about Renzo's age, who had been his companion from infancy, the house was out of the village, a very little way off. Hither he determined to bend his steps and ask for a night's lodging. He had nearly reached his own vineyard, and was soon able to infer from the outside in what state it was. Not a single tree, not a single leaf, which he had left there, was visible above the wall. If anything blossomed there, it was all what had grown during his absence. He went up to the opening. Of a gate there was no longer the least sign. He cast a glance around. Poor vineyard! For two successive winters, the people of the neighborhood had gone to chop firewood in the garden of that poor fellow, as they used to say. Vines, mulberry trees, fruits of every kind had all been rudely torn up or cut down to the trunk. Vestiges, however, of former cultivation still appeared. Young shoots in broken lines, which retained, nevertheless, traces of their now desolated rows. Here and there stumps and sprouts of mulberry, fig, peach, cherry, and plum trees. But even these seemed overwhelmed and choked by a fresh, varied, and luxuriant progeny, born and reared, without the help of man. There was a thick mass of nettles, ferns, tares, dog grass, rye grass, wild oats, green amaranth, succory, wild sorrel, foxglove, and other similar plants. All those, I mean, which the peasant of every country has included in one large class at his pleasure, denominating them weeds. There was a medley of stalks, each trying to outtop the others in the air, or rivaling its fellow in length upon the ground, aiming, in short, to secure for itself the post of honor in every direction. A mixture of leaves, flowers, and fruit, of a hundred colors, forms, and sizes. Ears of corn, Indian corn, tufts, bunches and heads of white, yellow, red, and blue. In the midst of this medley, 
other taller and more graceful though not for the most part more valuable plants were prominently conspicuous the turkish vine soared above all the rest with its long and reddish branches its large and magnificent dark green leaves some already fringed with purple at the top and its bending clusters of grapes adorned below with berries of bluish-gray tinge higher up of a purple hue than green and at the very top with whitish little flowers there was also the bearded yew with its large rough leaves down to the ground the stem rising perpendicularly to the sky and the long pendant branches scattered and as it were bespangled with bright yellow blossoms thistles too with rough and prickly leaves and calyxes from which issued little tufts of white or purple flowers or else light silvery plumes which were quickly swept away by the breeze here a little bunch of bindweed climbing up and twining around fresh suckers from a mulberry tree had entirely covered them with its pendant leaves which pointed to the ground and adorned them at the top with its white and delicate little bells there a red-berried bryony had twisted itself among the new shoots of a vine which seeking in vain a firmer support had reciprocally entwined its tendrils around its companion and mingling their feeble stalks and their not very dissimilar leaves they mutually drew each other upward as often happens with the weak who take one another for their stay the bramble intruded everywhere it stretched from one bough to another now mounting and again turning downward it bent the branches or straightened them according as it happened and crossing before the very threshold seemed as if it were placed there to dispute the passage even with the owner but he had no heart to enter such a vineyard and probably did not stand as long looking at it as we have taken to make this little sketch he went forward a little way off stood his cottage he passed through the garden trampling underfoot by hundreds the intrusive visitors with which like the vineyard it was peopled and overgrown he just set foot within the threshold of one of the rooms on the ground floor at the sound of his footsteps and on his looking in there was a hubbub a scampering to and fro of rats a rush under the rubbish that covered the whole floor it was the relics of the german soldiers beds he raised his eyes and looked round upon the walls they were stripped of plaster filthy blackened with smoke he raised them to the ceiling a mass of cobwebs nothing else was to be seen he took his departure too from this desolate scene twining his fingers in his hair returned through the garden retracing the path he had himself made a moment before took another little lane to the left which led into the fields and without seeing or hearing a living creature arrived close to the house he had designed as his place of lodging it was already evening his friend was seated outside the door on a small wooden bench his arms crossed on his breast and his eyes fixed upon the sky like a man bewildered by misfortunes and rendered savage by long solitude hearing a footstep he turned round looked who was coming and to what he fancied he saw in the twilight between the leaves and branches cried in a loud voice as he stood up and raised both his hands is there nobody but me didn't i do enough yesterday let me alone a little for that too 
will be a work of charity. Renzo, not knowing what this meant, replied to him, calling him by name. Renzo, he said in a tone of at once exclamation and interrogation. Myself, said Renzo, and they hastened to meet each other. Is it really you, said his friend, when they were near? Oh, how glad I am to see you! Who would have thought it? I took you for Paolin de Morte, who's always coming to torment me to go and bury someone. Do you know I am left alone? Alone, alone as a hermit. I know it too well, said Renzo. And interchanging in this manner, and crowding upon one another welcomings and questions and answers, they went into the house together. Here, without interrupting the conversation, his friend busied himself in doing some little honor to his guest, as best he could on so sudden a warning, and in times like those. He set some water on the fire and began to make the polenta, but soon gave up the pestle to Renzo that he might proceed with the mixing, and went out, saying, I'm all by myself, you see, all by myself. By and by, he returned with a small pail of milk, a little salt meat, a couple of cream cheeses, and some figs and peaches. And all being ready, and the polenta poured out upon the trencher, they sat down to table, mutually thanking each other one for the visit, the other for the reception he met with. And after an absence of nearly two years, they suddenly discovered that they were much greater friends than they ever thought they were when they saw each other almost every day. For, as the manuscript here remarks, events had occurred to both which make one feel what a cordial to the heart is kindly feeling both that which one experiences oneself and that which one meets with in others. True, no one could supply the place of Agnes to Renzo, nor console him for her absence, not only on account of the old and special affection he entertained for her, but also because among the things he was anxious to clear up, one there was of which she alone possessed the key. He stood for a moment in doubt whether he should not first go in search of her, since he was so short a distance off. But considering that she would know nothing of Lucia's health, he kept to his first intention of going at once to assure himself of this, to confront the one great trial, and afterwards to bring the news to her mother. Even from his friend, however, he learnt many things of which he was ignorant, and gained some light on many points with which he was but partially acquainted, both about Lucia's circumstances, the prosecutions instituted against himself, and Don Rodrigo's departure thence, followed by his whole suit, since which time he had not been seen in the neighbourhood. In short, about all the intricate circumstances of the whole affair. He learnt also, and to him it was an acquisition of no little importance, to pronounce properly the name of Don Ferrante's family. Agnes, indeed, had written it to him by her secretary, but heaven knows how it was written, and the Bergamasican interpreter had read it in such a way had given him such a word, that had he gone with it to seek direction to his house in Milan, he would probably have found no one who could have conjectured for whom he was making inquiry. Yet this was the only clue he possessed that could put him in the way of learning tidings of Lucia. As to justice, he was even more and more convinced that this was a hazard remote enough not to give him much concern. The Signor Podesta had died of the plague. Who knew when a substitute would be appointed? 
the greater part of the bailiffs were carried off, and those that remained had something else to do than look after old matters. He also related to his friend the vicissitudes he had undergone, and heard in exchange a hundred stories about the passage of the army, the plague, the poisoners, and other wonderful matters. They're miserable things, said his friend, accompanying Renzo into a little room, which the contagion had emptied of occupants, things which we never could have thought to see and after which we can never expect to be merry again all our lives. But nevertheless, it is a relief to speak of them to one's friends. By break of day, they were both downstairs, Renzo equipped for his journey with his girdle hidden under his doublet, and the large knife in his pocket, but otherwise light and unencumbered, having left his little bundle in the care of his host. If all goes well with me, he said, if I find her alive, if... Enough. I'll come back here. I'll run over Pasturo to carry the good news to poor Agnes, and then... and then... But if by ill luck... by ill luck, which God forbid... Then I don't know what I shall do. I don't know where I shall go. Only assuredly you will never see me again in these parts. And as he said so, standing in the doorway which led into the fields, he cast his eyes around and contemplated with a mixed feeling of tenderness and bitter grief the sun rising of his own country which he had not seen for so long a time. His friend comforted him with bright hopes and prognostinations, and made him take with him some little store of provision for that day. Then, accompanying him a mile or two on his way, he took his leave with renewed good wishes. Renzo pursued his way deliberately and easily, as all he cared for, was to reach the vicinity of Milan that day, so that he might enter next morning, early and immediately begin his search. The journey was performed without accident, nor was there anything which particularly attracted his attention, except the usual spectacles of misery and sorrow. He stopped in due time, as he had done the day before, in a grove, to refresh himself and take breath. Passing through Monza, before an open shop where bread was displayed for sale, he asked for two loaves, that he might not be totally unprovided for under any circumstances. The shopkeeper, beckoning him not to enter, held out to him, on a little shove, a small basin containing vinegar and water into which he desired him to drop the money in payment. He did so, and then the two loaves were handed out to him, one after another, with a pair of tongs, and deposited by Renzo, one in each pocket. Towards evening he arrived at Greco, without, however, knowing its name but by the help of some little recollection of the places which he retained from his former journey, and his calculation of the distance he had already come from Monza, he guessed that he must be tolerably near the city, and therefore left the high road and turned into the fields in search of some cascanato where he might pass the night, for with inns he was determined not to meddle. He found more than he looked for, for seeing a gap in a hedge which surrounded the yard of a cow-house, he resolved at any rate to enter. No one was there. He saw in one corner a large shed with hay piled up beneath it, and against this a ladder was reared. He once more looked around, and then, mounting at a venture, laid himself down to pass the night there, 
and quickly fell asleep, not to awake till morning. When he awoke, he crawled towards the edge of this great bed, put his head out, and seeing no one, descended as he had gone up, went out where he had come in, pursued his way through little by-paths, taking the cathedral for his polar star, and after a short walk came out under the walls of Milan, between the Porta Oriental and the Porta Nova, and rather nearer to the latter. End of chapter 33, part 2《Chapter Thirty Four, Part One of The Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter Thirty Four, Part One. As to the way of entering the city, Renzo had heard, in general terms, that there were very strict orders not to admit persons without a certificate of health, but that, in fact, it was easy enough for any one to effect an entrance who at all knew how to help himself and to seize opportunities. So it was, and letting alone the general causes why every order in those days was so imperfectly executed, letting alone the particular ones which rendered the rigorous execution of this so impractical, Milan was now reduced to such a pass that no one could see of what use it was to defend it, or against what it was to be defended, and who came thither might be considered rather to risk his own health than to endanger that of the inhabitants. Upon this information, Renzo's intention was to attempt a passage at the first gate upon which he might happen to light and if any obstacle presented itself, to go round outside until he found another more easy of access. And heaven knows how many gates he thought Milan must have. Arrived then before the walls, he stood still to look about him, as one does, who, not knowing which way will be the best, to bend his steps. Seems as if he awaited and asked directions from anything but he could discover nothing either way but two reaches of a winding road, and before him a part of the wall. In no quarter was there a symptom of a human being, except that in one spot, on the platform, might be seen a dense column of black and murky smoke, which expanded itself as it mounted, and curled into ample circles, and afterwards dispersed itself through the gray and motionless atmosphere. They were clothes, beds, and other articles of infected furniture which were being committed to the flames, and such melancholy conflagrations were constantly to be seen, not only here, but on every side of the wall. The weather was close, the air thick and heavy, the whole sky veiled by a uniform sluggish cloud of mist which seemed to forbid the sun without giving promise of rain. The country round was partly uncultivated, and the whole looked parched. Vegetation was stunted, and not a drop of dew moistened the drooping and withered leaves. This solitude, this deep silence, so near a large mass of habitations, added new consternation to Renzo's disquietude, and rendered his thoughts still more gloomy. Having stood thus for a moment, he took the right hand, at a venture directing his steps without being aware of it, towards the Porta Nova, which, though close at hand, he had not been able to perceive, on account of a bastion behind which it was concealed. 
After taking a few steps, a tinkling of little bells fell upon his ear, which ceased and was renewed at intervals, and then the voices of men. He went forward, and having turned the corner of the bastion, the first thing that met his eye on the esplanade before the gate was a small wooden house or sentry box, at the doorway of which stood a guard leaning on his musket with a languid and negligent air. Behind was a fence composed of stakes, and beyond that the gate, that is to say, two wings of the wall connected by a roof above, which served to shelter the door, both leaves of which were wide opened, as was also the wicket of the palisade. Exactly before the opening, however, stood a melancholy impediment, a hand-barrow placed upon the ground on which two manati were laying out a poor creature to bear him away. It was the head of the custom-house officers in whom the plague had been discovered just before. Renzo stood still where he was, awaiting the issue. The party being gone, and no one appearing to shut the gate again, now seemed to be his time. He hastened forward, but the ill-looking sentinel called out to him, Hola! He instantly stopped, and winking at the man, drew out a half ducat and showed it to him. The fellow, either having already had the pestilence, or fearing it less than he loved half ducats, beckoned to Renzo to throw it to him, and soon seeing it roll at his feet, muttered, Go forward quickly. Renzo gave him no occasion to repeat the order. He passed the palisade, entered the gate, and went forward without anyone observing or taking any notice of him, except that when he had gone perhaps forty paces, he heard another, Oh! from a toll-gatherer who was calling after him. This he pretended not to hear, and instead of turning around only quickened his pace. Ola! cried the collector again, in a tone, however, which rather indicated vexation than a determination to be obeyed. And finding that he was not obeyed, he shrugged his shoulders and returned into the house, like one who was more concerned about not approaching too near to strangers than inquiring into their affairs. The street inside this gate, at that time, as now, ran straight forward as far as the canal called the Neviglio. At the sides were hedges or walls of gardens, churches, covenants, and a few private dwellings, and at the end of this street, in the middle of that which ran along the brink of the canal, was erected a cross, called the Cross of St. Eusebio, and, let Renzo look before him as he would, nothing but this cross ever met his view. Arrived at the cross, which divided the street about halfway, and looking to the right and left, he perceived in the right-hand one, which bore the name of Santa Teresa, a citizen who was coming exactly towards him. A Christian at last, said he to himself, and he immediately turned into the street with the intention of making some inquiries of him. The man stared at and eyed the stranger who was advancing toward him with a suspicious kind of look, even at a distance, and still more when he perceived that instead of going about his own business he was making up to him, Renzo, when he was within a little distance, took off his hat like a respectful mountaineer, such as he was, and holding it in his left hand, put the whole fist of his right into the empty crown, and advanced more directly towards the unknown passenger. But he, wildly rolling his eyes, gave back a step, 
uplifted a knotty stick he carried, and with a sharp spike at the end like a rapier, and pointing it at Renzo's breast, cried, Stand off! Stand off! Oh! Ho, ho, cried the youth in his turn, putting on his hat again, and willing to do anything, as he afterwards said in a relating manner, rather than pick a quarrel at that moment. He turned his back upon the uncourteous citizen, and pursued his way, or so to speak correctly, that in which he happened to have set off. The citizen also continued his route, trembling from head to foot every now and then, looking behind him, and having reached home, he related how a poisoner had come up to him with a meek and humble air, but with the look of an infamous impostor and with a box of ointment or a paper of powder, he was not exactly certain which, in his hand in the crown of his hat, with the intention of playing a trick upon him, if he hadn't known how to keep him at a distance. If he had come one step nearer, he added, I'd have run him through before he'd had time to touch me, the scoundrel. The misfortune was that we were in so unfrequented a place had it been the heart of Milan, I'd have called people and bid them seize him. I'm sure we should have found that infamous poison in his hat. But there, all alone, I was obliged to be content with saving myself without running the risk of getting the infection. For a little powder is soon thrown, and these people are remarkably dexterous. Besides, they have the devil on their side. He'll be about Milan now. Who knows what murders he's committing? And as long as he lived, which was many years, every time that poisoners were talked of, he repeated his own instance and added, They who still maintain that it wasn't true, don't let them talk to me. For absolute facts, one couldn't help seeing. Renzo far from imagining what a stab he had escaped, and more moved with anger than fear, reflected in walking on this reception, and pretty nearly guessed the opinion which the citizen had formed of his actions, yet the thing seemed to him so beyond all reason that he came to the conclusion that the man must have been half a fool. It's a bad beginning, thought he, However, it seems as if there were an evil star for me at this Milan. Everything seconds me readily enough in entering, but afterwards, when I am in, I find disagreeabilities all prepared for me. Well, with God's help, if I find, if I succeed in finding, oh, all will have been nothing. Having reached the foot of the bridge, he turned without hesitation to the left, along a road called San Marcos Street, as it seemed to him this must lead into the heart of the city. As he went along, he kept constantly on the lookout, in hopes of discovering some human creature. But he could see none, except a disfigured corpse in the little ditch which runs behind the few houses, which were then still fewer, and the street for a part of the way. Having passed this part, he heard some cries which seemed to be addressed to him, and turning his eyes upwards, in the direction whence the sound came, he perceived at a little distance, on the balcony of an isolated dwelling, a poor woman with a group of children around her, who, calling to him, was beckoning also with her hand to entreat him to approach. He ran towards her, and when he came near, Oh, young man, said the woman, in the name of the friends you've lost, have the charity to go and tell the commissary that we are here forgotten. They've shut us up in the house as suspected persons, because my poor husband is dead. They've nailed up the door, as you see, and since yesterday morning nobody has brought us anything to eat. 
for the many hours I've stood here, I haven't been able to find a single Christian who would do me this kindness, and these poor little innocents are dying of hunger. Of hunger? exclaimed Renzo, and putting his hands into his pocket. See here, said he, drawing out the two loaves. Send something down to take them. God reward you for it. Wait a moment, said the woman, and she went to fetch a little basket and a cord by which to lower it for the bread. Renzo at this moment recollected the two loaves he had found near the cross on his first instance into Milan, and thought to himself, See, it's a restitution, and perhaps better than if I'd found the real owner, for this surely is a deed of charity. As to the commissary you mention, my good woman, said he, putting the bread into the basket, I'm afraid I can't serve you at all, for, to tell you the truth, I'm a stranger, and have no acquaintance with any one in this country. However, if I meet any one at all civil and human to speak to, I'll tell them. The woman begged he would do so, and told him the name of the street by which he might describe the situation. You too, I think, resumed Renzo, can do me a service, a real kindness, without any trouble. A family of high rank, very great seniors here in Milan, the family of... Can you tell me where they live? I know very well there is such a family, replied the woman, but where it is I haven't the least idea. If you go forward into the city in this direction, you'll find somebody who will show you the way, and don't forget to tell them about us. Don't fear it, said Renzo, and he pursued his way. At every step he heard increasing and drawing nearer, a noise which he had already begun to distinguish as he stood talking with the woman, a noise of wheels and horses, with a tinkling of little bells, and every now and then a cracking of whips and loud vociferations. He looked before him but saw nothing. Having reached the end of this winding street, and got a view of the square of San Marco. The objects which first met his eye were two erect beams with a rope and sundry pulleys, which he failed not immediately to recognize, for it was a familiar spectacle in those days, as the abominable instrument of torture. It was erected in that place, and not only there, but in all the squares and most spacious streets, in order that the deputies of every quarter, furnished with this most arbitrary of all means, might be able to apply it immediately to any one whom they should deem deserving of punishment, whether it were sequestered persons who left their houses, or officers rebelling against orders, and whatever else it might be. It was one of those extravagant and inefficacious remedies, of which in those days, and at that particular period especially, they were so extremely prodigal. While Renzo was contemplating this machine, wondering why it was erected in that place, and listening to the closely approaching sound, behold, he saw appearing from behind the corner of the church a man ringing a little bell, it was an apparitor, and behind him two horses, which, stretching their necks and pawing with their hoofs, could with difficulty make their way, and drawn by these a cart full of dead bodies. And after that another, and then another, and another, and on each hand, monetai walking by the side of the horses, hastening them on with whips, blows, and curses. These corpses were, for the most part, naked, while some were miserably enveloped in tattered sheets, and were heaped up and twined together, 
almost like a nest of snakes slowly unfolding themselves to the warmth of a mild spring day, so that at every trifling obstacle, at every jolt, these fatal groups were seen quivering and falling into horrible confusion, heads dangling down, women's long tresses disheveled, arms torn off and striking against the wheels, exhibiting to the already horror-stricken view how such a spectacle may become still more wretched and disgraceful. The youth had paused at the corner of the square, by the sides of the railing of the canal, and was praying, meanwhile, for these unknown dead. A horrible thought flashed across his mind. Perhaps there, amongst these, beneath them, oh, Lord, let it not be true, help me not to think of it. The funeral procession, having disappeared, he moved on, crossing the square and taking the street along the left-hand side of the canal, without another reason for his choice than because the procession had taken the opposite direction. After going a few steps between the side of the church and the canal, he saw to the right the bridge Marcelino. He crossed it, and by that unique passage arrived in the street of the Borgo Nuovo, casting his eyes forward on the constant lookout for some of whom he might ask direction. He saw at the other end of the street a priest clothed in a doublet, with a small stick in his hand, standing near a half-open door, with his head bent and his ear at the aperture. And very soon afterwards he saw him raise his hand to pronounce a blessing. He guessed what in fact was the case, that he had just finished confessing someone, and said to himself, This is my man. If a priest, in the exercise of his functions, hasn't a little charity, a little good nature and kindness, I can only say there is none left in the world. In the meanwhile, the priest, leaving the doorway, advanced towards Renzo, walking with much caution in the middle of the road. When he was within four or five paces of him, Renzo took off his hat and signified that he wanted to speak to him, stopping at the same time so as to let him understand that he would not approach too indiscreetly. The priest also paused, with the air of one prepared to listen, planting his stick, however, on the ground before him, to serve, as it were, for a kind of bulwark. Renzo proposed his inquiries, which the good priest readily satisfied, not only telling him the name of the street where the house was situated, but giving him also, as he saw the poor fellow had need of it, a little direction as to his way pointing out to him, i.e., the help of right and left hands, crosses and churches, those other six or eight streets he had yet to traverse before reaching the one he was inquiring after. "'God keep you in good health, both in these days and always,' said Renzo, and as the priest prepared to go away, "'Another favor,' added he, and told him of the poor forgotten woman. The worthy priest thanked him for having given him this opportunity of conveying assistance where it was so much needed, and saying that he would go and inform the proper authorities, took his departure. Renzo, making a bow, also pursued his way, and tried, as he went along, to recapitulate the instructions he had received, that he might be obliged, as seldom as possible, to ask further directions. But it cannot be imagined how difficult he found the task, not so much on account of the perplexity of the thing, as from a fresh uneasiness which had arisen in his mind. The name of the street, 
that tracing of the road had almost upset him. It was the information he had desired and requested, without which he could do nothing, nor had anything been said to him together with it, which could suggest a presage, not to say a suspicion of misfortune. Yet how was it? The rather more distinct idea of an approaching termination to his doubts, when he might hear either she is living, or on the other hand, she is dead. That idea had come before him with so much force that at the moment he would rather have been in ignorance about everything and have been at the beginning of that journey of which he now found himself so near the end. He gathered up his courage, however. Ah, <sighs> said he to himself, if we begin now to play the child, how will things go on? Thus, reemboldened as best might be, he pursued his way, advancing further into the city. What a city! And who found time in those days to recollect what it had been the year before by reason of the famine? Renzo happened to have to pass through one of its most unsightly and desolated quarters. That junction of streets, known by the name of the Carabio, of the Porta Nova. Here, at that time, was a cross at the head of the street and opposite to it, by the side of the present site of San Francisco de Paola, an ancient church bearing the name of San Anastasia. Such had been the virulence of the contagion and the infection of the scattered corpses in this neighborhood that the few survivors had been obliged to remove, so that while the passer-by was stunned with such a spectacle of solitude and desertion, more than one sense was only too grievously incommoded and offended by the tokens and relics of recent habitation. Renzo quickened his steps, consoling himself with the thought that the end of his search could not yet be at hand, and hoping that before he arrived at it, he would find the scene, at least in part, changed. And, in fact, a little further on, he came out into a part which might still be called the city of the living. But what a city, and what a living! And the doorways into the streets kept shut from either suspicion or alarm, except those which were left open because deserted or invaded, others nailed up and sealed outside on account of the sick or dead, who lay within, others marked with a cross, drawn with coal, as an intimation to the Minati that there were dead to be carried away all more a matter of chance than otherwise, according as there happened to be here rather than there a commissary of health or other officer who was inclined either to execute the regulations or to exercise violence and oppression. Everywhere were rags and corrupted bandages, infected straw or clothes or sheets thrown from the windows sometimes bodies, which had suddenly fallen dead in the streets, and were left there till a cart happened to pass by and pick them up, or shaken from off the carts themselves, or even thrown from the windows. To such a degree had the obstinacy and virulence of the contagion brutalized men's minds and divested them of all compassionate care of every feeling of social respect. The stir of business, the clatter of carriages, the cries of sellers, the talking of passengers, all were everywhere hushed, and seldom 
was the death-like stillness, broken but by the rumbling of funeral carts, the lamentation of beggars, the groans of the sick, the shouts of the frantic, or the vociferations of the manati. At daybreak, midday and evening, one of the bells of the cathedral gave the signal for reciting certain prayers proposed by the archbishop. Its tones were responded to by the bells of the other churches, and then persons might be seen repairing to the windows to pray in common, and a murmur of sighs and voices might be heard, which inspired sadness, mingled at the same time with some feeling of comfort. Two-thirds, perhaps, of the inhabitants being by this time carried off, a great part of the remainder having departed, or lying languishing at home, and the concourse from without being reduced almost to nothing, perhaps not one individual among the few who still went about, would be met with in a long circuit, in whom something strange and sufficient in itself to infer a fatal change in circumstances was not apparent. Men of the highest rank might be seen without cape or cloak, at that time a most essential part of any gentleman's dress, priests without cassocks, friars without cowls, in short, all kinds of dress were dispensed with which could contract anything in fluttering about, or give, which was more feared than all the rest, facilities to the poisoners. And besides this carefulness to go about as trussed up and confined as possible, their persons were neglected and disorderly. The beards of such as were accustomed to wear them grown much longer, and suffered to grow by those who had formerly kept them shaven, their hair, too, long and undressed, not only from the neglect which usually attends prolonged depression, but because suspicion had been attached to barbers, ever since one of them, Gian Giacomo Mora, had been taken and condemned as a famous poisoner, a name which for a long while afterward preserved throughout the duchy a preeminent celebrity in infamy, and deserved a far more extensive and lasting one in commiseration. The greater number carried in one hand a stick, some even a pistol, as a threatening warning to any one who should attempt to approach them stealthily, and in the other perfumed pastels, or little balls of metal or wood perforated and filled with sponges steeped in aromatic vinegar, which they applied from time to time as they went along to their noses or held there continually. Some carried a small vial hung around their neck, containing a little quick silver, persuaded that this possessed the virtue of absorbing and arresting every pestilential effluvia. This they were very careful to renew from time to time. Gentlemen not only traversed the streets without their usual attendance, but even went about with a basket on their arms, providing the common necessaries of life. Even friends, when they met in the street alive, saluted each other at a distance, with silent and hasty signs. Everyone, as he walked along, had enough to do to avoid the filthy and deadly stumbling blocks with which the ground was strewn, and in some places even encumbered. Every one tried to keep the middle of the road, for fear of some other obstacle, some other more fatal weight, which might fall from the windows, for fear of venomous powders, which it was affirmed were often thrown down fence upon the passengers, for fear, too, of the walls, which might perchance be anointed. Thus ignorance, unseasonably secure, 
or preposterously circumspect, now added trouble to trouble, and incited false terrors in compensation for the reasonable and salutary ones which it had withstood at the beginning. Such were the less disfigured and pitiable spectacles which were everywhere present, the sight of the whole, the wealthy, for after so many pictures of misery and remembering that still more painful one which it remains for us to describe, we will not now stop to tell what was the condition of the sick who dragged themselves along or lay in the streets, beggars, women, children. It was such that the spectator could find a desperate consolation, as it were, in what appears at first sight to those who are far removed in place and time, the climax of misery. The thought, I mean, the constant observation that the survivors were reduced to so small a number. End of chapter 34, part 1 Recording by Sandra Estenson Chapter 34, Part 2 of The Betrothed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni Chapter 34, Part 2 Renzo had already gone some distance on his way through the midst of this desolation, when he heard, proceeding from a street a few yards off, into which he had been directed to turn, a confused noise. He readily distinguished the usual horrible tinkling. At the entrance of the street, which was one of the most spacious, he perceived four carts standing in the middle, and as in a corn market there is a constant hurrying to and fro of people, and an emptying and filling of sacks, such was the bustle here. Monati intruding into houses, Monati coming out, bearing a burden upon their shoulders which they placed upon one or other of the carts, some in red livery, others without that distinction, many with another still more odious, plumes and cloaks of various colors which these miserable wretches wore in the midst of the general mourning, as if in honor of a festival. From time to time the mournful cry resounded from one of the windows, here, Monati, and with a still more wretched sound, a harsh voice rose from this horrible source in reply, Coming directly, or else there were lamentations nearer at hand, or entreaties to make haste, to which the Monati responded with oaths. Having entered the street, Renzo quickened his steps, trying not to look at these obstacles further than was necessary to avoid them. His attention, however, was arrested by a remarkable object of pity, such pity as inclines to the contemplation of its object, so that he came to a pause, almost without determining to do so. Coming down the steps at one of the doorways, and advancing towards the convoy, he beheld a woman, whose appearance announced still remaining though somewhat advanced youthfulness, a veiled and dimmed but not destroyed beauty, was still apparent. In spite of much suffering, and a fatal languor. That delicate, and at the same time majestic beauty, was inconspicuous in the Lombard blood. Her gait was weary, but not tottering. No tears fell from her eyes, though they bore tokens of having shed many. There was something peaceful and profound in her sorrow, which indicated a mind fully conscious, and sensitive enough to feel it. But it was not only her own appearance which, in the midst of so much misery, marked her out so especially as an object of commiseration, and revived in her behalf a feeling now exhausted, extinguished, in men's hearts. She carried in her arms a little child, about nine years old, now a lifeless body, but laid out and arranged, with her hair parted on her forehead, and in a white and remarkably clean dress, as if those hands had decked her out for a longed-promised feast, granted as a reward. 
nor was she lying there, but upheld and adjusted on one arm, with her breast reclining against her mother's like a living creature, save that a delicate little hand, as white as wax, hung from one side with a kind of inanimate weight, and the head rested upon her mother's shoulder with an abandonment deeper than that of sleep. Her mother, for even if their likeness to each other had not given assurance of the fact, the countenance which still depicted any feeling would have clearly revealed it. A horrible-looking Monato approached the woman, and attempted to take the burden from her arms with a kind of unusual respect, however, and with involuntary hesitation. But she, slightly drawing back, yet with an air of one who knows neither scorn nor displeasure, said, No, don't take her from me yet. I must place her myself on this cart. Here, so saying, she opened her hand, displayed a purse which she held in it, and dropped it into that which the monato extended toward her. She then continued, Promise me not to take a thread from her, nor to let any one else attempt to do so, and to lay her in the ground thus. The monato laid his right hand on his heart, then zealously and almost obsequiously, rather from the new feeling by which he was, as it were, subdued, than on account of the unlooked-for reward, hastened to make a little room on the cart for the infant dead. The lady, giving it a kiss on the forehead, laid it on the spot prepared for it as upon a bed, arranged it there, covering it with a pure white linen cloth, and pronounced the parting words, Farewell, Cecilia, rest in peace. This evening we too will join you, to rest together for ever. In the meanwhile pray for us, for I will pray for you and the others. Then turning to the monato, You, said she, when you pass this way in the evening, may come to fetch me too, and not me only. So saying, she re-entered the house, and after an instant appeared at the window, holding in her arms another more dearly loved one, still living, but with the marks of death on its countenance. She remained to contemplate these so unworthy obsequies of the first child, from the time the car started until it was out of sight, and then disappeared. And what remained for her to do, but to lay upon the bed the only one that was left to her, and to stretch herself beside it, that they might die together, as the flower already full-blown upon the stem falls together with the bud still enfolded in its calyx, under the scythe which levels alike all the herbage of the field. "'Oh, Lord!' exclaimed Renzo. "'Hear her! Take her to thyself! Her and that little one!' They have suffered enough, surely they have suffered enough. Recovered from these singular emotions, and while trying to recall to memory the directions he had received, to ascertain whether he was to turn at the first street, and whether to the right or left, he heard another and a different sound proceeding from the latter, a confused sound of imperious cries, feeble lamentations, prolonged groans, sobs of women, and children's moans. He went forward, oppressed at heart by that one sad and gloomy foreboding. Having reached the spot where the two streets crossed, he beheld a confused multitude advancing from one side, and stood still to wait till it had passed. It was a party of sick on their way to the lazaretto, some driven thither by force, vainly offering resistance, vainly crying that they would rather die upon their own beds, and replying with impotent imprecations to the oaths and commands of the Manati who were conducting them, others who walked on in silence, without any apparent grief, and without hope, like insensible beings, women with infants clinging to their bosoms, children terrified by the cries, the mandates, and the crowd, more than by the confused idea of death, with loud cries demanding their mother and her trusted embrace, and imploring that they might remain at their well-known homes. Alas! Perhaps their mother, whom they supposed they had left asleep upon her bed, had there thrown herself down senseless, subdued in a moment by the disease, to be carried away on a cart to the lazaretto, or to the grave. Perhaps, oh, misfortune deserving of still more bitter tears, the mother, entirely taken up by her own sufferings, had forgotten everything, even her own children, and had no longer any wish but to die in quiet. 
In such a scene of confusion, however, some examples of constancy and piety might still be seen. Parents, brothers, sons, husbands supported their loved ones, and accompanying them with words of comfort, and not adults only, but even boys and little girls, escorting their younger brothers and sisters, and with manly sense and compassion, exhorting them to obedience, and assuring them that they were going to a place where others would take care of them and try to restore them to health. In the midst of the sadness and emotions of tenderness excited by these spectacles, a far different solicitude pressed more closely upon our traveller and held him in a painful suspense. The house must be near at hand, and who knew whether among these people, but the crowd having all passed by, and this doubt being removed, he turned to a monato who was walking behind, and asked him for the street and dwelling of Don Ferrante. "'It's gone to smash, clown,' was the reply he received. Renzo cared not to answer again, but perceiving a few yards' distance a commissary who brought up the convoy, and had a little more Christian-like countenance, he re-repeated the same inquiry. The commissary, with a stick in the direction whence he had come, said, "'The first street to the right, the last gentleman house on the left.' With new and still deeper anxiety of mind, the youth bent his steps thitherward, and quickly distinguished the house among others more humble and unpretending. He approached the closed door, placed his hand on the knocker, and held it in suspense, as in an urn, before drawing out the ticket upon which depends life or death. At length he raised the hammer and gave a resolute knock. In a moment or two a window was slightly opened, and a woman appeared at it to peep out looking toward the door with a suspicious countenance which seemed to say, Manati, robbers, commissaries, poisoners, devils. Signora, said Renzo, looking upward in a somewhat tremulous tone, is there a young country girl here at service, of the name of Lucia? She's here no longer. Go away, answered the woman, preparing to shut the window. One moment, for pity's sake. She's no longer here. Where is she? at the lazaretto, and she was again about to close the window. But one moment, for heaven's sake, with the pestilence? To be sure, something new, eh? Get you gone. Oh, stay, was she very ill? How long is it? But this time the window was closed in reality. Oh, signora, signora, one word for charity, for the sake of your poor dead. I don't ask you for anything of yours. Alas, oh! but he might as well have talked to a wall. Afflicted by this intelligence, and vexed with the treatment he had received, Renzo again seized the knocker, and standing close to the door kept squeezing and twisting it in his hand, then lifted it to knock again in a kind of despair, and paused in act to strike. In this agitation of feeling he turned to see if his eye could catch any person near at hand from whom he might perhaps receive some more sober information, some direction, some light but the first, the only person he discovered was another woman, distant perhaps about twenty yards, who with a look full of terror, hatred, impatience, and malice, with a certain wild expression of eye, which betrayed an attempt to look at him and something else at a distance at the same time, with a mouth opened as if on the point of shouting as loud as she could, but holding even her breath, raising two thin bony arms, and extending and drawing back two wrinkled and clenched hands, as if reaching to herself something, gave evident signs of wishing to call people without letting somebody perceive it. On their eyes encountering each other, she, looking still more hideous, started like one taken by surprise. "'What the?' began Renzo, raising his fist toward the woman. But she, having lost all hope of being able to have him unexpectedly seized, gave utterance to the cry she had hitherto restrained. THE POISONER! SEIZE HIM! SEIZE HIM! SEIZE HIM! THE POISONER! WHO? I? AH! YOU LYING OLD WITCH! HOLD YOUR TONGUE THERE! CRIED RENZO, AND HE SPRANG TOWARDS HER TO FRIGHTEN HER AND MAKE HER BE SILENT. HE PERCEIVED, HOWEVER, AT THIS MOMENT, THAT HE MUST RATHER LOOK AFTER HIMSELF. AT THE SCREENS OF THE WOMAN PEOPLE FLOCKED FROM BOTH SIDES, NOT THE CROWDS, INDEED, WHICH IN A SIMILAR CASE WOULD HAVE COLLECTED THREE MONTHS BEFORE, but still more than enough to crush a single individual. At this very instant the window was again thrown open, 
and the same woman who had shown herself so uncourteous just before, displayed herself this time in full, and cried out, "'Take him! Take him! For he must be one of those wicked wretches who go about to anoint the doors of the gentlefolks!' Renzo determined in an instant that it would be a better course to make his escape from them, than stay to clear himself. He cast an eye on each side to see where were the fewest people, and in that direction took to his legs. He repulsed with a tremendous push one who attempted to stop his passage. With another blow on the chest he forced a second to retreat eight or ten yards, who was running to meet him, and away he went at full speed, with his tightly clenched fist uplifted in the air in preparation for whomsoever should come his way. The street was clear before him, but behind his back he heard resounding more and more loudly the savage cry, "'Seize him! Seize him! A poisoner!' He heard, drawing nearer and nearer, the footsteps of the swiftest among his pursuers. His anger became fury. His anguish was changed into desperation. A cloud seemed gathering over his eyes. He seized hold of his poniard, unsheathed it, stopped, drew himself up, turned round a more fierce and savage face than he had ever put on in his whole life, and brandishing it in the air with outstretched arm, the glittering blade, exclaimed, "'Let him who dares come forward, you rascals, and I'll anoint him with this in earnest.' But with astonishment, and a confused feeling of relief, he perceived that his persecutors had already stopped at some distance, as if in hesitation, and that while they continued shouting after him, they were beckoning with uplifted hands, like people possessed and terrified out of their senses, to others at some distance beyond him. He again turned round, and beheld before him, and a very little way off, for his extreme perturbation had prevented his observing it a moment before, a cart advancing, indeed a file of the usual funeral carts with their usual accompaniments, and beyond them another small band of people, who were ready on their part to fall upon the poisoner, and take him in the midst. These, however, were also restrained by the same impediment. Finding himself thus between two fires, it occurred to him that what was to them a cause of terror might be for himself a means of safety. He thought that this was not a time for squeamish scruples, so again sheathing his poniard, he drew a little on one side, resumed his way toward the carts, and passing by the first, remarked in the second a tolerably empty space. He took aim, sprang up, and lit with his right foot in the cart, his left in the air, and his arms stretched forward. "'Bravo! Bravo!' exclaimed the Manati with one voice, some of whom were following the convoy on foot. Others were seated on the carts, and others, to tell the horrible fact as it really was, on the dead bodies, quaffing from a large flask which was going the round of the party. "'Bravo! A capital hit! You've come to put yourself under the protection of the Manati. You may reckon yourself as safe as in church,' said one of the two who were seated on the cart upon which he had thrown himself." The greater part of his enemies had, on approach of the train, turned their backs upon him and fled, crying at the same time, "'Seize him! Seize him! A poisoner!' Some few of them, however, retired more deliberately, stopping every now and then, and turning with a hideous grin of rage and threatening gestures toward Renzo, who replied to them from the cart by shaking a fist at them. "'Leave it to me,' said a Minato, and tearing a filthy rag from one of the bodies, he hastily tied it in a knot and taking it by one of its ears, raised it like a sling toward these obstinate fellows, and pretended to hurl it at them, crying, "'Here, you rascals!' At this action they all fled in horror, and Renzo saw nothing but the backs of his enemies, and heels which bounded rapidly through the air, like the hammers in a clothier's mill. A howl of triumph arose among the Manati, a stormy burst of laughter, a prolonged ay as an accompaniment, so to say, to this fugue. Aha! Look if we don't know how to protect honest fellows, said the same Manato to Renzo. One of us is worth more than a hundred of those cowards. Certainly I may say I owe you my life, replied he, and I thank you with all my heart. Not a word, not a word, answered the Manato. You deserve it. One can see you're a brave young fellow. You do right to poison these rascals. Anoint away. Extirpate all those who are good for nothing, except when they're dead. 
for in reward for the life we lead they only curse us, and keep saying that when the pestilence is over they'll have us all hanged. They must be finished before the pestilence. The Manati only must be left to chant victory and revel in Milan. "'Long live the pestilence and death to the rabble!' exclaimed the other, and with this beautiful toast he put the flask to his mouth, and holding it with both hands amidst the joltings of the cart, took a long draught, and then handed it to Renzo, saying, "'Drink to our health!' "'I wish it you all with my whole heart,' said Renzo, "'but I'm not thirsty. I don't feel any inclination to drink just now.' "'You've had a fine fright, it seems,' said the Monato. "'You look like a harmless creature enough. "'You should have another face than that to be a poisoner.' "'Let everybody do as he can,' said the other. "'Here, give it to me,' said one of those on foot at the side of the car, "'for I, too, want to drink another cup to the health of his honour, "'who finds himself in such capital company. "'There, there, just there, among that elegant carriage full. "'And with one of his hideous and cursed grins,' He pointed to the cart in front of that upon which our poor Renzo was seated. Then, composing his face to an expression of seriousness, still more wicked and revolting, he made a bow in that direction and resumed. "'May it please you, my lord, to let a poor wretch of a monato taste a little of this wine from your cellar? Mind you, sir, our way of life is only so-so. We have taken you into our carriage to give you a ride into the country, and then it takes very little wine to do harm to your lordship's. The poor Manati have good stomachs. And amidst the loud laughs of his companions, he took the flask and lifted it up, but before drinking turned to Renzo, and fixed his eyes on his face, and said to him, with a certain air of scornful compassion, The devil with whom you have made agreement must be very young, for if we hadn't been by to rescue you, he'd have given you mighty assistance. And amidst a fresh outburst of laughter, he applied the flagon to his lips. "'Give us some! What? Give us some!' shouted many voices from the preceding car. The ruffian, having swallowed as much as he wished, handed the great flask with both hands into those of his fellow ruffians, who continued passing it round, until one of them, having emptied it, grasped it by the neck, slung it round in the air two or three times, and dashed it to atoms upon the pavement, crying, "'Long live the pestilence!' He then broke into one of their licentious ballads, and was soon accompanied by all the rest of this depraved chorus. The infernal song, mingled with the tinkling of the bells, the rattle of the cart, and the trampling of men and horses, resounded through the silent vacuity of the streets, and echoing in the houses, bitterly wrung the hearts of the few who still inhabited them. But what cannot sometimes turn to advantage? What cannot appear good in some cases or another? The extremity of a moment before had rendered more than tolerable to Renzo the company of these dead and living companions, and now the sounds that relieved him from the awkwardness of such a conversation were, I had almost said, acceptable, music to his ears. Still half bewildered and in great agitation, he thanked Providence in his heart, best he could, that he had escaped such imminent danger without receiving or inflicting injury. He prayed for assistance to deliver himself now from his deliverers, and for his part kept on the lookout, watching his companions, and reconnoitering the road, that he might seize the proper moment to slide quietly down, without giving them an opportunity of making any disturbance or uproar, which might stir up mischief in the passers-by. And, lo, on turning a corner, he seemed to recognize the place along which they were about to pass. He looked more attentively and at once knew it by more certain signs. Does the reader know where he was? In the direct course to the Porta Orientale, in that very street along which he had gone so slowly and returned so speedily about twenty months before. He quickly remembered that from thence he could go straight to the lazaretto, and this finding of himself in the right way without any endeavor on his own, and without direction, he looked upon as a special token of divine guidance, and a good omen of what remained. At that moment a commissary came to meet the cars, who called out to the Manati to stop, and I know not what besides. It need only be said that they came to a halt, and the music was changed into clamorous dialogues. One of the Manati seated on Renzo's car jumped down. Renzo said to the other, Thank you for your kindness. God reward you for it and sprang down at the opposite side. 
"'Get you gone, poor poisoner,' replied the man. "'You'll not be the fellow that'll ruin Milan.' Fortunately, there was no one at hand who could overhear him. The party had stopped on the left side of the street. Renzo hastily crossed over to the opposite side, and keeping close to the wall, trudged onwards toward the bridge, crossed it, followed the well-known street of the Borgo, and recognized the convent of the Capuchins. He comes close to the gate— sees the projecting corner of the lazaretto, passes through the palisade, and the scene outside the enclosure is laid open to his view, not so much an indication and specimen of the interior as itself a vast, diversified, and indescribable scene. Along the two sides which are visible to a spectator from this point, all was bustle and confusion. There was a great concourse, an influx and reflux of people, sick, flocking in crowds to the lazaretto, some sitting or lying on the edge of one or other of the moats that flanked the road, whose strength had proved insufficient to carry them within their place of retreat, or, when they had abandoned it in despair, had equally failed to convey them further. Others were wandering about as if stupefied, and not a few were absolutely beside themselves. One would be eagerly relating his fancies to a miserable creature laboring under the malady, another would be actually raving, while a third appeared with a smiling countenance, as if assisting at some gay spectacle. But the strangest and most clamorous kind of so melancholy a gaiety was a loud and continual singing, which seemed to proceed from that wretched assembly, and even drowned all the other voices, a popular song of love, joyous and playful, one of those which are called rural, and following this sound by the eye to discover who could possibly be so cheerful, yonder, tranquilly seated in the bottom of the ditch that washes the walls of the lazaretto, he perceived a poor wretch, with upturned eyes, singing at the very stretch of his voice. Renzo had scarcely gone a few yards along the south side of the edifice, when an extraordinary noise arose in the crowd, and a distant cry of, "'Take care!' and "'Stop him!' He stood upon tiptoe, looked forward, and beheld a jaded horse galloping at full speed, impelled forward by a still more wretched-looking rider, a poor frantic creature, who, seeing the beast loose and unguarded standing by a cart, had hastily mounted his bare back, and striking him on the neck with his fists, and spurring him with his heels, was urging him impetuously onward. Manati were following, shouting, and howling, and all were enveloped in a cloud of dust, which whirled round their heads. Confounded and weary with the sight of so much misery, the youth arrived at the gate of that abode, where perhaps more was concentrated than had been scattered over the whole space it had yet been his fortune to traverse. He walked up to the door, entered under the vaulted roof, and stood for a moment without moving in the middle of the portico. End of chapter 34 Part Two. Chapter Thirty Five, Part One of the Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small. The Betrothed, by Alessandro Manzoni, Chapter Thirty Five. Part One. Let the reader imagine the enclosure of the lazaretto, peopled with sixteen thousand persons ill of the plague, the whole area encumbered, here with tents and cabins, there with carts, elsewhere with people, those two interminable ranges of portico to the right and left, covered, crowded with dead or dying, stretched upon mattresses or the bare straw, and throughout the whole of this, so to say, immense den, a commotion, a fluctuation like the swell of the sea, and within, people coming and going, stopping and running, some sinking under disease, others rising from their sick beds, either convalescent, frantic, or to attend upon others. Such was the spectacle which suddenly burst upon Renzo's view, and forced him to pause there, horror-struck and overpowered. We do not intend to describe this spectacle by itself, for which, doubtless, none of our readers would thank us. We will only follow our youth in his painful walk, stop where he stopped, 
and relate what he happened to witness, so far as is necessary to explain what he did, and what chanced to occur to him. From the gate where he stood, up to the temple in the middle, and from that again to the opposite gate, ran a kind of pathway, free from cabins and every other substantial impediment, and, at a second glance, he observed a great bustle of removing carts, and making the way clear, and discovered officers and capuchins directing this operation, and at the same time dismissing all those who had no business there. Fearing, lest he also should be turned out in this manner, he slipped in between the pavilions, on the side to which he had casually turned, the right. He went forward, according as he found room to set his foot down, from cabin to cabin, popping his head into each, casting his eye upon every one who lay outside, gazing upon countenances broken down by suffering, contracted by spasm, or motionless in death. Perchance he might happen to find that one which, nevertheless, he dreaded to find. He had already, however, gone some considerable distance, and often and often repeated this melancholy inspection without having yet seen a single woman. He concluded, therefore, that these must be lodged in a separate quarter. So far he guessed, but of the whereabouts he had no indication, nor could he form the least conjecture. From time to time he met attendants, as different in appearance, dress, and behavior, as the motive was different, an opposite which gave to both one and the other strength to live in the exercise of such offices. In the one, the extinction of all feelings of compassion. In the other, compassion more than human. But from neither did he attempt to ask directions, for fear of creating for himself new obstacles, and he resolved to walk on by himself till he succeeded in discovering women. And as he walked along, he failed not to look narrowly around, though from time to time he was compelled to withdraw his eyes, overcome and, as it were, dazzled, by the spectacle of so great miseries. Yet, whither could he turn them? Where suffer them to rest, save upon other miseries as great? The very air and sky added, if anything could add, to the horror of these sights. The fog had condensed by degrees, and resolved itself into large clouds, which, becoming darker and darker, made it seem like the tempestuous closing in of evening except that towards the zenith of this deep and lowering sky the sun's disk was visible as from behind a thick veil, pale, emitting around a very feeble light, which was speedily exhaled, and pouring down a death-like and oppressive heat. Every now and then, amidst the vast murmur that floated around, was heard a deep rumbling of thunder, interrupted, as it were, and irresolute, nor could the listener distinguish from which side it came. He might, indeed, easily have deemed it a distant sound of cars, unexpectedly coming to a stand. In the country road not a twig bent under a breath of air, not a bird was seen to alight or fly away. The swallow, alone appearing suddenly from the eaves of the enclosure, skimmed along the ground with extended wing, sweeping, as it were, the surface of the field, but alarmed at the surrounding confusion, rapidly mounted again into the air and flew away. It was one of those days in which, among a party of travellers, not one of them breaks the silence, and the hunter walks pensively along, with his eyes bent to the ground, and the peasant, digging in the field, pauses in his song, without being aware of it. One of those days which are the forerunners of a tempest, in which nature, as if motionless without, while agitated by internal travail, seems to oppress every living thing and to add an undefinable weight to every employment, to idleness, to existence itself. But in that abode specially assigned to suffering and death, men hitherto struggling with their malady might be seen sinking under this new pressure. They were to be seen by hundreds, rapidly becoming worse, and at the same time the last struggle was more distressing, and in the augmentation of suffering the groans were still more stifled nor, perhaps, had there yet been in that place an hour of bitterness equal to this. The youth had already threaded his way for some time without success through this maze of cabins, when in the variety of lamentations and confused murmurs he begun to distinguish a singular intermixture of bleedings 
and infant's cries. He arrived at length before a cracked and disjointed wooden partition, from within which this extraordinary sound proceeded, and peeping through a large aperture between two boards, he beheld an enclosure scattered throughout with little huts, and in these, as well as in the spaces of the small camp between the cabins, not the usual occupants of an infirmary, but infants, lying upon little beds, pillows, sheets, or cloths spread upon the ground, and nurses and other women busily attending upon them, and, which above everything else attracted and engrossed his attention, she-goats mingled with these, and acting as their coadjutrices, a hospital of innocence, such as the place and time could afford them. It was, I say, a novel sight to behold some of these animals standing quietly over this or that infant, giving it suck, and another hastening at the cry of a child, as if endued with maternal feeling, and stopping by the side of the little claimant, and contriving to dispose itself over the infant, and bleeding and fidgeting, almost as if demanding some one to come to the assistance of both. Here and there nurses were seated with infants at the breast, some employing such expressions of affection as raised a doubt in the mind of the spectator whether they had been induced to repair thither by the promises of reward, or by that voluntary benevolence which goes in search of the needy and afflicted. One of these, with deep sorrow depicted in her countenance, drew from her breast a poor weeping little creature, and mournfully went to look for an animal which might be able to supply her place. Another regarded with a compassionate look the little one asleep in her bosom, and gently kissing it, went to lay it on a bed in one of the cabins, while a third, surrendering her breast to the stranger suckling, with an air not of negligence, but of preoccupation, gazed fixedly up to heaven. What was she thinking of with that gesture, with that look? but of one brought forth from her own bowels, who, perhaps only a short time before, had been nourished at that breast, perchance had expired on that bosom. Other women, of more experience, supplied different offices. One would run at the cry of a famished child, lift it from the ground, and carry it to a goat, feeding upon a heap of fresh herbage, and applying it to the creature's paps would chide, and at the same time coax the inexperienced animal with her voice that it might quietly lend itself to its new office. Another would spring forward to drive off a goat which was trampling underfoot a poor babe in its eagerness to suckle another, while a third was carrying about her own infant and rocking it in her arms, now trying to lull it to sleep by singing, now to pacify it with soothing words, and calling it by a name she had herself given it. At this moment a capuchin with a very white beard arrived bringing two screaming infants, one in each arm, which he had just taken from their dying mothers. And a woman ran to receive them, and went to seek among the crowd, and in the flocks, some one that would immediately supply the place of a mother. More than once the youth, urged by his anxiety, had torn himself from the opening to resume his way, and, after all, had again peeped in to watch another moment or two. Having at length left the place, he went on close along the partition, until a group of huts, which were propped against it, compelled him to turn aside. He then went round the cabins with the intention of regaining the partition, turning the corner of the enclosure, and making some fresh discoveries. But while he was looking forward to reconnoitre his way, a sudden, transient, instantaneous apparition struck his eye, and put him in great agitation. He saw, about a hundred yards off, a capuchin threading his way and quickly becoming lost among the pavilions. A capuchin who, even thus passingly and at a distance, had all the bearing, motions, and figure of Father Cristoforo. With the frantic eagerness the reader can imagine, he sprang forward in that direction, looking here and there, winding about, backward, forward, inside and out, by circles, and through narrow passages until he again saw, with increased joy, the form of the selfsame friar. He saw him at a little distance, just leaving a large boiling-pot, and going with a porringer in his hands towards a cabin. Then he beheld him seat himself in the doorway, make the sign of the cross on the basin he held before him, and looking around him, like one constantly on the alert, begin to eat. It was, indeed, 
Father Cristoforo. The history of the friar, from the point at which we lost sight of him, up to the present meeting, may be told in a few words. He had never removed from Rimini, nor even thought of removing, until the plague, breaking out in Milan, afforded him the opportunity he had long so earnestly desired, of sacrificing his life for his fellow creatures. He urgently entreated that he might be recalled from Rimini to assist and attend upon the infected patients. The Count, Attilio's uncle, was dead, and besides, the times required tenders of the sick rather than politicians so that his request was granted without difficulty. He came immediately to Milan, entered the lazaretto, and had now been there about three months. But the consolation Renzo felt in thus again seeing his good friar was not for a moment unalloyed. Together with the certainty that it was he, he was also made painfully aware of how much he was changed. His stooping and, as it were, laborious carriage, his wan and shriveled face, all betokened an exhausted nature, a broken and sinking frame, which was assisted, and as it were upheld, from hour to hour only by the energy of his mind. He kept his eye fixed on the youth who was approaching him, and who was seeking by gestures, not daring to do so with his voice, to make him distinguish and recognize him. "'Oh, Father Cristoforo!' said he at last, when he was near enough to be heard without shouting. "'You here!' said the friar, setting the porringer on the ground and rising from his seat. "'How are you, father? How are you?' "'Better than the many poor creatures you see,' replied the friar, and his voice was feeble, hollow, and as changed as everything else about him. His eye alone was what it always was, or had something about it even more bright and resplendent, as if charity, elevated by the approaching end of her labors, and exulting in the consciousness of being near her source, restored it a more ardent and purer fire than that which infirmity was every hour extinguishing. "'But you,' pursued he, "'how is it you're in this place? What makes you come thus to brave the pestilence?' "'I've had it, thank heaven. I come to seek for Lucia.' "'Lucia? Is Lucia here?' "'She is.' At least I hope in God she may still be here. Is she your wife? Oh, my dear father, my wife? No, that she's not. Don't you know anything of what has happened? No, my son. Since God removed me to a distance from you, I've never heard anything further. But now that he has sent you to me, I tell you the truth, that I wish very much to know. But, and the sentence of outlawry? You know, then, what things they've done to me. But you, what had you done? Listen, if I were to say that I was prudent that day in Milan, I should tell a lie. But I didn't do a single wicked action. I believe you. And I believed it, too, before. Now, then, I may tell you all. Wait, said the friar, and going a few yards out of the hut, he called, Father Vittore! In a moment or two, a young Capuchin appeared, to whom Cristoforo said, "'Do me the kindness, Father Vittore, to take my share, too, of waiting upon patience, while I am absent for a little while. And if any one should ask for me, will you be good enough to call me? That one particularly, if ever he gives the least sign of returning consciousness, let me be informed of it directly for charity's sake.' The young friar answered that he would do as he requested, and then Cristoforo, turning to Renzo, said, let us go in here. But, added he directly, stopping, you seem to me very tired. You must want something to eat. So I do, said Renzo. Now that you've reminded me, I remember I'm still fasting. Stay, said the friar, and taking another porringer he went to fill it from the large boiler. He then returned and offered it with a spoon to Renzo, made him sit down on a straw mattress which served him for a bed went to a cask that stood in one corner, and drew a glass of wine, which he set on a little table near his guest, and then, taking up his own porringer, seated himself beside him. "'Oh, Father Cristoforo,' said Renzo, "'is it your business to do all this? But you are always the same. I thank you with all my heart.' "'Don't thank me,' said the friar. "'That belongs to the poor. But you, too, are a poor man just now.' 
Now, then, tell me what I don't know. Tell me about our poor Lucia, and try to do it in a few words, for time is scarce, and there is plenty to be done, as you see. End of chapter 35, part 1 Chapter thirty five, part two of the betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small. The betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter thirty five, part two. Renzo began between one spoonful and another to relate the history of Lucia, how she had been sheltered in the monastery at Monza, how she had been forcibly carried off. At the idea of such sufferings and such dangers, and at the thought that it was he who had directed the poor innocent to that place, the good friar became almost breathless with emotion, but he was quickly relieved on hearing how she had been miraculously liberated, restored to her mother, and placed by her with Donna Prasedi. "'Now I will tell you about myself,' pursued the narrator, and he briefly sketched the day he spent in Milan, his flight, how he had long been absent from home, and now, everything being turned upside down, he had ventured to go thither, how he had not found Agnesi there, and how he had learned at Milan that Lucia was at the Lazaretto. "'And here I am,' he concluded, "'here I am to look for her, to see if she's still living, and if—' She'll still have me, because sometimes— But how were you directed here? asked the friar. Have you any information whereabouts she was lodged, or at what time she came? None, dear father, none, except that she is here, if indeed she be still living, which may God grant. Oh, you poor fellow! But what search have you yet made here? I've wandered and wandered about, but hitherto I have scarcely seen anything but men. I thought that the women must be in a separate quarter, but I haven't yet succeeded in finding it. If it is really so, now you can tell me. Don't you know, my son, that men are forbidden to enter that quarter, unless they have some business there? Well, and what could happen to me? The regulation is just and good, my dear son and if the number and weight of sorrows forbid the possibility of it being respected with full rigor, is that a reason why an honest man should transgress it? But Father Cristoforo, said Renzo, Lucia ought to be my wife. You know how we've been separated. It's twenty months that I've suffered and borne patiently. I've come as far as here, at the risk of so many things, one worse than the other, and now then, I don't know what to say resumed the friar, replying rather to his own thoughts than to the words of the young man. You are going with a good intention, and would to God that all who have free access to that place would conduct themselves as I can feel sure you will do. God, who certainly blesses this your perseverance of affection, this your faithfulness, in wishing and seeking for her whom he has given you. God, who is more rigorous than men, yet more indulgent, will not regard what may be irregular in your mode of seeking for her. Only remember that for your behavior in this place we shall both have to render an account, not probably to men, but without fail at the bar of God. Come this way. So saying, he rose. Renzo followed his example, and without neglecting to listen to his words, had, in the meantime, determined in himself not to speak as he had at first intended about Lucia's vow. If he hears this too, thought he, he will certainly raise more difficulties. Either I will find her, and then there will be time enough to discuss it, or, and then what will it matter? Leading him to the door of the cabin, which faced towards the north, the friar resumed. Listen to me. Father Felice, the president of the Lazaretto, will to-day conduct the few who have recovered to perform their quarantine elsewhere. You see that church there in the middle? And raising his thin and tremulous hand, he pointed out to the left, through the cloudy atmosphere, the cupola of the little temple rising above the miserable tents, and continued, 
About there they are now assembling to go out in procession through the gate, by which you must have entered. Ah! It was for this, then, that they were trying to clear the passage. Just so. And you must also have heard some tollings of the bell. I heard one. It was the second. When the third rings they will all be assembled. Father Felice will address a few words to them, and then they will set off. At this signal do you go thither. Contrive to place yourself behind the assembly on the edge of the passage, where, without giving trouble, or being observed, you can watch them pass. And look, look, look if she is there. If it be not God's will that she should be there, that quarter, and he again raised his hand and pointed to the side of the edifice which faced them, that quarter of the building, and part of the field before it, are assigned to the women. You will see some paling that divides this from that enclosure, but here and there broken and interrupted, so that you'll find no difficulty in gaining admittance. Once in, if you do nothing to give offence, no one probably will say anything to you. If, however, they should make any opposition, say that Father Cristoforo knows you, and will answer for you. Seek her there. Seek her with confidence and with resignation, for you must remember it is a great thing you have come to ask here, a person alive within the lazaretto. Do you know how often I have seen my poor people here renewed? How many I have seen carried off? How few go out recovered? Go, prepared to make a sacrifice. Ay, I understand, interrupted Renzo, his eyes rolling wildly, and his face becoming very dark and threatening. I understand. I go. I'll look in one place for another, from top to bottom of the lazaretto, and if I don't find her, if you don't find her, said the friar, with an air of grave and serious expectation and an admonishing look. But Renzo, whose anger had for some time been swelling in his bosom, and now clouded his sight, and deprived him of all feelings of respect, repeated and continued, If I don't find her, I'll succeed in finding somebody else, either in Milan, or in his detestable palace, or at the end of the world, or in the abode of the devil. I'll find that rascal who separated us, that villain but for whom Lucia would have been mine twenty months ago, and if we had been doomed to die, we would at least have died together. If that fellow still lives, I'll find him. Renzo, said the friar, grasping him by one arm and gazing on him still more severely. And if I find him, continued he, perfectly blinded with rage, if the plague hasn't already wrought justice, this is no longer a time when a coward with his bravos at his heels can drive people to desperation and then mock at them. A time has come when men meet each other face to face. I'll get justice. Miserable wretch! cried Father Cristoforo in a voice which had assumed its former full and sonorous tone. Miserable wretch! And he raised his sunken head. His cheeks became flushed with their original color, and the fire that flashed from his eyes had something terrible in it. Look at you, miserable man! And while with one hand he grasped and strongly shook Renzo's arm, he waved the other before him, pointing, as well as he could, to the mournful scene around them. See who is he that chastises, who is he that judges and is not judged, he that scourges and forgives, but you, a worm of the earth, you would get justice, you? Do you know what justice is? Away, unhappy man, away with you! I hoped, yes, I did hope that before my death God would have given me the comfort of hearing that my poor Lucia was alive, perhaps of seeing her and hearing her promise me that she would send one prayer toward the grave where I shall be laid. Go! You have robbed me of this hope. God has not let her remain upon earth for you, and you surely cannot have the hardihood to believe yourself worthy that God should think of comforting you. He will have thought of her, for she was one of those souls for whom eternal consolations are reserved. Go! I've no longer time to listen to you. And so saying, he threw from him Renzo's arm, and moved toward a cabin of the sick. 
"'Ah, oh, father!' said Renzo, following him with a supplicating air. "'Will you send me away in this manner?' "'What?' rejoined the Capuchin, relaxing nothing of his severity. "'Dare you require that I should steal the time from these poor afflicted ones, who are waiting for me to speak to them of the pardon of God, to listen to your words of fury, your propositions of revenge? I listened to you when you asked consolation and direction. I neglected one duty of charity for the sake of another. But now you have vengeance in your heart. What do you want with me? Be gone! I have beheld those die here who have been offended and have forgiven. Offenders who have mourned that they could not humble themselves before the offended. I have wept with both one and the other. But what have I to do with you? Ah! Oh, I forgive him! I forgive him indeed and for ever! exclaimed the youth. Renzo, said the friar, with more tranquil sternness, bethink yourself, and just say how often you have forgiven him. And having waited a moment without receiving a reply, he suddenly bent his head, and with an appeased voice resumed, You know why I bear this habit? Renzo hesitated. You know it, resumed the old man. I do, answered Renzo. I, too, have hated, and therefore I have rebuked you for a thought, for a word, the man whom I hated, whom I cordially hated, whom I had long hated, that man I murdered. Yes, but a tyrant, one of those— Hush! interrupted the friar. Think you that if there were a good reason for it, I shouldn't have found it in thirty years? Ah, if I could now instill into your heart the sentiment I have ever since had, and still have, for the man I hated, if I could, I? But God can, and may he do so. Listen, Renzo, he wishes you more good than you even wish yourself. You have dared to meditate revenge, but he has power and mercy enough to prevent you. He bestows upon you a favor of which another was too unworthy. You know, and you have often and often said it, that he can arrest the hand of the oppressor, but remember, he can also arrest that of the revengeful. And think you that, because you are poor, because you are injured, he cannot defend against your vengeance a man whom he has created in his own image? Did you think that he would suffer you to do all you wished? No. But do you know what he can do? You may hate and be lost forever. You may, by such a temper of mind as this, deprive yourself of every blessing. For however things may go with you, whatever condition you may be placed in, rest assured that all will be punishment until you have forgiven, forgiven in such a way that you may never again be able to say, I forgive him. Yes, yes, said Renzo, with deep shame and emotion. I see now that I have never before really forgiven him. I see that I have spoken like a beast and not like a Christian. And now, by the grace of God, I will forgive him. Yes, I'll forgive him from my very heart. And supposing you were to see him, I would pray the Lord to give me patience and to touch his heart. Would you remember that the Lord has not only commanded us to forgive our enemies, but also to love them? Would you remember that he so loved him as to lay down his life for him? Yes, by his help I would. Well, then, come and see him. You have said, I'll find him, and you shall find him. Come, and you shall see against whom you would nourish hatred, to whom you could wish evil, and be ready to do it, of what life you would render yourself master. And taking Renzo's hand, which he grasped as a healthy young man would have done, he moved forward. Renzo followed, without daring to ask anything further. After a short walk, the friar stopped near the entrance of a cabin, fixed his eyes on Renzo's face with a mixture of gravity and tenderness, and drew him in. The first thing he observed on entering was a sick person, seated on some straw in the background, who did not, however, seem very ill, but rather recovering from illness. On seeing the father, he shook his head as if to say no. 
The father bent his with an air of sorrow and resignation. Renzo, meanwhile, eyeing the surrounding objects with uneasy curiosity, beheld three or four sick persons and distinguished one against the wall, lying upon a bed, and wrapped in a sheet with a nobleman's cloak laid upon him as a quilt. He gazed at him, recognized Don Rodrigo, and involuntarily shrank back, but the friar again, making him feel the hand by which he held him, drew him to the foot of the bed, and stretching over it his other hand, pointed to the man who lay there prostrate. The unhappy being was perfectly motionless. His eyes were open, but he saw nothing. His face was pale and covered with black spots, his lips black and swollen. It would have been called the face of a corpse, had not convulsive twitchings revealed a tenacity of life. His bosom heaved from time to time with painfully short respiration, and his right hand laid outside the cloak, pressing it closely to his heart, with a firm grasp of his clenched fingers, which were of a livid color, and black at the extremities. "'You see,' said the friar, in a low and solemn voice, "'this may be a punishment, or it may be mercy. The disposition you now have towards this man, who certainly has offended you, that disposition will God, whom assuredly you have offended, have towards you at the great day. Bless him, and be blessed. For four days has he lain there, as you see him, without giving any signs of consciousness. Perhaps the Lord is ready to grant him an hour of repentance, but waits for you to ask it. Perhaps it is his will that you should pray for it with that innocent creature. Perhaps he reserves the mercy for your solitary prayer, the prayer of an afflicted and resigned heart. Perhaps the salvation of this man and your own depend at this moment upon yourself, upon the disposition of your mind to forgiveness, to compassion, to love. He ceased, and joining his hands, bent his head over them both as if in prayer. Renzo did the same. They had been for a few moments in this position, when they heard the third tolling of the bell. Both moved together as if by agreement, and went out. The one made no inquiries, the other no protestations. Their countenances spoke. "'Go now,' resumed the friar. "'Go prepared to make a sacrifice, and to bless God, whatever be the issue of your researches. And whatever it be, come and give me an account of it. We will praise Him together.' Here. Without further words they parted. The one returned to the place he had left, the other set off to the little temple, which was scarcely more than a stone's throw distant. End of chapter 35, part 2For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small The Betrothed by Alessandra Manzoni Chapter 36, Part 1 Who would ever have told Renzo, a few hours before, that in the very crisis of his search, at the approach of the moment of greatest suspense, which was so soon to be decisive, his heart would have been divided between Lucia and Don Rodrigo. Yet so it was. That figure he had just beheld came and mingled itself in all the dear or terrible pictures which either hope or fear alternately brought before him in the course of his walk. The words he had heard at the foot of the bed blended themselves with the conflicting thoughts by which his mind was agitated, and he could not conclude a prayer for the happy issue of this great experiment without connecting with it that which he had begun there, and which the sound of the bell had abruptly terminated. The small octagonal temple, which stood elevated from the ground by several steps, in the middle of the lazaretto, was, in its original construction, open on every side, without other support than pilasters and columns, a perforated building, so to say. In each front was an arch between two columns, Within, a portico ran round that which might more properly be called the church, but which was composed only of eight arches supported by pilasters, surmounted by a small cupola, 
and corresponding to those on the outside of the arcade, so that the altar, erected in the center, might be seen from the window of each room in the enclosure, and almost from any part of the encampment. Now the edifice being converted to quite a different use, the spaces of the eight fronts are walled up, but the ancient framework, which still remains uninjured, indicates with sufficient clearness the original condition and destination of the building. Renzo had scarcely started when Father Felice made his appearance in the portico of the temple, and advanced toward the arch in the middle of the side which faces the city, in front of which the assembly were arranged at the foot of the steps and along the course prepared for them, and shortly he perceived by his manner that he had begun the sermon, and therefore went round by some little by-paths, so as to attain the rear of the audience, as had been suggested to him. Arrived there, he stood very quietly, and ran over the hole with his eye but he could see nothing from his position except a mass, I had almost said a pavement of heads. In the center there were some covered with handkerchiefs or veils, and here he fixed his eyes more attentively, but failing to distinguish anything more clearly, he also raised them to where all the others were directed. He was touched and affected by the venerable figure of the speaker, and with all the attention he could command in such a moment of expectation, listened to the following portion of his solemn address. Let us remember for a moment the thousands and thousands who have there gone forth, and raising his finger above his shoulder, he pointed behind him toward the gate which led to the cemetery of San Gregorio, the whole of which was then, we might say, one immense grave. Let us cast an eye around upon the thousands and thousands who are still left here, uncertain, alas! but which way will they go forth? Let us look at ourselves, so few in number, who are about to go forth, restored. Blessed be the Lord! Blessed be He in His justice! Blessed in His mercy! Blessed in death, and blessed in life! Blessed in the choice He has been pleased to make of us! Oh, why has He so pleased, my brethren, if not to preserve to Himself a little remnant corrected by affliction, and warmed with gratitude, if not in order that feeling more vividly than ever how life is his gift, we may esteem it as a gift from his hands, and employ it in such works as we may dare to offer him, if not in order that the remembrance of our own sufferings may make us compassionate toward others, and ever ready to relieve them. In the meanwhile, let those in whose company we have suffered, hoped, and feared, among whom we are leaving friends and relatives, and who are all besides our brethren. Let those among them, who will see us pass through the midst of them, not only derive some relief from the thought that others are going out hence in health, but also be edified by our behavior. God forbid that they should behold us in a clamorous festivity, a carnal joy at having escaped that death against which they are still struggling. Let them see that we depart in thanksgivings for ourselves, and prayers for them. And let them be able to say, Even beyond these walls they will not forget us. They will continue to pray for us poor creatures. Let us begin from this time, from the first steps we are about to take, a life wholly made of love. Let those who have regained their former vigor lend a brotherly arm to the feeble. Young men, sustain the aged. You who are left without children, look around you how many children are left without parents. Be such to them, and this charity, covering the multitude of sins, will also alleviate your own sorrows. Here a deep murmur of groans and sobs, which had been increasing in the assembly, was suddenly suspended on seeing the preacher put a rope round his neck and fall upon his knees and in profound silence they stood waiting what he was about to say. For me, continued he, and the rest of my companions who, without any merit of our own, have been chosen out for the high privilege of serving Christ in you, I humbly implore your forgiveness, if we have not worthily fulfilled so great a ministry, if slothfulness, if the ungovernableness of the flesh, has rendered us less attentive to your necessities, 
less ready to answer your calls. If unjust impatience or blameworthy weariness has sometimes made us show you a severe and dispirited countenance, if the miserable thought that we were necessary to you has sometimes induced us to fail in treating you with that humility which became us, if our frailty has led us hastily to commit any action which has been a cause of offence to you, forgive us, and so may God forgive you all your trespasses, and bless you. Then, making the sign of a large cross over the assembly, he rose. We have succeeded in relating, if not the actual words, at least the sense of burden of those which he really uttered. But the manner in which they were delivered, it is impossible to describe. It was the manner of one who called it a privilege to attend upon the infected, because he felt it to be so, who confessed that he had not worthily acted up to it, because he was conscious he had not done so, who besought forgiveness, because he was convinced he stood in need of it. But the people who had beheld these Capuchins as they went about, engaged in nothing but waiting upon them, who had seen so many sink under that duty, and him who was now addressing them ever in the foremost in toil as in authority, except indeed when he himself was lying at the point of death. Think with what sighs and tears they responded to such an appeal. The admirable friar then took a large cross, which stood resting against a pillar, elevated it before him, left his sandals at the edge of the outside portico, and through the midst of the crowd, which reverently made way for him, proceeded to place himself at their head. Renzo, no less affected than if he had been one of those from whom this singular forgiveness was requested, also withdrew a little further, and succeeded in placing himself by the side of a cabin. Here he stood waiting, with his body half concealed, and his head stretched forward, his eyes wide open, and his heart beating violently but at the same time with a kind of new and particular confidence arising, I think from the tenderness of spirit which the sermon and the spectacle of the general emotion had excited in him. Father Felice now came up, barefoot, with the rope round his neck, and that tall and heavy cross elevated before him. His face was pale and haggard, inspiring both sorrow and encouragement. He walked with slow but resolute steps, like one who would spare the weakness of others, and in everything was like a man to whom these supernumerary labors and troubles imparted strength to sustain those which were necessary and inseparable from his charge. Immediately behind him came the taller children, barefooted for the most part, very few entirely clothed, and some actually in their shirts. Then came the women, almost every one leading a little child by the hand, and alternately chanting the miserere, while the feebleness of their voices, and the paleness and languor of their countenances, were enough to fill the heart of any one with pity who chanced to be there as a mere spectator. But Renzo was gazing and examining from rank to rank, from face to face, without passing over one, for which the extremely slow advance of the procession gave him abundant leisure. On and on it goes. He looks and looks always to no purpose. He keeps glancing rapidly over the crowd which still remains behind, and which is gradually diminishing. Now there are very few rows. We are at the last. All are gone by. All were unknown faces. With drooping arms and head reclining on one shoulder, he suffered his eye still to wander after that little band, while that of the men passed before him. His attention was again arrested, and a new hope arose in his mind, on seeing some carts appear behind these, bearing those convalescents who were not yet able to walk. Here the women came last, and the train proceeded at so deliberate a pace that Renzo could with equal ease review all these without one escaping his scrutiny. But what then? He examined the first cart, the second, the third, and so on one by one, always with the same result, up to the very last, behind which followed a solitary Capuchin, with a grave countenance and a stick in his hand, as the regulator of the cavalcade. It was that Father Michel, 
whom we have mentioned as being appointed coadjutor in the government with Father Felice. Thus was this soothing hope completely dissipated, and as it was dissipated, it not only carried away the comfort it had brought along with it, but as is generally the case, left him in a worse condition than before. Now the happiest alternative was to find Lucia ill. Yet while increasing fears took the place of the ardor of present hope, he clung with all the powers of his mind to this melancholy and fragile thread, and issuing into the road, pursued his way toward the place the procession had just left. On reaching the foot of the little temple, he went and knelt down upon the lowest step, and there poured forth a prayer to God, or rather a crowd of unconnected expressions, broken sentences, ejaculations, entreaties, complaints, and promises, one of those addresses which are never made to men, because they have not sufficient quickness to understand them, nor patience to listen to them. They are not great enough to feel compassion without contempt. He rose, somewhat more reanimated, went round the temple, came into the other road which he had not before seen, and which led to the opposite gate, and after going on a little way, saw on both sides the paling the friar had told him about, but full of breaks and gaps, exactly as he had said. He entered through one of these, and found himself in the quarter assigned to the women. Almost at the first step he took, he saw lying on the ground a little bell, such as the Monati wore upon their feet, quite perfect, with all its straps and buckles, and it immediately struck him that perhaps such an instrument might serve him as a passport in that place. He therefore picked it up, and looking round to see if any one was watching him, buckled it on. He then set himself to his search, to that search which, were it only for the multiplicity of the objects, would have been extremely wearisome. Even had those objects been anything but what they were, he began to survey, or rather to contemplate, new scenes of suffering, in part so similar to those he had already witnessed, in part so dissimilar. For under the same calamity, there was here a different kind of suffering, a different languor, a different complaining, a different endurance, a different kind of mutual pity and assistance. There was, too, in the spectator, another kind of compassion, and another feeling of horror. He had now gone I know not how far, without success, and without accidents, when he heard a, Hey! a call which seemed to be addressed to him. He turned round and saw at a little distance a commissary, who, with uplifted hand, was beckoning to none other but himself, and crying, There, in those rooms you're wanted, here we've only just finished clearing away. Renzo immediately perceived whom he was taken for, and that the little bell was the cause of the mistake. He called himself a great fool for having thought only of the inconveniences which this token might enable him to avoid, and not of those which it might draw down upon him and at the same instant devised a plan to free himself from the difficulty. He repeatedly nodded to him in a hurried manner, as if to say he understood and would obey, and then got out of sight by slipping aside between the cabins. When he thought himself far enough off, he began to think about dismissing this cause of offence, and to perform the operation without being observed. He stationed himself in the narrow passage between two little huts, which had their backs turned to each other stooping down to unloose the buckles, and in this position resting his head against the straw wall of one of the cabins, a voice reached his ear from inside. Oh, heavens! Is it possible? His whole soul was in that ear. He held his breath. Yes, indeed, it is that voice. Fear of what? said the gentle voice. We have passed through much worse than a storm. He who has preserved us hitherto will preserve us even now. If Renzo uttered no cry, it was not for fear of being discovered, but because he had no breath to utter it. His knees failed beneath him, his sight became dim, but it was only for the first moment. At the second he was on his feet, more alert, more vigorous than ever. In three bounds he was round the cabin, stood at the doorway, saw her who had been speaking, saw her standing by a bedside and bending over it. She turned on hearing a noise, looked, fancied she mistook the object, looked again more fixedly, and exclaimed, "'Oh, blessed Lord! Lucia! 
I found you. I found you. It's really you. You're living, exclaimed Renzo, advancing toward her all in a tremble. Oh, blessed Lord, replied Lucia, trembling far more violently. You? What is this? What? Why? The plague! I've had it, and you? Ah, and I too. And about my mother? I haven't seen her, for she's at Pasturo, I believe. However, she's very well. But you, how pale you still are, how weak you seem. You're recovered, however, aren't you? The Lord has been pleased to leave me a little longer below. Ah, Renzo, why are you here? Why? said Renzo, drawing all the time nearer to her. Do you ask why? Why I should come here? Need I say why? Who is there I ought to think about? Am I no longer Renzo? Are you no longer Lucia? Ah, uh, what are you saying? What are you saying? Didn't my mother write you? Ay, that indeed she did. Fine things to write to an unfortunate, afflicted, fugitive wretch, to a young fellow who has never offered you a single affront at least. But Renzo, Renzo, since you knew, why come? Why? Why come? Oh, Lucia, why come, do you say? After so many promises, are we no longer ourselves? Do you any longer remember what is wanting? Oh, Lord! exclaimed Lucia piteously, clasping her hands and raising her eyes to heaven. Why hast thou not granted me the mercy of taking me to thyself? O oh, Renzo, whatever have you done? See, I was beginning to hope that, in time, you would have forgotten me. A fine hope, indeed. Fine things to tell me to my face. Oh, what have you done, and in this place— among all this misery, among these sights, here, where they do nothing but die, you have— We must pray to God for those who die, and hope that they will go to a good place. But it isn't surely fair, even for this reason, that they who live should live in despair. But Renzo, Renzo, you don't think what you're saying, a promise to the Madonna, a vow. And I tell you, they are promises that go for nothing. Oh, Lord, what do you say? Where have you been all this time? Whom have you mixed with? How are you talking? I'm talking like a good Christian. And I think better of the Madonna than you do, for I believe she doesn't wish for promises that injure one's fellow creatures. If the Madonna had spoken, then indeed. But what has happened? A mere fancy of your own. Don't we know what you ought to promise the Madonna? Promise her that the first daughter we have will call her Maria, for that I'm willing to promise, too. There are things that do much more honor to the Madonna. These are devotions that have some use in them, and do not harm any one. No, no, don't say so. You don't know what you're saying. You don't know what it is to make a vow. You've never been in such circumstances. You haven't tried. Leave me, leave me, for heaven's sake. And she impetuously rushed from him and returned toward the bed. "'Lucia!' said he, without stirring. "'Just tell me this one thing. If there was not this reason, would you be the same to me as ever?' "'Heartless man!' required Lucia, turning round, and with difficulty restraining her tears. "'When you've made me say what's quite useless, what would do me harm, and what perhaps would be sinful, will you be contented then? Go away! Oh, do go away!' I think no more of me. We were not intended for each other. We shall meet again, above. Now we cannot have much longer to stay in this world. Oh, uh, go! Try to let my mother know that I am recovered, and that here, too, God has always helped me, and that I found a kind creature in this good lady, who's like a mother to me. Tell her I hope she will be preserved from this disease, and that we shall see each other again, when and how God pleases." Go away, for heaven's sake, and think no more about me, except when you say your prayers. And like one who has nothing more to say, and wishes to hear nothing further, like one who would withdraw herself from danger, she again retreated closer to the bed, where lay the lady she had mentioned. "'Listen, Lucia, listen,' said Renzo, without, however, attempting to go any nearer. 
"'No, go away, for charity's sake. "'Listen, Father Cristoforo—' "'What? He's here. "'Here? Where? How do you know? "'I've spoken to him a little while ago. "'I've been with him for a short time. "'And a religious man like him, it seems to me, he's here? "'To assist the poor sick, I dare say. "'But he? Has he had the plague? "'Ah, uh, Lucia, I'm afraid.' I'm sadly afraid. And while Renzo was thus hesitating to pronounce the words, which were so distressing to himself, and he felt must be equally so to Lucia, she had again left the bedside, and was once more drawing near him. I'm afraid he has it now. Oh, the poor holy man! But why do I say poor man? Poor me! How is he? Is he in bed? Is he attended? He's up going about and attending upon others. But if you could see his looks and how he totters, one sees so many that it's too easy. To be sure, there's no mistake. Oh, and he's here indeed. Yes, and only a little way off, very little further than from your house to mine, if you remember. Oh, most holy virgin! Well, very little further. You may think whether we didn't talk about you— he said things to me, and if you knew what he showed me, you shall hear, but now I want to tell you what he said to me first. He, with his own lips, told me I did right to come and look for you, and that the Lord approves of a man acting so, and would help me find you, which has really been the truth. But surely he's a saint. So you see? But if he said so, it was because he didn't know a word— what would you have him know about things you've done out of your own head, without rule, and without the advice of any one? A good man, a man of judgment as he is, would never think of things of this kind. But, oh, what he showed me! And here he related his visit to the cabin, while Lucia, however her senses and her mind must have been accustomed in that abode, to the strongest impressions, was completely overwhelmed with horror and compassion. And there, too, pursued Renzo, he spoke like a saint. He said that perhaps the Lord had designed to show mercy to that poor fellow. Now I really cannot give him any other name. And waits to take him at the right moment, but wishes that we should pray for him together. Together! Did you hear? Yes, yes, we will pray for him, each of us, where the Lord shall place us. He will know how to unite our prayers. But if I tell you his very words— But, Renzo, he doesn't know. But don't you see that when it is a saint who speaks, it's the Lord that makes him speak, and that he would not have spoken thus if it shouldn't really be so? And this poor fellow's soul, I have indeed prayed and will still pray for him. I've prayed from my heart, just as if it had been a brother of mine. But how do you wish the poor creature to be, in the other world, if this matter be not settled here below, if the evils he has done be not undone? For if you'll return to reason, then all will be as at first. What has been has been. He's had his punishment here. No, Renzo, no. God would not have us do evil, that he may show mercy. Leave him to do this. And for us— our duty is to pray to him. If I had died that night, could not God then have forgiven him? And if I've not died, if I've been delivered, and your mother, that poor Agnesi, who has always wished me well, and who worked so to see us husband and wife, has she never told you that it was a perverted idea of yours? She, who has made you listen to reason at other times, for on certain subjects she thinks more wisely than you. My mother? Do you think my mother would advise me to break a vow? But, Renzo, you're not in your proper senses. Oh, will you have me say so? You women cannot understand these things. Father Cristoforo told me to go back and tell him whether I had found you. I'm going. We'll hear what he says, whatever he thinks. Yes, yes. Go to that holy man. Tell him that I pray for him, and ask him to do so for me for I need it so much, so very much. But for heaven's sake, for your own soul's sake, and mine, 
never come back here to do me harm, to tempt me. Father Cristoforo will know how to explain things to you, and bring you to your proper senses. He will make you set your heart at rest. My heart at rest? Oh, you may drive this idea right out of your head. You've already had those abominable words written to me, and I know what I've suffered from them, and now you've the heart to say them to me? I tell you plainly and flatly that I'll never set my heart at rest. You want to forget me, but I don't want to forget you. And I assure you, do you hear me, that if you make me lose my senses, I shall never get them again. Away with my business, away with good rules. Will you condemn me to be a madman all my life? And like a madman I shall be. And that poor fellow, the Lord knows whether I've not forgiven him from my heart, but you. Will you make me think for the rest of my life that if he had not? Lucia, you have bid me forget you. Forget you? How can I? Whom do you think I have thought about for all this time, and after so many things, so many promises? What have I done to you since we parted? Do you treat me in this way because I've suffered, because I've had misfortunes, because the world has persecuted me, because I've spent so long a time from home, unhappy and far from you? Because the first moment I could, I came to look for you. End of chapter 36, part 1Chapter thirty six part two of the betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small. The betrothed by Alessandra Manzoni. Chapter thirty six part two. When Lucia could sufficiently command herself to speak, she exclaimed again joining her hands, and raising her eyes to heaven, bathed in tears. Oh, most holy virgin, do thou help me! Thou knowest that since that night I have never passed such a moment as this. Thou didst succor me then, oh, succor me also now! Yes, Lucia, you do right to invoke the Madonna. But why will you believe that she, who is so kind, the mother of mercy, can have pleasure in making us suffer? me at any rate, for a word that escaped you at a moment when you knew not what you were saying. Will you only believe that she helped you then to bring us into trouble afterwards? If, after all, this is only an excuse, if the truth is that I have become hateful to you, tell me so, speak plainly. For pity's sake, Renzo, for pity's sake, for the sake of your poor dead, have done, have done, don't kill me quite. That would not be a good conclusion. Go to Father Cristoforo, commend me to him, and don't come back here. Don't come back here. I go, but you may fancy whether I shall return or not. I'd come back if I was at the end of the world, that I would. And he disappeared. Lucia went and sat down, or rather suffered herself to sink upon the ground by the side of the bed, and resting her head against it, continued to weep bitterly. The lady, who until now had been attentively watching and listening, but had not spoken a word, asked what was the meaning of this apparition, this meeting, these tears. But perhaps the reader in his turn may ask who this person was. We will endeavor to satisfy him in a few words. She was a wealthy tradeswoman of about thirty years of age. In the course of a few days she had witnessed the death of her husband in his own house and every one of her children, and being herself attacked shortly afterwards with the common malady, and conveyed to the lazaretto, she had been accommodated in this little cabin. At the time that Lucia, after having unconsciously surmounted the virulence of the disease, and equally unconsciously changed her companions several times, was beginning to recover and regain her senses, which she had lost since the first commencement of her attack in Don Ferrante's house. The hut could only contain two patients, and an intimacy and affection had very soon sprung up between these associates in sickness, bereavement, and depression, alone as they were in the midst of so great a multitude such as could scarcely have arisen 
from long intercourse under other circumstances. Lucia was soon in a condition to lend her services to her companion, who rapidly became worse. Now that she too had passed the crisis, they served as companions, encouragement, and guards to each other, had made a promise not to leave the lazaretto except together, and had, besides, concerted other measures to prevent their separation after having quitted it. The merchant woman, who, having left her dwelling, warehouse, and coffers all well furnished, under the care of one of her brothers, a commissioner of health, was about to become sole and mournful mistress of much more than she required to live comfortably, wished to keep Lucia with her, like a daughter or sister, and to this Lucia had acceded, with what gratitude to her benefactress and to Providence the reader may imagine, but only until she could hear some tidings of her mother, and learn, as she hoped, what was her will. With her usual reserve, however, she had never breathed a syllable about her intended marriage, nor of her other remarkable adventures, but now, in such agitation of feelings, she had at least as much need to give vent to them, as the other a wish to listen to them, and clasping the right hand of her friend in both hers, she immediately began to satisfy her inquiries, without further obstacles than those which her sobs presented to the melancholy recital. Renzo, meanwhile, trudged off in great haste, toward the quarters of the good friar. With a little care, and not without some steps thrown away, he at length succeeded in reaching them. He found the cabin. Its occupant, however, was not there, but rambling and peeping about in its vicinity. He discovered him in a tent, stooping toward the ground, or indeed almost lying upon his face, administering consolation to a dying person. He drew back and waited in silence. In a few moments he saw him close the poor creature's eyes, raise himself upon his knees, and after a short prayer get up. He then went forward and advanced to meet him. "'Oh!' said the friar, on seeing him approach. "'Well? She's there. I found her. In what state? Recovered, or at least out of her bed.' "'The Lord be praised!' "'But,' said Renzo, when he came near enough to be able to speak in an undertone, "'there's another difficulty. "'What do you mean?' "'I mean that. "'You know already what a good creature this young girl is, "'but she's sometimes rather positive in her opinions. "'After so many promises, after all you know of, "'now she actually tells me she cannot marry me, "'because she says—oh, how can I express it? In that night of terror, her brain became heated. That is to say, she made a vow to the Madonna. Things without any foundation, aren't they? Good enough for those have knowledge and grounds for doing them, but for us common people that don't well know what we ought to do, aren't they things that won't hold good? Is she very far from here? Oh, no, a few yards beyond the church. Wait here for me a moment, said the friar, and then we'll go together. Do you mean that you'll give her to understand? I know nothing about it, my son. I must first hear what she has to say to me. I understand, said Renzo, and he was left, with his eyes fixed on the ground and his arms crossed on his breast, to ruminate in still unallied suspense. The friar again went in search of Father Vittore, begged him once more to supply his place, went into his cabin, came forth with a basket on his arm, and returning to his expectant companion, said, Let us go. He then went forward, leading the way to the same cabin, which a little while before they had entered together. This time he left Renzo outside. He himself entered, and reappeared in a moment or two, saying, Nothing. We must pray, we must pray, now, added he. You must be my guide. And they set off without further words. The weather had been for some time gradually becoming worse, and now plainly announced a not very distant storm. Frequent flashes of lightning broke in upon the increasing obscurity, and illuminated with momentary brilliancy the long, long roofs and arches of the porticos, the cupola of the temple, and the more humble roofs of the cabins, while the clasps of thunder, bursting forth in sudden peals, rolled rumbling along from one quarter of the heavens to the other. The young man went forward intent upon his way, and his heart full of uneasy expectations, as he compelled himself to slacken his pace, to accommodate it to the strength of his follower, who, 
wearied by his labors, suffering under the pressure of the malady, and oppressed by the sultry heat, walked on with difficulty, occasionally raising his pale face to heaven, as if to seek for freer respiration. When they came in sight of the little cabin, Renzo stopped, turned round, and said with a trembling voice, "'There she is.' They enter. "'See, they're there!' exclaimed the lady from her bed. Lucia turned, sprang up precipitately, and advanced to meet the aged man, crying, "'Oh, whom do I see? Oh, Father Cristoforo!' "'Well, Lucia, from how many troubles has the Lord delivered you? You must indeed rejoice that you have always trusted in him.' "'Oh, yes, indeed, but you, Father, poor me, how you are altered! How are you? Tell me, how are you?' "'As God wills, and as by his grace, I will also,' replied the friar with a placid look. And drawing her on one side, he added, "'Listen, I can only stay here a few moments. Are you inclined to confide in me, as you have done hitherto? Oh, are you not always my father? Then, my daughter, what is this vow that Renzo has been telling me about? It's a vow that I made to the Madonna not to marry.' But did you recollect at this time that you were already bound by another promise? When it related to the Lord and the Madonna, no, I didn't think about it. My daughter, the Lord approves of sacrifices and offerings when we make them of our own. It is the heart that he desires, the will. But you could not offer him the will of another, to whom you had already pledged yourself. Have I done wrong? No, my poor child, don't think so. I believe, rather, that the Holy Virgin will have accepted the intention of your afflicted heart, and have presented it to God for you. But tell me, have you never consulted with any one on this subject? I didn't think it was a sin I ought to confess, and what little good one does one has no need to tell. Have you no other motive that hinders you from fulfilling the promise you have made to Renzo? As to this— for me, what motive? I cannot say. Nothing else, replied Lucia, with a hesitation so expressed that it announced anything but uncertainty of thought, and her cheeks, still pale from illness, suddenly glowed with the deepest crimson. Do you believe, resumed the old man, lowering his eyes, that God has given to his church authority to remit and retain, according as it proves best, the debts and obligations that men may have contracted to him? Yes, indeed, I do. Know, then, that we who are charged with the care of the souls in this place have, for all those who apply to us, the most ample powers of the church, and consequently that I can, when you request it, free you from the obligation, whatever it may be, that you may have contracted by this your vow. But is it not a sin to turn back? and to repent of a promise made to the Madonna? I made it at the time with my whole heart, said Lucia, violently agitated by the assault of so unexpected a hope, for so I must call it, and by the uprising, on the other hand, of a terror, fortified by all the thoughts which had so long been the principal occupation of her mind. A sin, my daughter, said the father, a sin to have recourse to the church and to ask her minister to make use of the authority which he has received from her, and she has received from God? I have seen how you two have been led to unite yourselves, and assuredly, if ever it would seem that two were joined together by God, you were, you are those two. Nor do I now see that God may wish you to be put asunder, and I bless him that he has given me, unworthy as I am, the power of speaking in his name, and returning to you your plighted word and if you request me to declare you absolved from this vow, I shall not hesitate to do it. Nay, I wish you may request me. Then, then, I do request you, said Lucia, with a countenance no longer agitated except by modesty. The friar beckoned to the youth, who was standing in the furthest corner, intently watching, since he could do little else, the dialogue in which he was so much interested and on his drawing near pronounced in an explicit voice to Lucia, "'By the authority I have received from the church, 
I declare you absolved from the vow of virginity, annulling what may have been unadvised in it, and freeing you from every obligation you may thereby have contracted. Let the reader imagine how these words sounded in Renzo's ears. His eyes eagerly thanked him who had uttered them, and instantly sought those of Lucia, but in vain. "'Return in security and peace to your former desires,' pursued the Capuchin, addressing Lucia. "'Beseech the Lord again for those graces you once besought to make you a holy wife, and rely upon it, that he will bestow them upon you more abundantly after so many sorrows. And you,' said he, turning to Renzo, "'remember, my son, that if the Church restores to you this companion, she does it not to procure for you a temporal and earthly pleasure.' but even could it be complete, and free from all intermixture of sorrow, must end in one great affliction at the moment of leaving you. But she does it to lead you both forward in that way of pleasantness which shall have no end. Love each other as companions in a journey, with the thought that you will have to part from one another, and with the hope of being reunited for ever. Thank heaven that you have been led to this state, not through the midst of turbulent and transitory joys, but by sufferings and misery, to dispose you to tranquil and collected joy. If God grants you children, make it your object to bring them up for Him, to inspire them with love to Him and to all men, and then you will train them rightly in everything else. Lucia, has he told you, and he pointed to Renzo, whom he has seen here? Oh, yes, father, he has. You will pray for him. Don't be weary of doing so, and you will pray also for me. My children, I wish you to have a remembrance of the poor friar. And he drew out of his basket a little box of some common kind of wood, but turned and polished with a certain Capuchin precision, and continued, Within this is the remainder of that loaf. The first I asked for charity. That loaf, of which you must have heard speak, I leave it to you. Take care of it. Show it to your children. They will be born into a wretched world, into a miserable age, in the midst of proud and exasperating men. Tell them always to forgive, always, everything, everything, and to pray for the poor friar. So saying, he handed the box to Lucia, who received it with reverence, as if it had been a sacred relic. Then, with a calmer voice, he added, Now, then, tell me, what have you to depend upon here in Milan? Where do you propose to lodge on leaving this? And who will conduct you to your mother, whom may God have preserved in health? This good lady is like a mother to me. We shall leave this place together, and then she will provide for everything. God bless you, said the friar, approaching the bed. I, too, thank you said the widow, for the comfort you have given these poor creatures, though I had counted upon keeping this dear Lucia always with me. But I will keep her in the meanwhile. I will accompany her to her own country, and deliver her to her mother, and, added she in a lower tone, I should like to provide her wardrobe. I have too much wealth, and have not one left out of those who should have shared it with me. You may thus, said the friar, make an acceptable offering to the Lord, and at the same time benefit your neighbor. I do not recommend this young girl to you, for I see already how she has become your daughter. It only remains to bless God, who knows how to show himself a father, even in chastisement, and who, by bringing you together, has given so plain a proof of his love to both of you. But come, resumed he, turning to Renzo and taking him by the hand. We two have nothing more to do here. We have already been here too long. Let us go. Oh, father, said Lucia, shall I see you again? I, who am of no service in this world, have recovered, and you— It is now a long time ago, replied the old man, in a mild and serious tone, since I besought of the Lord a very great mercy, that I might end my days in the service of my fellow creatures. If he now vouchsafes to grant it to me, I would wish all those who have any love for me to assist me in praising him. Come, give Renzo your messages to your mother. Tell her what you have seen, said Lucia to her betrothed. 
that I have found another mother here, that we will come to her together as quickly as possible, and that I hope, earnestly hope, to find her well. If you want money, said Renzo, I have about me all that you sent, and— No, no, interrupted the widow, I have only too much. Let us go, suggested the friar. Good-bye, till we meet again, Lucia, and to you too, kind lady, said Renzo, unable to find words to express all that he felt in such a moment. Who knows whether the Lord in his mercy will allow us all to meet again, exclaimed Lucia. May he be with you always, and bless you, said Father Cristoforo to the two companions, and accompanied by Renzo, he quit the cabin. The evening was not far distant and the crisis of the storm seemed still more closely impending. The Capuchin again proposed to the houseless youth to take shelter for that night in his humble dwelling. "'I cannot keep you company,' added he, "'but you will at least be under cover.' Renzo, however, was burning to be gone, and cared not to remain any longer in such a place where he would not be allowed to see Lucia again, nor even be able to have a little conversation with the good friar. As to the time and weather— we may safely say that night and day, sunshine and shower, zephyr and hurricane, were all the same to him at that moment. He therefore thanked his kind friend, but said that he would rather go as soon as possible in search of Agnesi. When they regained the road, the friar pressed his hand and said, If, as may God grant, you find that good Agnesi, salute her in my name, and beg her, and all those who are left, and remember Friar Cristoforo, to pray for him. God go with you, and bless you for ever. Oh, dear father, we shall meet again. We shall meet again? Above, I hope. And with these words he parted from Renzo, who, staying to watch him till he beheld him disappear, set off hastily toward the gate, casting his farewell looks of compassion on each side over the melancholy scene. There was an unusual bustle, carts rolling about, Monati running to and fro, people securing the curtains of the tents, and numbers of feeble creatures groping about among these and in the porticos to shelter themselves from the impending storm. End of chapter 36, part 2《ハッピーバーデー》パート37、パート1、The Betrothed。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni。パート37、パート1。Scarcely had Renzo crossed the threshold of the Lazaretto and taken the way to the right to find the narrow road by which in the morning he had come out under the walls, when a few large and scattered drops began to fall, which lighting upon and rebounding from the white and parched road, stirred up a cloud of very fine dust. These soon multiplied into rain, and before he reached the by-path it poured down in torrents. Far from feeling any disquietude, Renzo luxuriated in it, and enjoyed himself in that refreshing coolness, that murmur, that general motion of the grass and leaves, shaking, dripping, revived, and glistening as they were. He drew in several deep and long breaths, and in that relenting of nature felt more freely and more vividly, as it were, that which had been wrought in his own destiny. But how far fuller and more unalloyed would have been this feeling, could he have divined what actually was beheld a few days afterwards, that that rain carried off, washed away, so to say, the contagion, that from that day forward the lazaretto, if it was not about to restore to the living all the living whom it contained, would engulf at least no others, that within one week doors and shops would be seen reopened, quarantine would scarcely be spoken of any longer, and of the pestilence only a solitary token or two remain here and there that trace which every pestilence had left behind it for some time. Our traveller then proceeded with great alacrity, without having formed any plans as to where, how, when, or whether at all, 
he should stop for the night, and anxious only to get forward, to reach his own village quickly, to find somebody to talk to, somebody to whom he might relate his adventures, and, above all, to set off again immediately on his way to Pasturo, in search of Agnese. His mind was quite confused by the events of the day, but from beneath all the misery, the horrors, and the dangers he recalled, one little thought always rose to the surface. I've found her, she's recovered, she's mine. And then he would give a spring which scattered a drizzling shower around, like a spaniel coming up out of the water. At other times he would content himself with rubbing his hands. And then, on he would go more cheerily than ever. With his eyes fixed upon the road, he gathered up, so to say, the thoughts he had left there in the morning and the day before as he came, and with the greatest glee, those very same which he had then most sought to banish from his mind, the doubts, the difficulty of finding her, of finding her alive, amidst so many dead and dying. And I have found her alive, he concluded. He recurred to the most critical moments, the most terrible obscurities of that day. He fancied himself with that knocker in his hand. Will she be here or not? And a reply so little encouraging. And before he had time to digest it, that crowd of mad rascals upon him, and that lazaretto, that sea, there I wished to find her, and to have found her there. He recalled the moment when the procession of convalescents had done passing by. What a moment! What bitter sorrow at not finding her! And now it no longer mattered to him. And that quarter for the women! And there, behind that cabin, when he was least expecting it, to hear that voice, that very voice, and to see her, to see her standing, but what then? There was still that knot about the vow, and drawn tighter than ever, this too untied, and that madness against Don Rodrigo, that cursed canker which exasperated all his sorrows and poisoned all his joys, even that rooted out, so that it would be difficult to imagine a state of greater satisfaction, had it not been for the uncertainty about Agnese, his grief for Father Cristoforo, and the remembrance that he was still in the midst of a pestilence. He arrived at Sesto as evening was coming on, without any token of the rain being about to stop, but feeling more than ever disposed to go forward, considering, too, the many difficulties of finding a lodging, and saturated as he was with wet, he would not even think of an inn. The only necessity that made itself felt was a very craving appetite, for success, such as he had met with, would have enabled him to digest something more substantial than the capuchin's little bowl of soup. He looked about to see if he could discover a baker's shop, quickly found one, and received two loaves with the tongs, and the other ceremonies we have described. One he put into his pocket, the other to his mouth, and on he went. When he passed through Monza, the night had completely closed in. He managed, however, to leave the town in the direction that led to the right road. But except for this qualification, which, to say the truth, was a great compensation, it may be imagined what kind of a road it was, and how it was becoming worse and worse every moment. Sunk, as were all, and we must have said so elsewhere, between two banks, almost like the bed of a river, it might then have been called, if not a river, at least in reality a water course, and in many places were holes and puddles from which it was difficult to recover one's shoes and sometimes one's footing. But Renzo extricated himself as he could, without impatience, without bad language, and without regrets, consoling himself with the thought that every step, whatever it might cost him, brought him further on his way, that the rain would stop when God should see fit, that day would come in its own time, and that the journey he was meanwhile performing would then be performed. Indeed, I may say, he never even thought of this, except in the moments of greatest need. These were digressions. The grand employment of his mind was going over the history of the melancholy years that had passed, so many perplexities, so many adversities, 
so many moments in which he had been about to abandon even hope, and give up everything for lost. And then to oppose to these the images of so far different a future, the arrival of Lucia and the wedding, and the setting up house, and the relating to each other past vicissitudes, and, in short, their whole life. How he fared at forks of the road, for some indeed there were, whether his little experience, together with the glimmering twilight, enabled him always to find the right road, or whether he always turned into it by chance, I am not able to say. For he himself, who used to relate his history with great minuteness, rather tediously than otherwise, and everything leads us to believe that our anonymous author had heard it from him more than once, he himself declared at this place that he remembered no more of that night than if he had spent it in bed dreaming. Certain it is, however, that towards its close he found himself on the banks of the Adda. It had never ceased raining a moment, but at a certain stage it had changed from a perfect deluge to more moderate rain, and then to a fine, silent, uniform drizzle. The lofty and rarefied clouds formed a continual but light and transparent veil and the twilight dawn allowed Renzo to distinguish the surrounding country. Within this tract was his own village, and what he felt at the thought it is impossible to describe. I can only say that those mountains, that neighboring Resegany, the whole territory of Lecco, had become as it were his own property. He glanced too at himself, and discovered that he looked, to say the truth, somewhat of a contrast to what he felt, to what he even fancied he ought to look. His clothes shrunk up and clinging to his body, from the crown of his head to his girdle, one dripping, saturated mass. From his girdle to the soles of his feet, mud and splashes. The places which were free from these might themselves have been called spots and splashes. And could he have seen his whole figure in a looking-glass, with the brim of his hat unstiffened and hanging down, and his hair straight and sticking to his face, he would have considered himself a still greater beauty. As to being tired, he may have been so, but if he were, he knew nothing about it. And the freshness of the morning, added to that of the night and of his trifling bath, only inspired him with more energy, and a wish to get forward on his way more rapidly. He is at Piscati, he pursues his course along the remaining part of the road that runs by the side of the Adda, giving a melancholy glance, however, at Pescarinico. He crosses the bridge, and, through fields and lanes, shortly arrives at his friend's hospitable dwelling. He, who, only just risen, was standing in the doorway to watch the weather, raised his eyes in amazement at that strange figure, so drenched, bespattered, and, we may say, dirty, yet at the same time so lively and at ease. In his whole life he had never seen a man worse equipped and more thoroughly contented. Aha, said he, here already, and in such weather. How have things gone? She's there, said Renzo. She's there, she's there. Well? Recovered, which is better. I have to thank the Lord and the Madonna for it as long as I live but oh, such grand things, such wonderful things, I'll tell you all afterwards. But what a plight you are in. I'm a beauty, am I not? To say the truth, you might employ the overplus above to wash off the overplus below. But wait a minute, and I'll make you a good fire. I won't refuse it, I assure you. Where do you think it caught me? Just at the gate of the lazaretto. But never mind, let the weather do its own business, and I mine. His friend then went out, and soon returned with two bundles of faggots. One he laid on the ground, the other on the hearth, and with a few embers remaining over from the evening, quickly kindled a fine blaze. Renzo, meanwhile, had taken off his hat, and giving it two or three shakes, he threw it upon the ground, and, not quite so easily, had also pulled off his doublet. He then threw from his breeches pocket his poniard, the sheaf of which was so wet that it seemed to have been laid in soak. This he put upon the table, saying, 
this too is in a pretty plight but there's rain there's rain thank god i've had some hairbreadth escapes i'll tell you by and by and he began rubbing his hands now do me another kindness added he that little bundle that i left upstairs just fetch it for me for before these clothes that i have on dry returning with the bundle his friend said i should think you must have a pretty good appetite i fancy you haven't wanted enough to drink by the way but something to eat i bought two rolls yesterday towards evening but indeed they haven't touched my lips leave it to me said his friend he then poured some water into a kettle which he suspended upon a hook over the fire and added i'm going to milk when i come back the water will be ready and will make a good polenta you meanwhile can dress yourself at your leisure when left alone renzo not without some difficulty took off the rest of his clothes which were almost as if glued to his skin he then dried himself and dressed himself anew from head to foot his friend returned and set himself to make the polenta renzo meanwhile sitting by in expectation now i feel that i'm tired said he but it's a fine long stretch that's nothing however i've so much to tell you it will take the whole day oh what a state milan's in what one's obliged to see what one's obliged to touch enough to make one loathe oneself i dare say i wanted nothing less than the little washing i've had and what those gentry down there would have done to me you shall hear but if you could see the lazaretto it's enough to make one lose oneself in miseries well well i'll tell you all and she's there and you'll see her here and she'll be my wife and you must be a witness and plague or no plague we'll be merry at least for a few hours in short he verified what he had told his friend that it would take all the day to relate everything for as it never ceased drizzling the latter spent the whole of it under cover partly seated by the side of his friend partly busied over one of his wine vats and a little cask and in other occupations preparatory to the vintage and the dressing of the grapes in which renzo failed not to lend a hand for as he used to say he was one of those who were sooner tired of doing nothing than of working he could not however resist taking a little run up to agnese's cottage to see once more a certain window and there too to rub his hands with glee he went and returned unobserved and retired to rest in good time in good time too he rose next morning and finding that the rain had ceased if settled fine weather had not yet returned he set off quickly on his way to pasturo it was still early when he arrived there for he was no less willing and in a hurry to bring matters to an end than the reader probably is he inquired for agnese and heard that she was safe and well a small cottage standing by itself was pointed out to him as the place where she was staying he went thither and called her by name from the street on hearing such a call she rushed to the window and while she stood with open mouth on the point of uttering i know not what sound or exclamation renzo prevented her by saying lucia's recovered i saw her the day before yesterday she sends you her love and will be here soon and beside these i've so many many things to tell you between the surprise of the apparition the joy of these tidings and the burning desire to know more about it agnese began one moment an exclamation the next a question without finishing any then forgetting the precautions she had long been accustomed to take she said i'll come and open the door for you wait the plague said renzo you've not had it i believe no not i have you yes i have you must therefore be prudent i come from milan and you shall hear that i've been up to the eyes in the midst of the contagion to be sure i've changed from head to foot but it's an abominable thing that clings to one sometimes like witchcraft and since the lord has preserved you hitherto you must take care of yourself till this infection is over for you are our mother 
and I want us to live together happily for as long while, in compensation for the great sufferings we have undergone, I at least. But, began Agnese, A, interrupted Renzo, there's no but that will hold. I know what you mean, but you shall hear, you shall hear that there are no longer any buts in the way. Let us go into some open space where we can talk at our ease without danger, and you shall hear. Agnese pointed out to him a garden behind the house. If he would go in and seat himself on one of the two benches, which he would find opposite each other, she would come down directly and go and sit on the other. Thus it was arranged, and I am sure that if the reader, informed as he is of preceding events, could have placed himself there as a third party to witness with his own eyes that animated conversation, to hear with his own ears those descriptions, questions, explanations, ejaculations, condolences, and congratulations about Don Rodrigo and Father Cristoforo and everything else, and those descriptions of the future, as clear and certain as those of the past, I am sure, I say, he would have enjoyed it exceedingly, and would have been the last to come away. But to have this conversation upon paper, in mute words written with ink, and without meeting with a single new incident, I fancy he would not care much for it, and would rather that we should leave him to conjecture it. Their conclusion was that they would go to keep house altogether in the territory of Bergamo, where Renzo had already gained a good footing. As to the time, they could decide nothing, because it depended upon the plague and other circumstances. But no sooner should the danger be over, than Agnese would return home to wait there for Lucia, or Lucia would wait there for her, and in the meantime Renzo would often take another trip to Pasturo to see his mother, and to keep her acquainted with whatever might happen. Before taking his leave, he offered money to her also, saying, I have them all here, you see, those scudi you sent. I too made a vow not to touch them until the mystery was cleared up. Now, however, if you want any of them, bring me a little bowl of vinegar and water, and I'll throw in the fifty scudi, good and glittering as you sent them. No, no, said Agnese, I've more than I need still by me. Keep yours untouched, and they'll do nicely to set up house with. Renzo took his departure, with the additional consolation of having found one so dear to him safe and well. He remained the rest of that day, and for the night, at his friend's house, and on the morrow was again on his way, but in another direction, towards his adopted country. End of chapter 37, part 1Chapter 37, Part 2 of The Betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter 37, Part 2. Here he found Bortolo still in good health and in less apprehension of losing it. For in those few days, things had here also rapidly taken a favorable turn. New cases of illness had become rare, and the malady was no longer what it had been. There were no longer those fatal blotches, nor violent symptoms, but slight fevers, for the most part intermittent, with, at the worst, a discolored spot, which was cured like an ordinary tumor. The face of the country seemed already changed, the survivors began to come forth to reckon up their numbers, and mutually to exchange condolences and congratulations. There was already a talk of resuming business again. Such masters as survived already began to look out for and bespeak workmen, and principally in those branches of art where the number had been scarce even before the contagion, as was that of silk-weaving. Renzo, without any display of levity, promised his cousin, with the proviso, however, that he obtained all due consent, to resume his employment when he could come in company to settle himself in the country. In the meanwhile, he gave orders for the most necessary preparations. He provided a more spacious dwelling, 
a task become only too easy to execute at a small cost, and furnished it with all necessary articles, this time breaking into his little treasure, but without making any very great hole in it, for of everything there was a superabundance at a very moderate price. In the course of a few days he returned to his native village, which he found still more signally changed for the better. He went over immediately to Pasturo. There he found Agnese in good spirits again, and ready to return home as soon as might be, so that he accompanied her thither at once. Nor will we attempt to describe what were their feelings and words on again beholding those scenes together. Agnese found everything as she had left it, so that she was forced to declare that, considering it was a poor widow and her daughter, the angels had kept guard over it. And that other time, added she, when it might have been thought that the Lord was looking elsewhere, and thought not of us, since he suffered all our little property to be carried away, yet, after all, he showed us the contrary, for he sent me from another quarter that grand store of money which enabled me to restore everything. I say everything, but I am wrong, since Lucia's wedding clothes, which were stolen among the rest, good and complete as they were at first, were still wanting. And behold, now they come to us in another direction. Who would have told me, when I was working so busily to prepare those others, you think you are working for Lucia? Nay, my good woman, you are working for you know not whom." Heaven knows what sort of being will wear this veil and all those clothes. Those for Lucia, the real wedding dress which is to serve for her, will be provided by a kind soul whom you know not, nor even that there is such a person. Agnese's first care was to prepare for this kind soul the most comfortable accommodations her poor little cottage could afford. Then she went to procure some silk to wind, and thus, employed with her reel, beguiled the wearisome hours of delay. Renzo, on his part, suffered not these days, long enough in themselves, to pass away in idleness. Fortunately, he understood two trades, and of these two chose that of a laborer. He partly helped his kind host, who considered it particularly fortunate, at such a time, to have a workman frequently at his command, and a workman, too, of his abilities and partly cultivated and restored to order Agnese's little garden, which had completely run wild during her absence. As to his own property, he never thought about it at all, because, he said, it was too entangled a periwig, and wanted more than one pair of hands to set it to rights again. He did not even set foot into it, still less into his house. It would have pained him too much to see its desolation and he had already resolved to dispose of everything at whatever price, and to spend in his new country all that he could make by the sale. If the survivors of the plague were to one another resuscitated, as it were, he, to his fellow countrymen, was, so to say, doubly so. Everyone welcomed and congratulated him, everyone wanted to hear from him his story. The reader will perhaps say, how went on the affair of his outlawry? It went on very well. He scarcely thought anything more about it, supposing that they who could have enforced it would no longer think about it themselves. Nor was he mistaken. This arose not merely from the pestilence which had thwarted so many undertakings, but, as may have been seen in more than one place in this story, it was a common occurrence in those days that special as well as general orders against persons, unless there were some private and powerful animosity to keep them alive and render them availing, often continued without taking effect, if they had not done so on their first promulgation, like musket-balls, which, if they strike no blow, lie quietly upon the ground without giving molestation to any one. A necessary consequence of the extreme facility with which these orders were flung about, both right and left. Man's activity is limited, and whatever excess there was in the making of regulations must have produced so much greater a deficiency in the execution of them. What goes into the sleeves cannot go into the skirt. If anyone wants to know how Renzo got on with Don Abondio, 
during this interval of expectation, I need only say that they kept at a respectful distance from each other, the latter for fear of hearing a whisper about the wedding, and at the very thought of such a thing, his imagination conjured up Don Rodrigo with his bravos on the one side, and the cardinal with his arguments on the other, and the former, because he had resolved not to mention it to him till the very last moment, being unwilling to run the risk of making him restive beforehand, of stirring up, who could tell, some difficulty, and of entangling things by useless chit-chat. All his chit-chat was with Agnese. Do you think she'll come soon? one would ask. I hope so, would the other reply, and frequently the one who had given the answer would not long afterwards make the same inquiry. With these and similar cheats they endeavored to beguile the time, which seemed to them longer and longer in proportion as more passed away. We will make the reader, however, pass over all this period in one moment, by briefly stating that, a few days after Renzo's visit to the lazaretto, Lucia left it with the kind widow, that, a general quarantine having been enjoined, they kept it together in the house of the latter, that part of the time was spent in preparing Lucia's wardrobe, at which, after sundry ceremonious objections, she was obliged to work herself, and that the quarantine having expired, the widow left her warehouse and dwelling under the custody of her brother, the commissioner, and prepared to set off on her journey with Lucia. We could, too, speedily add, they set off, arrived, and all the rest, but with all our willingness to accommodate ourselves to this haste of the readers, there are three things appertaining to this period of time which we are not willing to pass over in silence, and with two at least we believe the reader himself will say that we should have been to blame in so doing. The first is that when Lucia returned to relate her adventures to the good widow more in particular, and with greater order than she could do in her agitation of mind, when she first confided them to her, and when she more expressly mentioned the signora who had given her shelter in the monastery at Monza, she learned from her friend things which, by giving her the key of many mysteries, filled her mind with melancholy and fearful astonishment. She learned from the widow that the unhappy lady, having fallen under suspicion of most atrocious conduct, had been conveyed, by order of the cardinal, to a monastery at Milan that there, after long indulgence in rage and struggles, she had repented and confessed her faults, and that her present life was one of such voluntary inflictions, that no one, except by depriving her of that life entirely, could have invented a severer punishment for her. Should any one wish to be more particularly acquainted with this melancholy history, he will find it in the work and at the place which we have elsewhere quoted in relation to this same person. The other fact is that Lucia, after making inquiries about Father Cristoforo of all the Capuchins she could meet with in the lazaretto, heard there with more sorrow than surprise that he had died of the pestilence. Lastly, before leaving Milan, she wished also to ascertain something about her former patrons, and to perform, as she said, an act of duty, if any yet remained. The widow accompanied her to the house, where they learned that both one and the other had been carried off with the multitude. When we have said of Doña Presede that she was dead, we have said all. But Don Ferrante, considering that he was a man of erudition, is deemed by our anonymous author worthy of more extended mention, and we, at our own risk, will transcribe, as nearly as possible, what he has left on record about him. He says, then, that, on the very first whisper of pestilence, Don Ferrante was one of the most resolute, and ever afterwards one of the most persevering, in denying it, not indeed with loud clamors like the people, but with arguments, of which at least no one could complain that they wanted concatenation. In rerum natura, he used to say, there are but two species of things, substances and accidents and if I prove that the contagion cannot be either one or the other, I shall have proved that it does not exist, that it is a mere chimera. Here I am, then. Substances are either spiritual or material. That the contagion is a spiritual substance, 
is an absurdity no one would venture to maintain. It is needless, therefore, to speak of it. Material substances are either simple or compound. Now, the contagion is not a simple substance, and this may be shown in a few words. It is not an ethereal substance, because if it were, instead of passing from one body to another, it would fly off as quickly as possible to its own sphere. It is not aqueous, because it would wet things and be dried up by the wind. It is not igneous, because it would burn. It is not earthy, because it would be visible. Neither is it a compound substance, because it must by all means be sensible to the sight and touch. And who has seen this contagion? Who has touched it? It remains to be seen whether it can be an accident. Worse and worse. These gentlemen, the doctors, say that it is communicated from one body to another. For this is their Achilles, this the pretext for issuing so many useless orders. Now supposing it an accident, it comes to this, that it must be a transitive accident, two words quite at variance with each other, there being no plainer or more established fact in the whole of philosophy than this, that an accident cannot pass from one subject to another. For if, to avoid this scylla, we shelter ourselves under the assertion that it is an accident produced, we fly from scylla and run upon Charybdis, because if it be produced, then it is not communicated, it is not propagated, as people go about affirming. These principles being laid down, what use is it to come talking to us so about wheels, pustules, and carbuncles? All absurdities, once escaped from somebody or other. No, no, resumed Don Ferrante, I don't say so, science is science, only we must know how to employ it. Wheels, pustules, carbuncles, parotides, violaceous tumors, black swellings, are all respectable words, which have their true and legitimate signification. But I say that they don't affect the question at all. Who denies that there may be such things, nay, that there actually are such? All depends upon seeing where they come from. Here began the woes even of Don Ferrante. So long as he confined himself to declaiming against the opinion of a pestilence, he found everywhere willing, obliging, and respectful listeners for it cannot be expressed how much authority the opinion of a learned man by profession carries with it, while he is attempting to prove to others things of which they are already convinced. But when he came to distinguish and to try and demonstrate that the error of these physicians did not consist in affirming that there was a terrible and prevalent malady, but in assigning its rules and causes, then, I am speaking of the earliest times, when no one would listen to a word about pestilence, then, instead of listeners, he found rebellious and intractable opponents. Then there was no room for speechifying, and he could no longer put forth his doctrines but by scraps and piecemeal. There's the true reason only too plainly, after all, said he, and even they are compelled to acknowledge it, who maintain that other empty proposition besides. Let them deny, if they can, that fatal conjunction of Saturn with Jupiter. And when was it ever heard say that influences may be propagated? And would these gentlemen deny the existence of influences? Will they deny that there are stars, or tell me that they are placed up there for no purpose, like so many pinheads stuck into a pincushion? But what I cannot understand about these doctors is this, to confess that we are under so malignant a conjunction, and then to come and tell us with eager face, don't touch this and don't touch that and you'll be safe, as if this avoiding of material contact with terrestrial bodies could hinder the virtual effect of celestial ones, and such anxiety about burning old clothes. Poor people! Will you burn Jupiter? Will you burn Saturn? His freedus, that is to say, on these grounds, he used no precautions against the pestilence, took it, went to bed, and went to die, like one of Mustacio's heroes quarreling with the stars. And that famous library of his? Perhaps it is still there, distributed around his walls. End of chapter 37, part 2
Chapter thirty eight, part one of the betrothed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni. Chapter thirty eight, part one. One fine evening, Agnese heard a carriage stop at the door. It is she and none other. It was indeed Lucia with the good widow. The mutual greetings we leave the reader to imagine. Next morning, Renzo arrived in good time, totally ignorant of what had happened, and with no other intentions than of pouring out his feelings a little with Agnese about Lucia's long delay. The gesticulations he made, and the exclamations he uttered, on finding her thus before his eyes, we will also refer to our reader's imagination. Lucia's exhibitions of pleasure towards him were such that it will not take many words to give an account of them. "'Good morning, Renzo. How do you do?' said she, with downcast eyes and an air of composure. Nor let the reader think that Renzo considered this mode of reception too cold, and took it at all amiss. He entered fully into the meaning of her behavior, and as among educated people one knows how to make allowance for compliments, so he understood very well what feelings lay hidden beneath these words. Besides, it was easy enough to perceive that she had two ways of proffering them, one for Renzo and another for all those she might happen to know. "'It does me good to see you,' replied the youth, making use of a set phrase which he himself, however, had invented on the spur of the moment. "'Our poor father Cristoforo,' said Lucia, Pray for his soul, though one may be almost sure that he is now praying for us above. I expected no less indeed, said Renzo, nor was this the only melancholy chord touched in the course of this dialogue. But what then? Whatever subject was the topic of conversation, it always seemed to them delightful. Like a capricious horse, which halts and plants itself in a certain spot, and lifts first one hoof and then another, and sets it down again in the self-same place, and cuts a hundred capers before taking a single step, and then all on a sudden starts on his career, and speeds forward as if borne on the wings of the wind, such had time become in his eyes. At first minutes had seemed hours, now hours seemed to him like minutes. The widow not only did not spoil the party, but entered into it with great spirit. Nor could Renzo, when he saw her lying on that miserable bed in the lazaretto, have imagined her of so companionable and cheerful a disposition. But the lazaretto and the country, death and a wedding, are not exactly one and the same thing. With Agnese she was very soon on friendly terms, and it was a pleasure to see her with Lucia, so tender and at the same time playful, rallying her gracefully and without effort, just so much as was necessary to give more courage to her words and motions. At length Renzo said that he was going to Dona Bondio to make arrangements about the wedding. He went, and with a certain air of respectful raillery, Signor Curate, said he, have you at last lost that headache which you had told me prevented your marrying us? We are now in time, the bride is here, and I've come to know when it will be convenient to you but this time I must request you to make haste. Don Abondio did not, indeed, reply that he would not, but he began to hesitate, to bring forward sundry excuses, to throw out sundry insinuations, and why bring himself into notice and publish his name with that proclamation for his seizure still out against him, and that the thing could be done equally well elsewhere, and this, that, and the other argument. Oh, I see, said Renzo, you've still a little pain in your head. But listen, listen, and he began to describe in what state he had beheld poor Don Rodrigo, and that by that time he must undoubtedly be gone. Let us hope, concluded he, that the Lord will have had mercy on him. This has nothing to do with us, said Don Abondio. Did I say no? Certainly I did not but I speak, I speak for good reasons. Besides, don't you see, as long as a man has breath in his body, 
Only look at me. I'm somewhat sickly. I, too, have been nearer the other world than this. And yet I'm here, and... If troubles don't come upon me, why... I may hope to stay here a little longer yet. Think, too, of some people's constitutions. But, as I say, this has nothing to do with us. After a little further conversation, neither more or less conclusive, Renzo made an elegant bow, returned to his party, made his report of the interview, and concluded by saying, I've come away because I've had quite enough of it, and that I mightn't run the risk of losing my patience and using bad words. Sometimes he seemed exactly like what he was that other time, the very same hesitation and the very same arguments. I'm sure if it had lasted as little longer, he'd have returned to the charge with some words in Latin. I see there must be another delay. It would be better to do what he says at once, and go and get married where we're about to live. I'll tell you what we'll do, said the widow. I should like you to go let us women go make the trial, and see whether we can't find a rather better way to manage him. By this means, too, I shall have the pleasure of knowing this man, whether he's just such as you describe him. After dinner I should like to go, not to assail him again too quickly. And now, Signor Bridegroom, please to accompany us to on a little walk, while Agnese is so busily employed. I will act the part of Lucia's mother. I want very much to see these mountains, and this lake of which I've heard so much, rather more at large, for the little I've already seen of them, seems to me a charmingly fine view. Renzo escorted them first to the cottage of his hospitable friend, where they met with a hearty welcome, and they made him promise that, not that day only, but, if he could, every day, he would join their party at dinner. Having returned from their ramble and dined, Renzo suddenly took his departure, without saying where he was going. The women waited a little while to confer together, and concert about the mode of assailing Dona Bondio, and at length they set off to make the attack. "'Here they are, I declare,' said he to himself, but he put on a pleasant face, and offered warm congratulations to Lucia, greetings to Agnese, and compliments to the stranger. He made them sit down. When he entered upon the grand subject of the plague, and wanted to hear from Lucia how she had managed to get over it, in the midst of so many sorrows, the lazaretto afforded an opportunity of bringing her companion into conversation. Then, as was but fair, Don Abondio talked about his share in the storm. Then followed great rejoicings with Agnese, that she had come forth unharmed. The conversation was carried to some length. From the very first moment, the two elders were on the watch for a favorable opportunity of mentioning the essential point and at length one of the two, I am not sure which, succeeded in breaking the ice. But what think you? Dona Bondio could not hear with that ear. He took care not to say no, but behold, he again recurred to his usual evasions, circumlocutions, and hoppings from bush to bush. It would be necessary, he said, to get rid of that order for Renzo's arrest. You, Signora, who come from Milan, will know more or less the course these matters take. You would claim protection, some cavalier of weight for which such means every wound may be cured. If, then, we may jump to the conclusion, without perplexing ourselves with so many considerations, as these young people and our good Agnese here already intend to expatriate themselves, but I'm talking at random, for one's country is wherever one is well off, it seems to me that all may be accomplished there, where no proclamation interposes. I don't myself exactly see that this is the moment for the conclusion of this match, but I wish it well concluded and undisturbedly. To tell the truth, here with this edict in force, to proclaim the name of Lorenzo Tramaglino from the altar, I couldn't do it with a quiet conscience. I too sincerely wish them well. I would be afraid I were doing them an injury. You see, ma'am, and they too. Here Agnese and the widow, each in her own way, broke in to combat these arguments. Don Abondio reproduced them in another shape. It was a perpetual recommencement. 
when lo enter renzo with a determined step and tidings in his face the senor marquis has arrived said he what does this mean arrived where asked don abondio he has arrived at his palace which was once don rodrigo's because this senor marquis is the heir by preferment and trust as they say so that there's no longer any doubt as for myself i should be very glad of it if i could hear that the poor man had died in peace at any rate i've said paternosters for him hitherto now i will say the de profundis and this senor marquis is a very fine man certainly said don abondio i've heard him mentioned more than once as a really excellent senor a man of the old stamp but is it positively true will you believe the sexton why because he's seen him with his own eyes i've only been in the neighborhood of the castle and to say the truth i went there on purpose thinking they must know something there and several people told me about it afterwards i met ambrogio who had just been up there and had seen him i say take possession will you hear ambrogio's testimony i made him wait outside on purpose yes let him come in said don abondio renzo went and called the sexton who after confirming every fact adding fresh particulars and dissipating every doubt again went on his way ah he's dead then he's really gone exclaimed don abondio you see my children how providence overtakes some people you know what a grand thing that is what a great relief to this poor country for it was impossible to live with him here this pestilence has been a great scourge but it has also been a good broom it has swept away some from whom my children we could never have freed ourselves young blooming and in full vigor we might have said that they who were destined to assist at their funeral were still writing latin exercises at school and in the twinkling of an eye they have disappeared by hundreds at a time we shall no longer see him going about with those cut-throat looking fellows at his heels with such an ostentatious and supercilious air looking as if he had swallowed a ramrod and staring at people as if they were all placed in the world to be honored by his condescension well he's here no longer and we are he'll never again send such messages to honest men he's given us all a great deal of disquietude as you see for now we may venture to say so i've forgiven him from my heart said renzo and you do right it's your duty to do so replied don abondio but one may thank heaven i suppose who has delivered us from him but to return to ourselves i repeat do what you like best if you wish me to marry you here i am if it be more convenient to you to go elsewhere do so as to the order of arrest i likewise think that as there is now no longer any who keeps his eye on you and wishes to do you harm it isn't worth giving yourself any great uneasiness about it particularly as this gracious decree on occasion of the birth of the most serene infanta is interposed and then the plague the plague oh that plague has put to flight many a grand thing so that if you like to-day is thursday on sunday i'll ask you in church because what may have been done in that way before will count for nothing after so long an interval and then i shall have the pleasure of marrying you myself you know we came about this very thing said renzo very well i shall attend you and i must also write immediately and inform his eminence who is his eminence his eminence replied don abondio is our senor cardinal the archbishop whom may god preserve oh i beg your pardon answered agnese but though i'm a poor ignorant creature i can assure you he's not called so because the second time we were about to speak to him just as i'm speaking to you sir one of the priests drew me aside and instructed me how to behave to a gentleman like him and that he ought to be called your illustrious lordship and my lord and now if he had to repeat his instructions he'd tell you that he is to have the title of eminence 
Do you understand now? Because the Pope, whom may God likewise preserve, has ordered, ever since the month of June, that cardinals are to have this title. And why do you think he has come to this resolution? Because the word illustrious, which once belonged to them and certain princes, has now become, even you know what, and to how many it is given, and how willingly they swallow it. And what would you have done? Take it away from all? Then we should have complaints, hatred, troubles, and jealousies without end, and after all, they would go on just as before. So the Pope has found a capital remedy. By degrees, however, they will begin to give the title of eminence to bishops, then abbots will claim it, then provosts, for men are made so. They must always be advancing, always be advancing. Then canons. And curates? said the widow. No, no, pursued Don Abondio. The curates must draw the cart. Never fear that your reverence will sit ill upon curates to the end of the world. Farther, I shouldn't be surprised if cavaliers, who are accustomed to hear themselves called illustrious, and to be treated like cardinals, should some day or other want the title of eminence themselves. And if they want it, you know, depend upon it, they'll find somebody to give it them. And then, whoever happens to be pope then, will invent something else for the cardinals. But come, let us return to our own affairs. On Sunday I'll ask you in church. And meanwhile, what do you think I've thought of to serve you better? Meanwhile, we'll ask for a dispensation for the two other times. They must have plenty to do up at court in giving dispensations, if things go on everywhere as they do here. I've already one, two, three for Sunday, without counting yourselves, and some others may occur yet. And then you'll see afterwards, the fire has caught, and there'll not be left one person single. Perpetua surely made a mistake to die now, for this was the time that even she would have found a purchaser. And I fancy, Signora, it will be the same at Milan. So it is indeed, you may imagine it, when, in my parish only, last Sunday, there were fifty weddings. I said so, the world won't come to an end yet. And you, Signora, has no bumblefly began to hover about you? No, no, I don't think about such things, nor do I wish to. Oh, yes, yes, for you will be the only single one. Even Agnese, you see, even Agnese... Po, oh, you are inclined to be merry, said Agnese. I am indeed, and I think at length it's time. We've passed through some rough days, haven't we, my young ones? Some rough ones we've passed indeed, and the few days we have left to live, we may hope will be a little less melancholy. But happy you, who, if no misfortunes happen, have still a little time left to talk over bygone sorrows. I, poor old man, villains may die, one may recover of the plague, but there is no help for old age, and as they say, Senectus ipsa est morbus. Now then, said Renzo, you may talk Latin as long as you like, it makes no difference to me. You're at it again with that Latin, are you? Well, well, I'll settle it with you. When you come before me with this little creature here, just to hear you pronounce certain little words in Latin, I'll say to you, you don't like Latin, good-bye, shall I? Ah, but I know what I mean, replied Renzo. It isn't at all like Latin there that frightens me. It is honest sacred Latin, like that in the Mass. And besides, it is necessary there that you should read what is in the book. I'm talking about that knavish Latin out of the church that comes upon one treacherously, in the very pith of a conversation. For example, now that we are here and all is over, that Latin you went on pouring forth, just here in this corner, to give me to understand that you couldn't, and that other things were wanting, and I know not what besides. Please now to translate it a little for me. Hold your tongue, you wicked fellow, hold your tongue. Don't stir up these things. For if we were now to make up our accounts, I don't know which would be creditor. I've forgiven all. Let us talk about it no longer. But you certainly played me some tricks. I don't wonder at you, 
since you're a downright young scoundrel. But fancy this creature, as quiet as a mouse, this little saint, whom one would have thought it a sin to suspect and guard against. But after all, I knew who set her up to it. I know, I know. So saying, he pointed and waved towards Agnese the finger he had at first directed to Lucia, and it is impossible to describe the good temper and pleasantry with which he made these reproaches. The tidings he had just heard had given him a freedom and a talkativeness to which he had long been a stranger. And we should be still far enough from a conclusion if we were to relate all the rest of this conversation which he continued to prolong, more than once detaining the party when on the point of starting, and afterwards stopping them again for a little while at the very street door, each time to make some jocose speech. End of chapter 38, part 1「Chapter thirty eight part two of the betrothed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the betrothed by alessandro Manzoni. chapter thirty eight part two the day following dona bondio received a visit as unexpected as it was gratifying from the senor marquis we have mentioned a person beyond the prime of manhood, whose countenance was, as it were, a seal to what report had said of him, open, benevolent, placid, humble, dignified, and with something that indicated a resigned sadness. "'I come,' said he, "'to bring you the compliments of the Cardinal Archbishop.' "'Ah, what condescension of you both!' When I was about to take leave of that incomparable man, who is good enough to honor me with his friendship, he mentioned to me two young betrothed persons of this parish, who have had to suffer on account of the unfortunate Don Rodrigo. His lordship wishes to have some tidings of them. Are they living, and are their affairs settled? Everything is settled. Indeed, I was intending to write about them to his eminence, but now that I have the honor— are they here? They are, and they will be man and wife as soon as possible. And I request you to be good enough to tell me if I can be of any service to them, and also to instruct me in the best way of being so. During this calamity I have lost the only two sons I had, and their mother, and have received three considerable inheritances. I had a superfluity even before." so that, you see, it is really rendering me a service to give me an opportunity of employing some of my wealth, and particularly such an opportunity as this. May heaven bless you! Why are not all enough? I thank you most heartily, in the name of these my children, and since your illustrious lordship gives me so much encouragement, it is true, my lord, that I have an expedient to suggest which perhaps may not displease your lordship. Allow me to tell you, then, that these worthy people are resolved to go and settle themselves elsewhere, and to sell what little property they have here. The young man a vineyard of about nine or ten perches, if I'm not mistaken, but neglected and completely overgrown. Besides, he also has a cottage, and his bride another, now both, you will see, the abode of rats. A nobleman like your lordship cannot know how the poor fare, when they are all reduced to the necessity of disposing of their goods. It always ends by falling into the hands of some knave, who, if occasion offers, will make love to the place for some time, and as soon as he finds that its owner wants to sell it, draws back, and pretends not to wish for it, so that he is obliged to run after him, and give it him for a price of bread, particularly, too, in such circumstances as these. My Lord Marquis will already have seen the drift of my remarks. The best charity your most illustrious lordship can afford to these people is to relieve them of this difficulty by purchasing their little property. To say the truth, I have an eye to my own interest, my own advantage, in making this suggestion, the acquisition in my parish of a fellow ruler like my Lord Marquis. But your lordship will decide according to your own judgment." I have only spoken from obedience. The Marquis highly commended the suggestion, returned thanks for it, 
begged Don Abondio to be the judge of the price, and to charge it exorbitantly, and completed the curate's amazement by proposing to go together immediately to the bride's house, where they should probably also find the bridegroom. By the way, Don Abondio, in high glee, as may be imagined, thought of and mentioned another proposal. Since your illustrious lordship is so inclined to benefit these poor people, there is another service which you might render them. The young man has an order of arrest out against him, a kind of sentence of outlawry, for some trifling fault he committed in Milan two years ago, on that day of the great insurrection, in which he chanced to be implicated, without any malicious intentions, indeed quite ignorantly, like a mouse caught in a trap nothing serious, I assure you. Mere boyish tricks, mischievous pranks. Indeed, he is quite incapable of committing an actual crime. I may say so, for I baptized him, and have seen him grow up under my eyes. Besides, if your lordship would take any pleasure in it, as gentlemen sometimes do in hearing these poor people's rude language, you can make him relate the account himself, and you will hear." At present, as it refers to old matters, no one gives him any molestation, and as I have said, he thinks of leaving the state. But in the course of time, or in case of returning here, or going elsewhere, some time or other, you will agree with me that it is always better to find oneself clear. My Lord Marquis has influence in Milan, as is just, both as a noble cavalier and as the great man he really is. No, no, allow me to say it, for the truth will have its way. A recommendation, a word from a person like yourself, is more than is necessary to obtain a ready acquittal. Are there not heavy charges against this young man? Pshaw, pshaw, I would not believe them. They made a great stir about it at the moment, but I don't think there's anything now beyond the mere formalities. If so, the thing will be easy, and I willingly take it upon me. And yet you will not let it be said that you are a great man. I say it, and I will say it. In spite of your lordship, I will say it. And even if I were to be silent, it would be to no purpose, because everybody says so, and vox populi vox dei. They found Renzo and the three women together as they expected. How these felt, we leave the reader to imagine. But for my part, I think the very rough and bare walls, and the windows and the tables, and the kitchen utensils, must have marveled at receiving among them so extraordinary a guest. He encouraged the conversation by talking of the cardinal and their other matters with unreserved cordiality, and at the same time with a great delicacy. By and by he came to the proposal. Don Abondio, being requested by him to name the price, came forward, and after a few gestures and apologies, that it wasn't in his line, and that he could only guess at random, and that he spoke out of obedience, and that he left it to him, mentioned what he thought a most extravagant sum. The purchaser said that, for his part, he was extremely well satisfied, and, if he had misunderstood, repeated double the amount. He would not hear of rectifying the mistake, and cut short and concluded all further conversation by inviting the party to dinner at his palace the day after the wedding, when the deeds should be properly drawn out. Ah, said Don Abondio afterwards to himself, when he had returned home, if the plague did things in this way always and everywhere, it would really be a sin to speak ill of it we might almost wish for one every generation, and be content that people should be in league to produce a malady. The dispensation arrived, the acquittal arrived, that blessed day arrived. The bride and bridegroom went in triumphal security to that very church, where, with Jonah Bondio's own mouth, they were declared man and wife. Another, and far more singular triumph, was the going next day to the palace and I leave my readers to conjecture the thoughts which must have passed through their minds on ascending that acclivity, on entering that doorway, and the observations that each must have made according to his or her natural disposition. I only mention that, in the midst of their rejoicing, 
one or other more than once made the remark that poor Father Cristoforo was still wanting to complete their happiness. Yet for himself, added they, he is assuredly better off than we are. The nobleman received them with great kindness, conducted them into a fine large servant's hall, and seated the bride and bridegroom at table with Agnese and their Milanese friend, and before withdrawing to dine elsewhere with Don Abondio, wished to assist a little at this first banquet, and even helped to wait upon them. I hope it will enter into no one's head to say that it would have been a more simple plan to have made at once but one table. I have described him as an excellent man, but not as an original, as it would nowadays be called. I have said that he was humble, but not that he was a prodigy of humility. He possessed enough of this virtue to put himself beneath these good people, but not on an equality with them. After the two dinners, the contract was drawn out by the hands of a lawyer, not, however, Azeka Garbugli. He, I mean his outward man, was and still is at Cantarelli. And for those who are unacquainted with that neighborhood, I suppose some explanation of this information is here necessary. A little higher up than Lecco, perhaps half a mile or so, and almost on the confines of another country, named Castello, is a place called Cantarelli, where two ways cross. At one corner of the square space is seen an eminence, like an artificial hillock with a cross on the summit. There is nothing else but a heap of the bodies of those who died in this contagion. Tradition, it is true, simply says, died of the contagion. But it must be this one, and none other, as it was the last and most destructive of which any memory remains and we know that unassisted traditions always say too little by themselves. They felt no inconvenience on their return, except that Renzo was rather incommoded by the weight of the money he carried away with him. But, as the reader knows, he had had far greater troubles in his life than this. I say nothing of the disquiet of his mind, which was by no means trifling, in deciding upon the best means of employing it to have seen the different projects that passed through that mind, the fancies, the debates, to have heard the pros and cons for agriculture or business, it was as if two academies of the last century had there met together. And the affair was to Renzo far more overwhelming and perplexing, because, since he was but a solitary individual, it could not be said to him, Why need you choose at all, both one and the other, each in its own turn? for in substance they are the same, and, like one's legs, they are two things which go better together than one alone. Nothing was now thought of but packing up and setting off on their journey, the Tramaglino family to their new country, and the widow to Milan. The tears, the thanks, the promises of going to see each other were many. Not less tender, even to tears, was the separation of Renzo and the family from his hospitable friend. Nor let it be thought that matters went on coldly even with Don Abondio. The three poor creatures had always preserved a certain respectful attachment to their curate, and he, in the bottom of his heart, had always wished them well. Such happy circumstances as these entangle the affections." Should any one ask if there was no grief felt in thus tearing themselves from their native country, from their beloved mountains, it may be answered that there was. For sorrow, I venture to say, is mingled more or less with everything. We must, however, believe that it was not very profound, since they might have spared themselves from it by remaining at home, now that the two great obstacles, Don Rodrigo and the order for Renzo's apprehension, were both taken away. But all three had been for some time accustomed to look upon the country to which they were going as their own. Renzo had recommended it to the women by telling them of the facilities which it afforded to artificers and a hundred things about the fine way in which they could live there. Besides, they had all experienced some very bitter moments in that home upon which they were now turning their backs and mournful recollections always end in spoiling to the mind the places which recall them. 
and if these should be its native home, there is perhaps, in such recollections, something still more keen and poignant. Even an infant, says our manuscript, reclines willingly on his nurse's bosom, and seeks with confidence and avidity the breast which has hitherto sweetly nourished him. But if, in order to wean him, she tinctures it with wormwood, the babe withdraws the lip, then returns to try it once more, but at length, after all, refuses it, weeping indeed, but still refusing it. What, however, will the reader now say, on hearing that they had scarcely arrived and settled themselves in their adopted country, before Renzo found their annoyances all prepared for him? Do you pity him? But so little serves to disturb a state of happiness." This is a short sketch of the matter. The talk that had been there made about Lucia, for some time before her arrival, the knowledge that Renzo had suffered so much for her sake, and had always been constant and faithful, perhaps a word or two from some friend who was partial to him and all belonging to him, had created a kind of curiosity to see the young girl, and a kind of expectation of seeing her very beautiful. Now we know what expectation is, imaginative, credulous, confident. Afterwards, when the trial comes, difficult to satisfy, disdainful. Never finding what she had counted upon, because, in fact, she knew not her own mind, and pitilessly exacting severe payment for the loveliness so unmeaningly lavished on her object. When this Lucia appeared, many who had perhaps thought that she must certainly have golden locks, and cheeks blushing like the rose, and a pair of eyes one more beautiful than the other, and what not besides, began to shrug their shoulders, turn up their noses, and say, Is this she? After such a time, after so much talk, one expected something better. What is she, after all? A peasant like hundreds more. Why, there are plenty everywhere as good as she is, and far better, too. Then, descending to particulars, one remarks one defect, and another, another. Nor were there wanting some who considered her perfectly ugly. As, however, no one thought of telling Renzo these things to his face, so far there was no great harm done. They who really did harm, they who widened the breach, were some persons who reported them to him. And Renzo, what else could be expected, took them very much to heart. He began to muse upon them, and to make them matters of discussion, both with those who talked to him on the subject, and more at length in his own mind. What does it matter to you, and who told you to expect anything? Did I ever talk to you about her? Did I ever tell you she was beautiful? And when you asked me if she was, did I ever say anything in answer but that she was a good girl? She's a peasant. Did I ever tell you that I would bring you here a princess? She displeases you. Don't look at her, then. You have some beautiful women. Look at them. Only look how a trifle may sometimes suffice to decide a man's state for his whole life. Had Renzo been obliged to spend his in that neighborhood, agreeably to his first intentions, he would have got on but very badly. From being himself displeased, he had now become displeasing. He was on bad terms with everybody, because everybody might be one of Lucia's criticizers. Not that he actually offended against civility, but we know how many sly things may be done without transgressing the rules of common politeness, quite sufficient to give vent to one's spleen. There was something sardonic in his whole behavior. He, too, found something to criticize in everything. If only there were two successive days of bad weather, he would immediately say, I, indeed, in this country. In short, I may say, he was already only born with by a certain number of persons, even by those who had at first wished him well. And in course of time, from one thing to another, he would have gone on, till he had found himself, so to say, in a state of hostility with almost the whole population, without being able, probably himself, to assign the primary cause, or ascertain the root which such an evil had sprung. But it might be said that the plague had undertaken to amend all Renzo's errors. That scourge had carried off the owner of another silk mill, 
situated almost at the gates of Baragmo, and the heir, a dissolute young fellow, finding nothing in this edifice that could afford him any diversion, proposed, or rather was anxious, to dispose of it, even at half its value. But he wanted the money down upon the spot, that he might instantly expend it with unproductive prodigality. The matter having come to Bortolo's ears, he immediately went to see it, tried to treat about it. A more advantageous bargain could not have been hoped for, but that condition of ready money spoiled all, because his whole property, slowly made up out of his savings, was still far from reaching the required sum. Leaving the question, therefore, still open, he returned in haste, communicated the affair to his cousin, and proposed to take it in partnership. So capital and agreement cut short all Renzo's economical dubitations, so that he quickly decided upon business, and complied with the proposal. They went together, and the bargain was concluded. When, then, the new owners came to live upon their own possessions, Lucia, who was here expected by no one, not only did not go thither subjected to criticisms, but, we may say, was not displeasing to anybody. And Renzo found out that it had been said by more than one, Have you seen that pretty she-blockhead who has come hither? The substantive was allowed to pass in the epithet. And even from the annoyance he had experienced in the other country, he derived some useful instruction. Before that time, he had been rather inconsiderate in criticizing other people's wives, and all belonging to them. Now he understood that words make one impression in the mouth, and another in the ear. And he accustomed himself rather more to listen within to his own, before uttering them. We must not, however, suppose that he had no little vexations even here. Man, says our anonymous author, and we already know by experience, that he had rather a strange pleasure in drawing similes, but bear with it this once, for it is likely to be the last time. Man, so long as he is in this world, is like a sick person lying upon a bed more or less uncomfortable, who sees around him other beds nicely made to outward appearance, smooth and level, and fancies that they must be most comfortable resting places. He succeeds in making an exchange, but barely is he placed in another before he begins, as he presses it down, to feel in one place a sharp point pricking him, in another a hard lump. In short, we come to almost the same story over again. And for this reason, adds he, we ought to aim rather at doing well than being well, and thus we should come, in the end, even to be better. This sketch, though somewhat parabolic, and in the style of the seventeenth century, is in substance true. However, continues he again, our good friends had no longer any sorrows and troubles of similar kind and severity to those we have related. Their life was, from this time forward, one of the calmest, happiest, and most enviable of lives, so that, were I obliged to give an account of it, it would tire the reader to death. Business went on capitally. At the beginning there was a little difficulty from the scarcity of workmen, and from the ill-conduct and pretensions of the few that still remained. Orders were published, which limited the price of labor. In spite of this help, things rallied again because, after all, how could it be otherwise? Another rather more judicious order arrived from Venice, exemption for ten years from all charges, civil and personal, for foreigners who would come to reside in the state. To our friends this was another advantage. Before the first year of their marriage was completed, a beautiful little creature came to light, and, as if it had been made on purpose to give Renzo an early opportunity of fulfilling that magnanimous promise of his, it was a little girl. It may be believed that it was named Maria. Afterwards, in the course of time, came I know not how many others of both sexes. And Agnese was busy enough in carrying them about, one after the other, calling them little rogues, and imprinting upon their faces hearty kisses, which left a white mark for ever so long afterwards. They were all very well inclined, and Renzo would have them all learn to read and write, saying that since this amusement was in fashion, 
they ought at least to take advantage of it. The finest thing was to hear him relate his adventures, and he always finished by enumerating the great things he had learned from them, for the better government of himself in future. I've learned, he would say, not to meddle in disturbances. I've learned not to make speeches in the street. I've learned not to drink more than I want. I've learned not to hold the knocker of a door in my hand when crazy-headed people are about and I've learned not to buckle a little bell to my foot before thinking of the consequences, and a hundred other things. Lucia did not find fault with the doctrine itself, but she was not satisfied with it. It seemed to her, in a confused way, that something was still wanting to it. By dint of hearing the same song over and over again, and meditating on it every time. And I, said she one day to her moralizer, what ought I to have learned? I did not go to look for troubles, it was they that came to look for me. Though you wouldn't say, added she, smiling sweetly, that my error was in wishing you well, and promising myself to you. Renzo at first was quite puzzled. After a long discussion and inquiry together, they concluded that troubles certainly often arise from occasion afforded by ourselves but that the most cautious and blameless conduct cannot secure us from them, and that, when they come, whether by our own fault or not, confidence in God alleviates them and makes them conducive to a better life. This conclusion, though come to by poor people, seemed to us so just and right that we have resolved to put it here as the moral of our whole story. If this same story has given the reader any pleasure, he must thank the anonymous author, and in some measure his reviser, for the gratification. But if, instead, we have only succeeded in wearying him, he may rest assured that we did not do so on purpose. End of chapter 38, part 2 End of The Betrothed by Alessandro Monsoni